Welcome to our first panel for today. Uh, today's panel is Killing Agriculture to Save the Planet. Patrick Moore is going to give a presentation on how net zero is killing whales and betraying the purpose of Greenpeace. Gregory Reichstein will present on America's breadbasket and climate. And David Legates will talk about the link between nitrous oxide and agriculture, which that's a new topic to me. I've never heard of that. Each of these men is distinguished in their field. Each of them has a long history of speaking truth to power when it comes to climate. And they're going to give you some very interesting facts this morning. So without further ado, I'm going to start with the first panelist. And that's Gregory Wrightstone, who is president of the CO2 Coalition. All right, thank, thank you, Anthony. I've got a, I'm, I'm height challenged, so I have to put this down. Let's see. So we want to go next. So this will be uh, climate change in the Midwest. This is the third uh, uh, planned paper that we have on state and regional initiatives. The first two were on Pennsylvania. The second is on Virginia. This is on the Midwest. We, we're planning a whole series of these. Um, this series was started um, in early August of last year. Pat Michaels uh, was planned to be the lead author from this. He submitted an outline and a rough draft. and. Of course, he had the modeling part part way down. Uh, he came in the next week. Uh, we were supposed to flesh it out, and he said, "Greg, you know, I'm just not, let's do this next week. I'm not feeling very well." Uh, and he went home, and you know what happened. Uh, so, uh, well, this is a what you're going to see today is is my section of the paper on temperature and severe events. We hope to publish the final version here, uh, hopefully within the next month or so. Um, and we, what we did was took a look at the national, fourth national climate assessment. Uh, this is the Midwest region that's shown here. And uh, basically it overlaps what's known as the corn belt and the soy belt. And again, we have that region outlined in red that we'll look at today. Um, and the fourth na national climate assessment, uh, in their overview, they listed some really bad things that were going on and predicted to go on. And in the regional uh, picture for the Midwest, they claimed that, uh, inc that we're seeing increasing high temperatures, uh, reduction of Midwest agricultural productivity, increasing rainfalls, uh, loss of life, uh, increased economic impacts, loss of habitat, uh, and existing and worsening, worsening health impacts. We'll, we'll look at a few of these. In 20 minutes, I can't look at everything, but. We'll look at some, a few of these. In the paper, we'll deal with each one of these and just show just how wrong the na fourth national climate assessment was. Um, I, I have to say I've reviewed the fifth national climate assessment, and it's, it's as bad as the fourth, which was pretty awful. So we'll look at the Corn Belt summer temperatures here. Um, this, is, this is from NOAA's own data. This is Corn Belt summer temperature. It's not declining. It's actually been in slight decline since the 30s. And we compare that here to uh, carbon dioxide. Whenever you see blue on my charts, it's blue is carbon dioxide. Um, and this is from the uh, European Environmental Agency, uh, Trends in Atmospheric Concentration. I like this. There are a couple others you can use. But, but this goes back to the 1800s. Uh, and here's Corn Belt maximum temperatures, again, declining completely opposite of what the fourth national climate assessment uh, reported. And then I went back through and I said, okay, well, let's look at uh, record high temperatures by state. And these are the states, of course, that are in this Midwest region. And there was only one of these with, with a, um, a record high temperature after 1954. And that was South Dakota in 06. All of these other record high temperatures for the Midwest were set uh, mainly back in the in the 30s for the most part. Uh, so again, it flies in the face of their claim of record high temperatures and heat waves. Uh, their other claim is that agriculture productivity will be impacted greatly. And uh, again, I took a look here. What, what's actually going on with precipitation? This is Corn Belt precipitation that's increasing. And when we look at it and look at agriculture, the fourth natural climate assessment actually admits that, and, and also the IPCC admits that actually increasing 
rainfall is only really bad if you have horrific floods and that increasing rainfall benefits greatly agricultural productivity. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Here I'm going on and on. Okay, I gave up the precipitation one. Okay, this is minimum temperature. I need to read my own slides better. Thank you. That's on me. So minimum temperatures have been increasing. Of course, that, uh, that, that bodes well for fewer frosts. Uh, and so, so we're seeing uh, uh, higher nighttime temperatures and higher winter temperatures. Um, and a lot of what you're going to look at here, Tony Heller's got a really cool new climate tool. Uh, I've, it took me a while. It takes a little while to figure it out. I've got a Word document. I've gone through, with Tony's help, uh, leading. I can, I can provide that to you uh, so you can also use these. Because if you look at Tony, he's fly in his YouTube tutorials. He says, well, this is simple, but he flies through it a mile a minute. And so what I've done, done is go back through and capture the, the flow uh, of, of this. And this temperature tool, uh, this is the output we have. And so this is summertime average maximum temperature. Uh, and you can see that I've, I've selected the, um, the, the states in the Midwest. Uh, and there's a lot of cool things you can do here. Uh, and what actually he does, he gives you the ability, you get, you get a JPEG that looks like this, but also you get a CSV file, you can turn into a, an Excel file and create your own uh, uh, temperature charts, because I'm pretty particular with what I use. And these are the type of things you can get. You can get um, average minimum temperature, average maximum temperature, daily temperature. I mean, there's a whole litany of things here. Um, and, and what we see here, too, with Tony, with, with this, and as you know, Tony likes to expose uh, temperature adjustments and fabrication of data. Um, three main things. We have the urban heat island effect, uh, adjustments that have been made to historic temperatures, and we have fabricated data for stations that are no longer there. And, uh, uh, of course, if we go back, uh, there are quite a few. I believe, Anthony, I believe there are 51% there's a large percentage of stations that no longer exist. So they just make update and fabricate what, for what they think it should be. Um, the adjustments that are made, the majority of these are daily temperature readings that were taken either in the afternoon that are too hot or in the morning too cool. Uh, but the overall effect of this is to cool the older temperatures and warm the modern temperatures. So with this tool, you can actually look at the raw adjusted um, United States Historical Climate Network temperatures. So this is the raw data uh, for the Midwest, the states that we're looking at. And you can see that um, the average temperature has been declining since the, since the mid-30s. Um, so what does the adjusted NOAA temperature look like? I, I think you all kind of have an idea what that's going to look like. So, uh, so we've got, this is the NOAA adjusted temperatures for the Midwest. And, and that's, they, they've turned a, a slight reduction um, over many decades of temperature into a slight increase in temperature. Um, the other thing Tony has the ability to do with this, with this really cool, I think you guys, everybody in this room is going to love to use this once you figure it out. So I took a look, you can take the, the raw data less the adjusted data, and I did a 10-year rolling average here. Uh, going back to the 1920s. Um, and what we find here is up to the mid-90s, we had a, a reduction. The average temperature adjustment was a significant reduction in the adjusted temperature, and the modern data, the adjustments were all to heat it up. And that, boys and girls, is how you turn a temperature decline into a temperature increase. And it should anger you, it does me. Um, they also claimed in the fourth national climate assessment for the Midwest, um, at-risk communities were at risk of impacts such as flooding and drought. Well, is that really the case? And thank you, Ben. Now we're going to precipitation. Uh, but uh, Corn Belt precipitation has been increasing. And it's not leading to uh, increases in flooding. What it's doing is, is fueling this crop growth that we're seeing throughout America's breadbasket. 
um, and the drought severity index, the, the PDSI, uh, again, we see an increase uh, in lessening of droughts. We saw really severe droughts, of course, back in the, in the 20s and 30s, uh, even into the 40s, severe droughts. And we're seeing, we still see periodic droughts, but they're not as intense and not as long. And, and we should celebrate that. Um, so it's, again, we're seeing once, you're gonna hear me say it a lot, completely opposite of what they're, what they're telling us. Uh, even the fourth national climate assessment had to recognize the results. Uh, and they, they said that, that there's a climate trend for agriculture in providing, we're seeing the changes in precipitation and drought is providing a favorable supply of moisture. And that's a good thing, again, we should celebrate that. Uh, we look at Midwest agricultural productivity. Um, again, the fourth national climate assessment predicts, of course, that we're gonna see uh, lack of productivity from crops, that Midwest agricultural produ productivity are gonna decline to the levels of the 1980s. Really? Is that the case? Let's take a look. Um, again, this comes from T Tony Heller's uh, work here. This is length of growing season in the Midwest. Uh, we see that, of course, with, with warming temperatures, killing frosts uh, end earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall. So you can get more plantings in. Uh, you don't have to worry about your crops being killed off. Uh, if we look at corn productivity in the United States, uh, we see, now this, this, this chart here shows um, the grain yield in uh, 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 bushels per acre, and you can see starting in the 40s and 50s, we saw a great increase. And I've, I've compared this here with carbon uh, emissions, and again, this is from the European uh, uh, Agency with emissions of carbon dioxide. And, uh, and I know I saw Will Happer walk in, he, it's his pet, pet fee, he says it's not carbon, it's carbon dioxide, so I've, I apologize, Will, sorry about that. Um, but uh, so the carbon dioxide, but the, the fact of the matter is, and I know Pat Michaels, this was his big thing. Well, yeah, that was when he, he talked a lot about, that was his specialty, um, was uh, technology increase. And you'll hear Patrick Moore in a little bit talk about GMO. Uh, we started seeing all these things are combining. We also see David Legates will talk in just a few minutes about the beneficial use of nitrogen fertilizers. And about the time when we see crop growth that skyrocket, all of these things are combining at the same time to drive crop growth. Increasing CO2 means we've got more crop growth with the CO2, um, yeah, CO2 coalition effect, the CO2 fertilization effect. We're seeing nitrogen being used starting about that time. We're seeing advances in technology and we're also seeing, um, again, Patrick loves to talk about GMO, it's demonized, but um, we, we see that we're leading these drought resistant crops that have been developed, particularly VJ Jayaraj is in the other room talking right now, and he's talking over in the other room about GMO and drought resistant crops in India, because India has been plagued for thousands of years with, with drought and, and famine. Uh, we don't have as much of a problem there anymore because of this, the, uh, the, the GMO crops that are being used. So we've got a whole thing, a lot of things going on, but the good news is all of these things are driving increases in crop growth. And what do they want to do? They being the climate industrial complex, they want to shut down nitrogen fertilization, again, that Dave's going to kill crop growth. They want to slow down and kill CO2 fertilization effect that will shut down and slow crop growth. No, we should be celebrating the things that are increasing it. And, and again, celebrate that we're feeding uh, more people. Um, and here's, again, this is fertilizer. David will have one similar. Uh, the dotted line is nitrogen fertilizer versus crop growth. Uh, Midwest severe weather. Um, how am I doing on time, Anthony? Good? All right. So we've got F3, the most intense tornadoes. Uh, we see that are in decline. Uh, I want to thank Chris Martz, uh, who provided this data. Um, and this is really, this is significant. We had our team of experts um, in... Um, hurricane denier. Yeah, I'm a <laughs> hurricane denier. Amazingly, I, no one's ever looked at, this is all groundbreaking science here. 
Um, the rate of landfalling hurricanes in the Midwest has been completely, it's been zero for 170 years. And we know every single one going back to 1850. Um, so um, uh, Midwestern emission reduction effect on global temperature. Well, I went back and I looked at using the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas induced climate change. Again, this was something that, uh, Pat Michaels didn't come up with it, but he put this together at the Cato Institute. They had it for many years there. Um, and I was able to capture all their data before they um, unfortunately took it off their website. Um, and so, and if, in fact, if, you're, if you want to get this magic data, I've got it on a smartphone app that you can uh, access that. And, uh, but you can see here that actually for the Midwest, if we, this was, if we had reduced to zero, all Midwestern carbon dioxide emissions in the year 2010, it would, it would have averted four hundredths of a degree Fahrenheit by the year 20, 2100. All of the Midwestern CO2 starting in the year 2010, four hundredths of a degree. And I got five minutes. Uh, and again, we took a look, uh, Chris Martz again, um, he, uh, his data, we're seeing the Florida land falling hurricane frequencies by decade. Um, I, I'm a victim of, of climate change, I guess, because my, my home in, over by Tampa, uh, we're going to get the roof re finally is going to be replaced next week and because Hurricane Ian damaged the entire roof. And so it takes you, what, seven months to get it together. Uh, but, but so, but I, and that's when I took a look at this land falling hurricanes. And I actually looked at every state in the Gulf Coast and the Eastern Seaboard, every single state had a decrease in land falling, except for Mississippi, had a decrease in land falling hurricanes. And since we're in Florida, I thought you'd enjoy this. Um, we hear about these terrible summer, you know, heat waves and extreme weather. Uh, here's Florida's average maximum summer temperature is actually less than it was in the 1950s. This was uh, unexpected for me. I'd kind of assumed that it would be in the 1930s, but, uh, but this is, this is uh, Florida maximum average summer temperature. Um, and as I'm wrapping up here, uh, I'm really proud of what we've got going with the CO2 coalition with our CO2 learning center. Uh, we've got a group of, of 15 of uh, these PhD formed a committee. They were concerned about um, the state of science education in America. So we got these 15. I thought, you know, you get 15 PhDs. I thought they'd be a bunch of eggheads. They never get anything put together. And these these PhDs, what they have done is amazing. Uh, videos. We're going to be launching this hopefully on Candace Owens next next month. Uh, so we've got we've got books, videos, and lesson plans. We'll be launching. Um, and this is a caricature from our artist. You can see, you can recognize Will Happer there to the left of the guy at the desk. There's Will and Patrick Moore is in front of the desk. And of course, um, I'm down front and center to the right. I do the voice of Mr. Fish. Um, so, uh, and the, you notice the, the, the fish has a silver mustache. And so uh, um, I'd encourage you all, well, once we roll this out, we'd like you all to, to help us uh, promote this. I think it'll be, the homeschool community will love it. And so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. You did a fantastic job with that presentation. And on time. I like that. Okay, so our next panelist is Dr. Patrick Moore. Now, many of you probably have heard that Dr. Patrick Moore was one of the co-founders of Greenpeace. And uh, he was a co-founder back when their mission was, you know, nuclear bombs and things like that, trying to prevent those from being tested in the Pacific and so forth. Well, ever since Dr. Moore became a climate skeptic, Greenpeace erased him from the website and now denies that he was ever a founder, even though there's concrete evidence otherwise. So today he's going to be talking about a new topic. The new topic is that wind power, wind power like uh, offshore wind power, is killing whales by disorienting them and causing them to beach. So with not a further ado, Dr. Patrick Moore, please come up here and give us your presentation.
Thanks, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hate to disappoint, but I did talk about the whales and Greenpeace at my plenary session, and uh, I what I'd like to talk about this morning is a campaign I began in 2013 till 2018 to allow golden rice now. And this is a story that uh, is quite sad. This is a scientist at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. There are three other rice institutes in Indonesia, Bangladesh, and India. And this rice was invented by two humanitarian scientists in Europe shortly after the, the, the genetic modification, as they like to call it, was invented, where you can insert genes from one plant into another to change their characteristics. Rice has no beta carotene in it, that's why it's white. But let's start with some general concepts. Genetically modified is a very general term. We are all genetically modified, every single one of us. Identical twins, if they're the same sex, are identically genetic. But unless they each have children with the same person, which doesn't happen very often. Everyone is genetically modified from their parents. No one is identical to their parents. So to use this term genetically modified in a negative fashion is ridiculous. Conventional breeding is a form of genetic modification where you simply take, choose Two, two seeds, two plants from the same species and cross them. That's genetic modification because the offspring of those two plants will not be identical to the parents either. They will be modified. Mutation breeding has been going on for over a hundred years using radiation and chemicals to mutate plants on purpose and see if anything useful comes out when you plant the seeds. You know, 99.9% .9 of them are no good because they've been damaged genetically to such an extent, but sometimes the chemical or the radiation confers a desirable trait on that seed. That's been going on for a long, long time. And, and the people who are against genetic modification, as they like to call it, are not against this. There's lots of organic so-called organic crops that are made with chemical and nuclear radiation. Marker-assisted breeding. This is just like crossbreeding normal agriculture, except now we can see the genes directly and we can figure out which ones to cross with each other much more specifically in order to get a new desirable trait. Recombinant DNA biotechnology is the correct term for inserting genes from one plant or animal into another. This is what golden rice is, one of these. Here's the organizations that say GM crops are as safe or safer than conventionally bred crops because they are required to go through much more rigorous testing than regular crops. This is very different from the climate change issue in that a lot of established associations in science are going along with the climate change hoax. But with GM, it's different because here you're dealing with, this is, this is the global area of biotech crops up to 2013. And, and the green countries are the only ones that, are, that allow any of them to be planted. And in most cases, it's very few varieties that have been permitted. We could have been way ahead of where we are now if GM had been accepted as, a, as an acceptable breeding method. Because it's not as if we're taking genes from some plant on Mars. And, and soon we'll get into the golden rice here. Um, when, when the Philippines adopted GM corn, Greenpeace said, dying children and cancer clusters. This is the kind of propaganda. We tried. I, I, we, we, we went to Europe and went 
demonstrated in front of Greenpeace offices and went to Asia and spoke to all the press there because that's where the biggest problem is, Asia, Africa. And uh, in, in India, they adopted genetic cotton, which, in, which radically increased productivity because the boll weevil was not able to eat half the cotton. And here you have the difference between a GM potato and a regular potato when it comes to insect resistance. This is vitamin A deficiency in preschool children. This was the point of this whole campaign. The reason golden rice was invented was because so many poor people in the tropics in particular depend on rice as their staple energy food. There's no beta carotene in rice, but there is in corn, there is in yams, there is in carrots, of course. And beta carotene was found by the, by the United Nations health people not only to be necessary for eyesight, but also for the immune system. This wasn't known until about 40 years ago. And that's why children die from diabetes, malaria, dengue, and other diseases that they would normally survive from if their immune system was functioning properly. Every year, between one and two million children die from vitamin A deficiency because beta carotene is what we make vitamin A with. We don't make beta carotene. We have to take it in from a plant and turn it into a, a very important micronutrient. This woman is going blind because of vitamin A deficiency but she's managed to live to this age, unlike the one to two million other people. They don't keep very good stats on really poor children dying in remote villages. This is Dr. Ingo Potricus in the middle and on the right, uh, the, his partner, Professor Beyer, and two people from uh, the, the Asia who helped put this thing together. Here's golden rice. Under the agreement, any farmer in a developing country earning less than 10,000 a year will not pay a fee for golden rice and be able to save and replant the seed. That was the plan. Here's Time Magazine in 1999 announcing the golden rice. Here's all the people who support the golden rice development. It's been planted in research farms for a long time. Here's one in, this is the one in the Philippines at the International Rice Research Institute. This is Greenpeace using death symbols around golden rice. This is long after I left Greenpeace. Here they say farmers destroyed the golden rice fields in the research institute founded by international scientists. These are radical leftists who were bussed in by Greenpeace to destroy the golden rice. Because Greenpeace was on site, they put the press release right away saying Filipino farmers have destroyed the golden rice because they don't believe in GMOs. Here's a study of clinical nutrition. Beta carotene in golden rice is as good as beta carotene in oil at providing vitamin A to children. This was a study done with parental approval with children in China to show that golden rice uh, improved their beta carotene intake. And the, 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 the Chinese scientist who was working in the United States who did this was uh, banned from her association. Uh, three top uh, people in the bureaucracy in China were fired and this study was buried and they say they've never done any testing. Th this was done. This is Greenpeace genetically engineered golden rice fake remedy for vitamin A deficiency. Greenpeace. This is why I came to hate them. Here is the cotton production in India. And here is Vandana Shiva, one of the ugliest people on this planet, saying farmers should be free to grow GMOs which can contaminate organic farms is like saying rapists should be, have freedom to rape. She says 270,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide since Monsanto entered the Indian seed market, she said. It's genocide. 
Here's the suicide rate in the world. The United States has a higher suicide rate than many other countries, and it's right about the same as India. In fact, it's slightly lower. They're, they're both shown as in Australia. India's suicide rate is not high when you consider the number of people there are there. This is the kind of propaganda that nasty people put out. It's a moral obligation of human beings to actively plan and carry out the killing of those engaged in heinous crimes against humanity. There is real CO2. There is real radiation. They are invisible, but they are real. But the thing in genetically modified crops that is dangerous does not exist. If it had a name, it would be useful. But the, thing, the bad thing doesn't even have a name. It is fake and phony and non-existent. There's nothing bad in GMOs. And yet they've mounted multi-billion dollar fundraising campaigns and stopped at least three quarters of the world's population from benefiting from this, especially in the developing countries, that it is they who are committing crimes against humanity. And it simply, they've simply managed to stifle knowledge of this thing all through these years, since 1999. 40 grams of golden rice a day is all that is needed to prevent blindness and death in children. That much. Here we are beginning the campaign against Greenpeace at the dock in Vancouver. That's my, my, son, my, my nephew and my son holding up the sign. My brother, with, my late brother, with his cap on back there. This was a family effort from the beginning. As my brother and my wife and I sat around our country home table on Vancouver Island, we read of Greenpeace putting out this media release saying that farmers had destroyed the golden rice and we got to the bottom of it pretty quick. And we decided right there at the kitchen table when we read that on the computer that we were going to have a campaign to do something about this. And we worked for three and a half years traveling to eight different countries in Europe and five different countries in Asia. We reached 30 million people with a positive message. Lots of scientists were working on GMOs, but nobody was campaigning for them, and thousands of people were campaigning against them. Here's, I have to wind this up now, I know there's a lot more to this story, but Filipinos are now, Philippines is the only country now where the International Rice Research Institute the only country in the area that needs it that has adopted golden rice. Bangladesh has been trying for years. They, they had an agriculture secretary uh, who was in favor of it, and, but she just couldn't get past the environment ministry. Greenpeace influences the environment ministry in all these countries to make sure golden rice never gets introduced, even after all this time of knowing there's nothing wrong with it, and the bad thing is not in existence. Thank you for listening. I hope you uh, learn more about this. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Now, obviously, I was misinformed as to the title of your topic. I thought it was going to be about whales, but it was about golden rice, which was tremendously interesting. You know, I think that the resistance of the left against golden rice is one of the most ridiculous things they've ever come up with. I mean, the bottom line is this. When you eat something, no matter how the DNA is arranged, whether it's corn or lettuce or beef or potatoes or whatever, it all gets broken down on your gut into components. It doesn't matter how it's arranged, and yet they create you know, labels like frankenfood for this sort of thing. Well, my label for those kind of folks is ecochondriacs. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Uh, Dr. David Legates is next. He's going to be talking about a topic I know nothing about, and I hope I've got the topic right. It is nitrous oxide and global warming. Uh, and of course, many of you know nitrous oxide as laughing gas, but I can tell you for sure his presentation is no laughing matter.
Where's the, uh, ah, there we go. I thought Patrick's talk was a whale of a good talk. There you go. <laughs> Don't encourage me, whatever happens. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize to Will Happer and the CO2 Coalition. I stole a lot of your slides, uh, so I'll give them back as soon as I'm done with them. Um, it was, wow, Willie, it was 20 years ago this summer. You and I were testifying in Congress. I was sitting at the right side of the table. Willie's sitting on the left side of the table. Between us was Michael Mann. And um, uh, Senator Leland v Vittert uh, asked Mann a question. He said, sir, why are you so worried about carbon dioxide when water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas? And there's a lot of answers that Mann could give, but I've always been intrigued by the answer he gave because he said, we can't regulate water vapor. And they have done everything they can to regulate carbon dioxide. And then they went after methane. So you can't, I mean, there's places in the country now, and it's growing by the day almost, where you can't have a new building put in that has um, natural gas connections. You can't have a natural gas stove. You can't have a natural gas uh, um, furnace. You can't have a natural gas fireplace. You can't have a natural gas uh, uh, dryer. You can't have a natural gas water heater. And then they started coming after nitrous oxide. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today, since a lot of people think of it as laughing gas, and it is, and it's an anesthesia, but it has other, other issues, and it has some connection to agriculture, uh, I hope. You'll notice the title is The New Satanic Gas. That's a nod to Patrick Michaels, uh, who wrote the book, The Satanic Gases. Um, but also, I said, as, you, as you're aware, it is dentist, used in dentistry, where it's called laughing gas. So I guess we really should refer to nitrous oxide as the laughing Satan gas. Uh, but apparently, uh, back in the you know, 1830s, you could use it to control your women. I, I would not encourage you to do that today. Um, but, okay, back to seriousness. Um, nitrous oxide, why is it a climate threat? And in particular, you can see here from Inside Climate News, emissions of nitrous oxide, a climate super pollutant, he adds, are rising fast on a worst case trajectory. So what is the issue? Why are we worried about it? Well, it would be nice if plants got nitrogen, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They gave off water and oxygen to the atmosphere through the stomates. Alas, that's not how it works. In fact, nitrogen doesn't get in that way, even though nitrogen in the atmosphere is 78% by volume. They have to get it through the roots. So the roots do more than just simply provide a, a, a place for the, the plants to stand and keep them from blowing away. So what we have to look at is how nitrogen in particular combines with oxygen. And it does very well in a variety of different forms. But the one we're really concerned about here is nitrous oxide, N2O. Um, and that's the one we're gonna focus on in particular, although the others do start to play a role because as you find with the cycling, uh, they're in there as well. So here you can see denitrification, uh, nitrogen oxide uh, and um, goes to uh, nitrous tri nitrogen trioxide, to nitrogen dioxide, to nitric oxide, to nitrous oxide, to nitrogen, and uh, back again. Um, in a little bit better diagram, you can see here that nitrous oxide is in the atmosphere. It gets put from nitrogen in the atmosphere to the soil where plants can use it through nitrogen fixation bacteria. But we've realized that there's a way of enhancing the issue. And in particular, you see there that we have what's called fertilizer plants that work to take nitrogen from the atmosphere to create ammonium in the soil. Ammonium in the soil is converted over fairly quickly by the bacteria in the soil to nitrogen oxides, in which case we have this pathway that we're gonna focus on shown here in red. The problem is by enhancing that pathway, we get more nitrogen oxide, uh, excuse me, nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. And that seems to be a problem for some of the environmentalists. What they would like to do is to get rid of these fertilizer plants, to cut down on the ability to fertilize agriculture. And so therefore what that would allow you to do is diminish this network. Nitrogen oxide would not be going up and in fact, we could actually get it to go down. 
Now, people look at this and say, why are we really worried in nitrogen oxide? Well, it's a greenhouse gas. Uh, and sometimes they get confused. Well, you take water vapor, it's a greenhouse gas. You change the hydrogen to nitrogen, and it must also be a greenhouse gas. Alas, that's not how it works either. Water vapor is a polarized molecule. It is a bent molecule. It is a symmetric molecule. Uh, nitrogen, excuse me, nitrous oxide is a polarized molecule, but it is a linear molecule and it is not symmetric. The oxygen is not in the middle, the oxygen is on the end. So it's a little bit different beast altogether. The question is often asked, why is water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, when they're in the atmosphere, why are they greenhouse gases? The answer is when they're in a lattice, such as we have with solids or liquids, uh, they emit energy across all wavelengths, they absorb all wavelengths. But when they're individual molecules in the atmosphere, they get to dance. And so as they dance back and forth, what happens is that the molecule absorbs energy in certain wavelengths, it gives off energy in a specific wavelengths, and so it becomes very wavelength dependent when we start talking about gases. The major gases of the atmosphere, such as nitrogen and oxygen, you notice don't look like the others. They're diatomic molecules. If we look at argon, for example, um, it's there almost 1%, but it's a single atom molecule, so it can't dance like the ones uh, here that you see. So that's why we're concerned with water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And as I said, they absorb energy in various wavelengths when they're in gas form. Here you can see the blue curve on the top is the transparent atmosphere following Planck's law under the assumption that there's nothing in the atmosphere to absorb the energy, so this is outgoing radiation. Uh, when you put atmospheric molecules in, uh, you get uh, various absorption bands, and we want to focus in particular on those associated with uh, nitrous oxide. And as Chris Essex mentioned yesterday afternoon, it's going to be hard to find, but if we completely remove nitrous oxide or if we double nitrous oxide, we get the deviation from the black line to either the green when it's completely removed or the red when it's uh, doubled, and you don't see a whole lot of difference, which is why, as Chris said when he was commenting, was that uh, in climate modeling, we don't really worry about these two gases because the difference between those two is well lost in the error and uncertainty associated with a climate model. So how much nitrous oxide do we have in the atmosphere? Well, here's gas in pure dry air by percentage. Hopefully you know nitrogen is about 78%, oxygen is about 21%, argon is about 93% of the remaining 1%, and you have to go all the way out here and get past carbon dioxide, neon, helium, um, uh, methane, uh, ozone, xenon, before you finally get to nitrogen oxide, nitrous oxide, I knew I was going to do that, nitrous oxide is at 334 parts per billion. Now, how small is that number? Well, think for a moment. If we took every person on the planet and we gave them a t-shirt, and every t-shirt is going to have a value on it associated with one of these elements, or excuse me, one of these compounds in the concentrations that we see here it would turn out that the entire planet, the, only, the people on the planet that had a nitrogen oxide, t or, uh, excuse me, a nitrous oxide t-shirt would be about 2,400 people. So there's not a whole lot of them in the atmosphere. Its rate of increase is 0.85 parts per billion per year. If you do the math, that comes up to almost a doubling in 400 years. Remember, we're worried about carbon dioxide doubling maybe by the end of the century. Well, this is by the end of three centuries after that. Now, U.S. Noxide, nitrous oxide emissions from 1990 to, 19, to 2020, the last 30 years, you can see uh, no, no real change. Excuse me. And you can see in this case, nitrous oxide comes in a distant third from the EPA overview of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. How is this stuff getting into the atmosphere? Well, that's the fun part. Nearly three quarters of it comes from agricultural soil management. So if you want to stop nitrogen oxi nitrous oxide from getting into the atmosphere, you have to stop agriculture. 
which is why I'm in this session and not in others. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we using fertilizer? Well, I shouldn't have to show you, and this is, speaks for itself. Without fertilizer, it doesn't grow well. With fertilizer, it grows much better. You can see that if you're a farmer, you really want to use fertilizer because it helps plants grow. That should be obvious. And it works. We can see here cereal uh, crops grow with nitrogen fertilizer increase over time. We can see as the nitrogen fertilizer increases, uh, crops such as um, maize, wheat, barley, hay, oats, rye all increase. I think Greg has already shown us this. And so if you buy fertilizer, you buy it in terms of the NPK ratio. The, the first one, of course, is going to be nitrogen. Uh, it creates healthy green foliage. As I said, it's in, put into the ground as an ammonium, but nevertheless becomes nitrogen trioxide fairly quickly uh, through bacteria um, activity, depending on temperature. The other two numbers for completeness, phosphorus gets you strong roots and blooms, and the potassium gets you healthy plant growth. So here's our global nitrogen, excuse me, nitrous oxide budget. And as you can see, that we have 13.5, and this is teragrams of nitrogen per year. Think about that, teragrams. Uh, that's taken out of the atmosphere, but we're putting in 7.3 from atmospheric source, from anthropogenic sources, 9.7 from natural sources. The math, again, gets us a difference of 4.3 going into the atmosphere. And if we could just shut down the amount associated with agricultural activity, you can see we could almost offset our nitrogen going into the atmosphere. And if we cut off fossil fuel and other industry, we can actually start to roll back the process and get less nitrogen oxide in the atmosphere, which they think is a good thing. We measure the potential of greenhouse gases relative to carbon dioxide. So the global warming potential is one for carbon dioxide. You can see methane starts out at 85.5 and drops off because methane comes out of the atmosphere much quicker than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide hangs around a little bit longer. So its global warming potential actually increases. And by about 100 years, we're up to 290 times carbon dioxide. But remember, there's very few of them. You know, 2,400 people on the planet would have that nitrogen oxygen, nitrous oxide t-shirt. So if we produced a weighted global warming potential by volume, you can see the effect of nitrous oxide in 100 years is only still less than about a quarter of what we would get from carbon dioxide. This is, I've changed a little bit. You can see current is the center line that is one on the right, excuse me, on the left is none, showing none in the atmosphere, and doubled is two on the far right. The big curve that makes the big change is blue, which is water vapor, of course, then followed by carbon dioxide and ozone. And you can see doubling or taking it down to zero, either methane or nitrous oxide gets you almost no change in forcing whatsoever. Total uh, uh, increase in temperature over time, most of it's carbon dioxide. You can see methane and nitrous oxide are small players. And given that nitrous oxide doubles in nearly 400 years, the rate of warming from nitrous oxide is about 0.00064 degrees C per Celsius, or if this doesn't change, what you would see is that's a warming of just a little over a quarter of degree Celsius in the next 300 years. Sorry, 380 years. And as I said, it's agriculture that's to blame. Now, a lot of countries are starting to do things about it, Canada in particular. Trudeau is interested in nitrogen policy. I don't know if I can read that from here. Maybe I can. It says fertilizers play a major role in the agricultural sector's success and have contributed to record harvests in the last decade. They have helped drive increases in Canadian crop yields, grain sales, and export, says a news release from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. That's a good thing, right? We're feeding Canadians more. We're exporting more food to countries that need it. Not so fast. However, nitrous oxide emissions, particularly those associated with synthetic nitrogen fertilizer use, have also grown significantly. That's why the government of Canada has set the National Fertilizer Emission Reduction Target, which is part of the commitment to reduce total greenhouse gas emissions in Canada by 40 to 45 percent by 2030. Same thing happened in the Netherlands. At 50 percent, farmers protested. Same thing happened in Sri Lanka. At 100 percent, 
people starved. Uh, I asked VJ what uh, he thinks Sri Lanka is going to do next year. He says, we're still not sure whether they're going to continue down the road and starve people or whether they're going to recognize that was not a good thing. Let's roll it back. We'll have to see what happens. Now, what I, the problem with all of this is what I call the death equation. If you haven't seen it, it is I equals P times A times T. I, of course, is environmental impact. It's always considered bad, so it's always going to be negative, environmental impact. And it comes from three things, population, affluency, and technology. What you really want, or what they really want, is to cut down the population to keep people poor and to keep people technolog technologically disadvantaged. The nice thing, as far as they're concerned, from nitrous oxide is it gets two of these three directly and the third one indirectly. If you cut down on fertilizer, as I'll show you in a moment, you won't be able to feed as much people. That's gonna create starvation. And as a result, the population will decrease. That takes us back in technology. So we're going back in technological development. And third, if people are fighting for food and trying to stay alive, they very well can't develop their station in life, so that will make them less affluent. So here we see the world population living in extreme poverty. One billion people on the planet as of 1820. By 1960, it had grown to almost four billion, and you can see more people living in extreme poverty. And then something happened. A number of things changed in 1960. Part of it was fertilizer. And we're all of a sudden able to feed people. That's become a good thing while the population has rocketed upward. The number of people living in poverty has actually decreased. And not just in terms of percentage, in terms of total numbers. This should be a good thing. We can see corn yields in the United States go up as in, as in 1940. Part of it is developed in agriculture. Part of it is fertilizer. We can see wheat yields as well for the world and for the United States, again, going up as of 1961. And I like this one, arable land needed to produce a fixed quantity of crops. If you've got a certain part of land, and in 1961 you can develop a certain amount of output, by 2014 you would have been able to triple the amount of output from that same parcel of land. This should be an excellent good thing, and this is why, hopefully, we are using this to be able to feed the planet. The problem, as I said early on, is I'm going to tell you why essentially they're going to kill half of the planet if they get their way. And that's because if you look at this graph, the red line on top is the total population. The green line is the population that uses natural fertilizers. The tan line at the bottom is the line that essentially is those people fed by synthetic fertilizers. That keeps the population largely fed. But if we got rid of the tan line, you'll notice we can't feed the world, and there's going to be massive starvation. That's okay. They thought of it. This came out just yesterday. Leeds University in England. British researchers claim food rations could help climate change. Well, of course, if we're going to do that, you're going to have food rations. I don't know possibly how you're going to eat solar panels, and so I don't know why that's here on the thing, but nevertheless, that's what came up. But remember, we've used it for dentistry, for other applications, this, just this last month. Less anesthesia and surgeries could reduce the carbon footprint of your hospital. And it goes on to mention, for the sake of climate change, researchers are urging surgeons to use less anesthetic on their surgical patients. Nitrous oxide are example of a relevant inhaled volatile anesthetic. Experts call on minimizing these agents' environmental consequences. Thank you. So here's the problem. Next time you go into the hospital, turn to the surgeon and say, I'm sorry, I don't want anesthesia. I would like to save the planet. <laughs> Give me a couple minutes. So in Delaware, we last session put in House Bill 165. It'll probably come up again. It's an act to amend the Delaware Code relating to human remains. Why does this matter? Well, let's think about it. If your loved one dies, what can you do? You can embalm them and bury them. That's going to leach a lot of nasty stuff into the groundwater. They're going to decay and create uh, natural gas. No, no, no. That's a pollutant. We can't have that. The other thing you can do is cremation. But that takes energy, and that's going to produce carbon dioxide. That's another evil gas. 
So what the state of Washington has done and what Delaware was proposing, or is proposing probably again, is something called human composting, which is the third way. Uh, it says, uh, what does it say? The third way, also known as recomposition, involves placing bodies in a vessel and hasting their decomposition into a nutrient-dense soil that can then be returned to families. So, wait a second, nutrient-dense soil, isn't that like fertilizer? And won't that put nitrous oxide in the atmosphere? Yeah, we can't do that. So, the only solution I've, th I've heard is from two students at the Biden Center at the University of Delaware. No, not that Biden Center, it's uh, Hunter Biden. <laughs> so, I'm no longer employed by the University of Delaware, so I can get away with this stuff now. Uh, they'll rue the day they let me go, any event. But what they proposed was when somebody dies, you put them in a bag, you hermetically seal the bag, and you stack them up in a room like cordwood. I can't make this stuff up, okay? And that's their solution, because any other way, they're going to lead you to death even after they're dead. They're gonna create all this problem. I mean, it gives a whole new meaning to the word uh, zombie apocalypse. <laughs> so, to finish up, Here's Inside Climate News. Emissions of nitrous oxide, a climate super pollutant, no, are rising fast on a worst case trajectory. Remember, doubles in 400 years. No, that's not what's happening. So let me leave you with this food for thought. See, I told you, don't, don't encourage me. Let me leave you with this though. If you look at that picture and you don't see the fact that we can feed the hungry, that we can take care of the poor, that with fertilizer we can essentially bring a lot of people out of abject poverty and feed them. If you don't see what that, if you see that as terrible and destroying the planet, then there's something horribly wrong with you. And this is my issue, is what we're up against is not a fight between our views versus theirs. This is a fight for humanity. And in that case, we are going to have to win. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank every one of our speakers for exposing the mental part of environmentalism. Uh, gosh, I mean, the things that they are rallying against is it just insane to me to even... What it basically says, the left doesn't know science. That's what it's about. They just don't. And that reminds me to remind you, all of you folks out here are highly educated. You're informed. You're on the top of your game as far as climate change is concerned. I encourage you, every time you see a letter in the newspaper or some story advocating some of the ridiculous things that they are pushing against on the left, write a letter to the editor. Ask for a guest column. Speak out. Push back against this nonsense. All right, so we're gonna be taking questions now, and I ask you to limit your question to one with no follow-up. Who are we having microphones going around? There's a gentleman right here. I noticed uh, on uh, the, the one uh, picture of Africa, Africa had almost no GMO in there, and uh, I wish you'd uh, comment on that because I think it's the EU that predicates aid to African countries on the African countries refusing to use GMO. But you want to comment on that, especially with bananas and things like that? Yes, is this live? Yeah. Yes, that's true. Uh, the European Union did $8 million with a huge number of programs testing GM foods and found that they were safe or safer than than conventional foods because they are tested so much more. And even that has not swayed them to adopt GM crops. So yes, they require that African states do not grow GM crops in order to receive aid. It is the truth. And therefore they are not only depriving Africa of improved agriculture, they are also depriving them of improved economic well-being.
Dr. Legates, uh, concerning your nitrous oxide presentation, are you giving away samples? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody said I was hitting too much of it because that's why I laugh too much, but uh, um, <laughs> no, I don't have samples. Actually, I pulled one of the slides for time. They're concerned because it said um, that the two things in England that are being most abused are cannabis and nitrous oxide. And so they're trying to stop nitrous oxide. And I'm thinking, in the United States, we're trying to make cannabis legal. So, but nitrous oxide is, is evil. I, it's all goofed up. Hello, Ramey Johnson here. I appreciate your thoughtful presentations on saving people, but I think the people that are promoting all of this are actually looking at reducing population, and that's really what's going on. Yes. <laughs> what, what would you do differently if you wanted to do population reduction? You'd be doing exactly what they're doing. I just make one more point. They don't seem to want to go first. And I, I think the best thing that could possibly happen is if the people who don't like people would please go first, it would be a much more enjoyable planet. Yeah, uh, oh. yeah. Stan Goldenberg, uh, for Mr. Wrightstone, uh, are you familiar with exactly what the justification was for NOAA's reanalysis of the Midwest temperatures? I know what they did with oceanic temperatures, what did they do with the Midwest temperatures, being an employee of NOAA? Well, it's the same thing that we, a lot of these are these adjustments, some of them are, particularly the time of day adjustment, they say is needed, and, and they probably are, uh, but it just seems that, that these adjustments that are made are uh, consistently, the older temperatures are cooler, and, and the modern temperatures are warmer. Uh, we see that, this is all from the United States, the USHCN data, uh, solely, so this is just the United States. I think there are 1,200 and some, Anthony's the expert there, I think 1,248 USHCN stations or something. And we looked at those. Those, uh, we see it uh, every state where they've done the same adjustments uh, as to why they're doing it, uh, probably because they can. And, you know, when you start with the, what you want your result to be, um, they, have the, they have the ability to make that change, and they have. So, and especially what's really bad are the, is the fabricated data that we're seeing from the non-existent stations or stations that aren't, don't report anymore. Uh, so it, it's, it's not good. And, and also Anthony's documented, and I don't recall the percentage, it was well over 90% of these stations no longer meet NOAA certification for temperature measurements. Thank you. Margaret Byfield with American Stewards of Liberty. Have any of you looked into the carbon capture pipelines they're trying to build through the Midwest and have any thoughts on that? In Canada, where I'm born and live, there are six major oil companies, the biggest oil companies in the oil sands in Alberta, that have pledged their allegiance to carbon capture technology and will do everything they can to make sure that the carbon is captured. And they are completely so sold out to this ridiculous idea. I wish someone would do the energetics on the amount of energy you get from using fossil fuels combustion versus the amount of energy it takes to take it back out of the atmosphere again or out of a exhaust pipe. And, uh, and, and bury it in the ground is basically what they're, they're, they're looking for places. It's, you know, Europeans tried this, but they're, all of their underground natural uh, places where you can store gas are full of natural gas. So they don't even have anywhere to put it. I, don't, I, 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 I honestly think it is absolutely phony what these, P I think it's just PR they're saying they're gonna capture all this CO2 and trying to make themselves look good with the people who are hateful of fossil fuels. It's, it's a tragic situation and I think they are 
I think they are the scum of the earth for not sticking up for their own industry and uh, recognizing the importance of 80% of the world's energy being delivered by fossil fuels is just ridiculous. Yeah, why, why do we want to do, why do you want to get rid of a beneficial molecule? We see huge benefits from increasing CO2. There's some people speaking at this conference that anger me. I'm not going to call them out by name, but they're speaking here today. They spoke here yesterday. They said, well, there's a climate crisis, but you know, we don't want to spend three and a half trillion dollars. We just want to spend 850 billion. And uh, we have to do carbon capture to get us to where we need to be. These are people speaking at this conference promoting carbon capture and sequestration. And it's, they're trying, they're spending billions and hundreds and trillions of dollars to solve a non-existent crisis. There is no climate crisis and we should celebrate the benefits that we're seeing from increasing CO2 and uh, it, it angers me. We see too many people in the GOP that should know better, that are, that are, uh, that are promoting carbon capture and sequestration. The only thing that's going to go down those wells is our tax dollars. Yeah. Question and comment for David. Uh, Sean Bigler, Bonnie Likes, Florida Farmers Market Podcast. We interview local farmers that sell at farmers markets in uh, the Gainesville area, and we ask them in every interview what their biggest concerns are, and it's two things price of diesel, getting their produce to market, and of course, fertilizer. So we stumbled upon something called the JADAM method in Korea. It's J A D A M, it's liquid fertilizer basically growing weeds in order to chop them up, throw them in barrels, put um, fungus from leaf litter, and, uh, and basically pack it with nutrients and ferment it sealed for months at a time. And it's so potent, you need to dilute it 1 to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 50 to apply it on fields. Now this represents a temporary <sighs> rebellion against fertilizer prices but we're gonna be doing some experiments this summer with farmers where um, plot of land is planted, is, is used with commercial fertilizer versus our liquid anaerobic fertilizer. So again, if you can think about, there are ways that independent farmers are trying to get around uh, the high cost. And so if it's successful, we think that Jadam can be ramped up to commercial. It's easy to do it with a 10 acres or 15 acres but we want to see how it stacks up in back-to-back -back fields compared with uh, synthetic uh, fertilizer. So Let me know how it goes, but yeah. I, my fear is that if they think it's putting nitri uh, nitric ox nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, they'll yeah. come after it just as hard. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the other Thank thing you. I'd wonder is what percentage of the agricultural land would be taken up by doing this? Yes, the weed, growing weeds, were, which obviously you're not going to eat them. You're going to make this fertilizer out of them. So it must, and, and. But they're not weeds then. They're, weeds are undesirable plants or plants where you don't want them. Uh, even if they are desirable. So this is making undesirable plants into desirable plants. I understand that. But if you take up a quarter of the world's agricultural land to grow the desirable weeds, that reduces the area that you can be actually growing food on. Could you use invasive species? Could you use invasive species? No, 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 no. I mean, that again I, I mean, you've got an invasive species, we've got to get rid of it. If you could convert it to fertilizer, that would be killing two birds with one stone. Okay. Would dead bodies work? Right. <laughs> I wonder. Hi, okay. good morning. This is Dave Ulrich. I worked at a large pharmaceutical manufacturing firm for, for 40 years doing genetic modification to make fully humanized monoclonal antibodies. But we have seen some negative effects with cross-speciations and GMOs. And what I mean by that is 
when we make enzymes that are GMO enzymes, we do see an increase in irritable bowel syndrome, in EPI, also in microbiome digestive issues. So can you talk about GMOs? And I also get very concerned when Bill and Melinda Gates endorse something, or the Rockefeller Foundation, or the AMA or the WHO. So if they're already endorsing uh, ESGs, vax mandates, and climate hoax, when they endorse GMOs, it makes me a little bit concerned. In the Golden Rice campaign, we actually said very clearly to Greenpeace, we're only asking you to make an exception for this humanitarian uh, plant. We weren't asking them to change their position on GMOs because, of course, that would probably be impossible. Uh, so that's all we wanted. And, and, and yes, just like any plant that is being modified, there can be negative results. Uh, you know, but there's, there's a lot of opposite situation. Canola, for example, which used to be called rapeseed or oilseed rape, uh, Canadians, the reason it's called canola is because Canadian scientists figure out how to take the, the protein out of it that made it so you couldn't feed the mash after you squeezed the oil out. You couldn't feed it to livestock so it wasn't <coughs> worth as much and they made it so that, li that, that, that uh, mash now became a, a, a viable item for food, for livestock. So there's, you, you, yes, you can easily make a dangerous GM uh, plant or you know, by, by purposefully put, making it, make a protein that will kill people or whatever. But that was not the intention of anybody that I know of. Could happen by accident too, but then they'd find out pretty quick. Good morning, Tom Moriarty from Colorado. Just a very quick question. Early on in the first presentation, you spoke of a tool that was used to uh, acquire and sort and plot data, but I didn't catch where that tool was and how to access it? Yeah, that was Tony Heller's website. I think it's realclimatescience.com, I think. Yes. And yes, that I hear a yes, real climate science. Uh, I think what we will probably do is I'll, uh, again, I've got a, a workflow. It, it, I work several days and work with Tony to figure out how to do it. And uh, I'll put, I'll make that available. Maybe we can make it. It's it's huge. It's really cool, and it's very valuable. Thank you, Robert Kaplan. I'm uh, on a little closer. Uh, asking this on behalf of my wife, who used to be a Greenpeace activist. I think uh, Patrick and I talked earlier. Uh, are there any studies done in the Philippines on uh, confirming uh, the effectiveness? of the yellow rice uh, related, or the golden rice related to vision improvement. Uh, is that sufficient that you've had enough uh, data available to start pushing back? More than enough. We know how much beta carotene is required for a healthy diet. That's been well established for a long, long time. And when the IUCN figured out that beta carotene was necessary for the immune system, we learned a lot more about it. Uh, the, the experiments that were, were done in the trials that were done in China, as I pointed out, showed that beta carotene delivered sufficient, so, sorry, that golden rice delivered sufficient beta carotene to children to make it so that they had su enough to prevent blindness and a, a net compromised immune system. So that's all well understood. And, and, and improvements have been made since then. And these, these, Seeds will be given to farmers in the developing world for free. Uh, it, it's just really a tragedy because this, this is the, clearly one of the most important humanitarian problems we have in this world is the fact that poor children in urban slums and remote rural communities, there's two totally separate cl classes of people here, they, they are dying by the millions, and since golden rice was invented, at least 20 and perhaps as many as 40 million children have died from vitamin A deficiency for no good reason. It's easy to grow. They're growing it in field trials all over Asia, and, and we, it, it's been proven and would, and would be useful in other parts of the world, too. 
but uh, there's, there's no question of it, and Greenpeace's adamant position on this is anti-human and anti-life and anti-children and anti-mothers and anti-just about everything I can think of, and they should be punished for it somehow. I don't, you know, they should be taken to the world court or the whatever. Crimes against humanity, this is. There's no reason not to make an exception, even if they want to be against all the rest of them. We, we don't know of too many other GMOs that could solve a problem like this one, but this is the only way you can do it. They tried to put beta carotene in conventional rice for years and were not able to figure out how to do it. The leaves of rice are full of beta carotene. Every green thing is full of beta carotene, but nobody eats the leaves of rice. They eat the grain. And corn has it in it, potatoes have it in it, carrots have it in it. Anything that's yellow or orange is basically beta carotene. And, but these people can't afford fruits and vegetables if they're that poor. They can just afford a cup of rice a day. And uh, the, the world has not rallied around this because unfortunately people don't care much about people in urban slums and remote communities in Asia. Not even the Asians. All right, we've got gentlemen in the back first, in the back. Yes, sir. Stand up, please. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, Dick Merrill, Chucky, Tennessee, petroleum geologist, he, him. A couple of you mentioned uh, <coughs> the uh, temperature change resulting from all of these efforts. Is that based on uh, one of the IPCC models or, or what? Well, this was, this was a, I believe it was NOAA that developed, this was the magic simulator, and it's the IPCC, it's based on IPCC data. I don't, I'm not an expert on that, I just took the information, uh, it's, it's used quite a bit, no one, as I, as far I know, disputes it, and the simulator, you can uh, change the, uh, the climate sensitivity from one and a half to two to two and a half to three, um, you can change, it's pretty cool, you can, you can change the percentage of, of uh, CO2 that's reduced, make it zero uh, and up to 100% reduction. And so you can simulate that using that. Um, but I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a physicist, I'm a simple geologist, so uh, I lean on the, the physicists that I trust to, uh, and as far as I know, the, the work in this magic simulator is solid. Okay, thank you. In Tennessee, we have a, a solution to the body disposal problem. It's called taxidermy. <laughs> Do that to people. Yeah. Uh, Roger Carlson, uh, Saving the World Before Breakfast, a better Green New Deal. And regarding the JADAM that was mentioned, uh, that has been done elsewhere. Some of the African farmers and Similarly, uh, gathering, and it could be any kind of plant matter, could be thrown together with material. It's the old composting, green manure, brown manure, the whole things, along with cover crops. There's, uh, farming is a complex thing. There's a lot of other things you can do. Uh, cover crops being the big one, like regenerative agriculture. You might get a hit with some decrease of your production but you can get more green, like well, uh, but that was getting uh, uh, plants that can uh, uh, fix nitrogen is another thing. And you, it costs you some energy to fix the nitrogen, but you could get it with comments like Mr. Legate's talk, talking about, uh, yes, it'll put more nitrogen in the soil, and that would be, we'd want to defend the farmer's right to do that. But that was, that's already been tried. Sri Lanka tried that. That was the theory in Sri Lanka where they said, we'll use, we're going to go away from nitrogen fertilizer and synthetic fertilizer, and we're going to use to these methods of composting and natural farming. I'm an organic farmer. I like it because I grow, uh, oh, <laughs> but, and that was tried, and it was just, it, it yes, there are good things that, that helps yeah. plants grow, but it can't, you can't replace uh, nitrogen, nitrogenous fertilizer. You, you can't replace all of it, but you can replace some. It's just organic farming 
is a lot harder. You've got to be a lot smarter farmer. And they gave him no training whatsoever. They just kind of leaped off into the dark. Right. So you can do some. Anyway. It's not true that organic farming is smarter than conventional farming, if you want to call it conventional farming. When you make nitrogen fertilizer, you don't need any land other than for the factory. And everybody's been, everybody knows about growing alfalfa and putting nitrogen-fixing crops in the, in the soil and, and, and rotation agriculture. And, and nowadays we have no-till agriculture, which is made possible by GM, because you can make plants that are resistant to Roundup, and that means you don't have to plow, and that means you don't have anywhere near as much soil loss, and the soil builds much faster by that. So some of these modern techniques are really important. But the Haber-Bosch process, which is the name of the process for making synthetic, as you call it, fertilizer, won two Nobel Prizes. One by Haber for developing the process on a small scale in a lab, and one by Bosch for taking it up to an industrial level. And those are two of the most important Nobel Prizes that have ever been issued, and at least four billion of us depend on the Haber-Bosch process for being in this room. There's no question of that. If the Haber-Bosch process was, was ended in this world, there would be mass starvation in the same scale as if we ended fossil fuels. And there's no doubt about that either. All righty. Uh, we're, we're done with questions. Thank you very much. All righty then. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 15th International Conference on Climate Change. This session is going to be about severe weather and climate change, of which, well, there's just no linkage. It really isn't. Uh, one of the most common arguments that you see in the media on a regular basis is the fact that they say, oh, there's a tornado outbreak. It must be climate change. There's a heat wave. It must be climate change. We have a massive snowstorm in California. It must be climate change. It's none of those. It isn't. And the people that are going to be presenting today are going to show you the data and the statistics that show that severe weather and climate change just doesn't have any linkage. It just doesn't. And uh, I would remind you that on our website at climateataglance.com, you can find all of this information on a regular basis, graphs and details, and also uh, there's another website called everythingclimate.com that you can go to and get that same information. And of course, my website, What's Up With That, where we discuss it daily, and climaterealism.com, where it's also discussed daily. So today we have with us a distinguished panel of three people. Dr. Stanley Goldenberg, who is an expert on hurricanes. We have with us Joe Bastardi, who is probably the best forecaster in the United States. He has... That's not what uh, Charles, the moderator, has been saying about me. <laughs> <laughs> and we have uh, Sir Christopher, Christopher Monckton with us, who's going to be talking about um, tornadoes and wildfires. And I want to point out, despite the fact that that picture up there showed mine, my face, I am not James Taylor. Um, anyway, <laughs> it, it's not up there now, but it was. Anyway, so we're going to get started, and we're going to uh, hold all our questions until the end. And our first speaker, Dr. Stanley Goldenberg, why does it seem like hurricanes are getting stronger and more destructive? Okay, I always get an honorary PhD at these conferences, but... Uh, uh, first of all, it's just an incredible privilege any time to speak at a uh, Heartland conference. I'm very grateful for all the work they do, and I love to, uh, to be here. And we're talking about why does it seem, that's the key word, like hurricanes are getting stronger and more destructive. It's a matter of M and M and M and M's, and that's what's going to be the, uh, the flow of this talk. So let's talk about the first M, me. So to learn a little bit about me, first of all, I am here on my own time, and the views I present here do not necessarily represent those of my employer, the federal government, or NOAA, although I will say that most of the stuff I'm presenting are things that either is based on my personal research or experiences and things that I've checked into, and many people know agree with it, but I have to do that disclaimer, uh, and that's not because NOAA's given me a hard time, by the way. 
And uh, so anyway, I've had a lot of these slides, by the way, I'm going to go very quickly. You can watch the video later and slow it down if you need to. But I'm going to try and get through a lot of material and lots more. I, all of us would love to share much more, but I squeezed in whatever I could in this short period of time. And in my career at the Hurricane Research Division, which has had different names through the years, I have interacted with numerous hurricane scientists, uh, visiting scientists, I mean, uh, tops in their areas of expertise. I've had personal research with the forecast models, climate studies. I participated in the field program, flying out, uh, gone through the eye over 100 times, flown around storms, many, many uh, flights, uh, and firsthand knowledge of how the data are used to determine the position and intensity of hurricanes, quality control, and final finalize. I'm also part of the NOAA Seasonal Hurricane Outlook team that tells you what we think is going to be for the hurricane season. And by the way, I have to tell you that when I brief our uh, headquarters at OAR uh, each time before the press release, I say, now I don't know if our outlook will be correct, but one thing I tell you with 100% certainty is if there is a devastating storm out there this year, someone will blame it on man-made climate change. And I'm right every year. So, and also I experienced the full blunt of Hurricane Andrew. Uh, and I always have to show this picture, and you can actually see the story on a geographic special at that link below. I had a baby 12 hours before the eye wall destroyed our storm, before it destroyed our house, and I was in the house with my brother and sister in law, their three sons, and my three sons. So it was quite an experience. Uh, now, this might not ha seem to do with climate, but there's a reason I want to show this slide. And can we reduce the intensity of hurricanes? Well, I was there when they were doing Project Storm Fury, where they were going out there and seeding the storms. Those are just the different names of our organization. And attempts to create a weaker outer eye wall. This is basically to do an artificial, what we call, eye wall replacement cycle, just to reduce the winds by even 10 or 20 miles an hour, which could greatly reduce the damage. It was abandoned in the early 80s. This has gone on for decades really careful science, but they finally, and lots of funding for this, but our lab had enough scientific integrity when they saw that the theory, which you had to have super cold water uh, at certain high altitudes for us to seed, uh, was not going to work. And also, as you can see with this plot of Hurricane Allen, where it went Cat 5, Cat 3, Cat 5, Cat 3, Cat 5, Cat... This was the first storm I dealt with on a professional basis. And there was just so much natural availability to distinguish it would take incredible amounts of experiments, but the main thing was the theory did not hold water, and w our director wrote the kind of RIP article for Project Storm Fury. That's what we call scientific integrity. Um, and I'm glad to be at HR. It's a real honor to work at the Hurricane Research Division. I've been there over 40 years, and I'm gonna retire someday. Uh, so let's talk about another end, meanings. What are the definitions? Uh, confusion of terms. Now, I like using AGW a lot, anthropogenic global warming, otherwise known as Al Gore warming. Uh, and then there's anthropogenic climate change. I avoid saying plain old climate change when I'm talking to people, because that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about man-made or anthropogenic. If you ask me, do I think the climate is changing? I said the climate's always changing. So anthropogenic, man-made, Global warming, climate change, whatever, is not the same as just global warming or climate change or climate. People are getting used to, are you worried about the climate? And they're talking about climate change, anthropogenic climate change. And just because you have fluctuations doesn't mean it's AGW. Just because you have weather, that doesn't mean it's AGW. This is an important key that inconvenient truth, the COPs, the Greta, all that, and most of them, they're talking about CAGW or CACC. In other words, catastrophic. They're not talking about minor stuff. We're all going to die. So fact is there's numerous scientists, which we know well here, who don't expect catastrophic AGW, but agree we can experience catastrophic climate change. There's certain changes in climate, natural fluctuations can have tremendous impact. And I'm not addressing the issue of whether ACC, AGW is happening. I'm addressing the issue of even if it is happening, whatever is causing different climate fluctuations, is it affecting hurricane activity through the years? So let me talk about the third one, my story. How did I come to have my eyes open in this area? Now, my research was mainly in tropical climate in general and hurricanes and climate. I'm not an expert in the AGW area. So like many other meteorologists, I basically initially accepted those theories. Oh, yeah, more CO2, warming, greenhouse, all that. But then after the hyperactive 2004 hurricane season, a well-known climate scientist who we grew up in school knowing, Kevin Trembert, calls a press conference to declare that we are now seeing the increase in hurricane activity caused by you know, anthropogenic global warming. 
And I and some other, we said, whoa, wait a minute. There's no study. There's no paper. There's nothing that would support this. And then I started to realize hurricane conclusions from the IPCC were warped. In fact, a very famous resignation letter talks about that from Chris Lancey. And then the light bulb moment. If they're do I remember this exact thought. If they're doing this with hurricane data, I wonder if they're distorting the overall general climate stuff. And then like many others, including my good friend, Dr. Neil Frank, former director of the Hurricane Center, spoke at the last conference, I started to look into it. And this is what happened. When Toto pulls back that curtain, someone else showed this. And what's the first thing the wizard says? Everybody, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And he closes it again, but it is too late. And that's what happened to most of us. Once we saw it, it's like, forget it. You start to see all the garbage and all the distortions going behind the scene. Then I was asked to debate, by, to debate someone trained by Al Gore. And my wife was urging me to do this. And I said, no, no, it's not my field of expertise. And she convinced me. So I started studying, watching Convenient Truth, searched online, discovered some of Lord Mockton's materials. Uh, great stuff. Saw the great global warming swindle with tin ball and so much more. And I realized this is a piece of cake. And the debate was easy, because once you have the curtain pulled back, it falls like a pack of cards. Then I was invited to the first ICCC in 2008, meeting many other scientists, and the rest is history. So now, on to the next step, measurements. This is probably one of the biggest keys. If you want to see a, a video of, of the flight I filmed into Hurricane Katrina was hitting land, that's the link for that. So measurements, it's, it, this is probably the most important thing. It's the problem using the historical tropical cyclone database. Temporal non homogeneity. It's always changing. We're always improving. We're always changing how we're measuring. Before 1944, all you had was ship obs. And in fact, way before that, you didn't even have radio communication. You know what they were getting until they came back to the court from, into the uh, port from their logs. And also, the ships avoided the stronger hurricanes. <laughs> they knew from the waves they weren't going to go through the middle of a Cat 5 hurricane. So you didn't measure a lot of the stuff out there. The land knobs depended a lot and evolved. The aircraft who started in 1944, how they measured in the 40s and the 50s, vastly different. I mean, I've been flying since 1980 and the amount of changes and evolution and how we're measuring is enormous. In, in the 50s, they would have people in a bubble in the bottom looking at the waves on the surface, trying to decide how strong the storm was, come back and then their leading officer would say, commanding officer would say, no, that's too strong. And I mean, it, was, it gets get better and better and better. In fact, besides the planes, we have had the big drones that fly at 65,000 feet. We have smaller drones that fly near the surface. There's now balloons that we're controlling going Going up and up. just more and more measurements all the time. Ocean measurements are changing. Improvements in the land observation. Satellites, continual satellite coverage didn't start till the end of the 60s, but satellite coverage then is vastly, vastly different. It's always, always changing. So in fact, uh, Dvorak, who just passed away recently, uh, he um, came with a technique to know the strength from the uh, satellite. Uh, but then in the 80s, you got infrared satellite. So that even changed and evolved. Then you have spatial non-homogeneity. It's like different, different hurricane basins. They measure differently. Earlier, depending on ship, tra ship tracks, it depends uh, where the aircraft, there's so many changes. I can't go into all these, but many of the alleged AGW-related increases or trends interestingly match the data measurement changes as well. I once was interviewed by the New York Times and uh, they were asking about a certain paper that came out and I said, this is just one of a parade of studies based on a misuse of the historical database. And I still say that to this day. So this just shows all the different uh, measurements and you see where uh, continual satellite coverage uh, started, but so many improvements through the years. This is one of my favorite slides by Chris Lancey uh, from 2007. And what it shows is the percent of tropical cyclones in the US hitting land each year. So you look before reconnaissance and there were many years 100%. That means they did not know the storm was there if it didn't hit land. Then as soon as you get reconnaissance, you have a lot of years without 100%. And as soon as you get satellite, forget it. doesn't get anywhere near that. Uh, did, the, did the activity change? And were they changed? Maybe more used to hit land? I mean, come on now. Uh, anybody with half a brain can know this is a change in observations, not a change in activity. Uh, and then you look at a year like 2005 versus 2000, 1933, both incredibly active years 
years, but before satellite and aircraft OBS, uh, 1933 season, nothing out there in the Eastern Atlantic. And I happen to know a prominent hurricane scientist who said, oh, that's because they've shifted as far as where they form now. I mean, hokey baloney. Uh, and then we have one of the favorite instruments, the GPS drop sounds. When these started being used in hurricanes in 1997 um, uh, in uh, Hurricane Guillermo, uh, did I say 1987 there? Oh, no, 1997. Uh, and I was there for that flight. Uh, I mean, it was like taking a CAT scan of these things. It, was, it just added so much to our data uh, to understand the winds, everything. In fact, the analysis of the eye wall, we started to see a better way to adjust the winds from the plane to the surface. And that's why they changed Andrew from a Cat 4 10 years later to Cat 5 because we reanalyzed the aircraft data. Uh, Hurricane Dorian in 2019, uh, you know, versus historical hurricane. So they said, the Hurricane Center said, it tied with the 1935 Labor Day hurricane for the strongest Atlantic hurricane landfall on record. But Dorian was measured, it was one of the, the most measured hurricanes out there by all the aircraft. And what did 1935 storm have? No aircraft, no satellites, very few OBS, no direct measurements. I, you can't compare stuff like that. But people make statements of, as far as that. I will go to the next, media. Okay, I have lots of experience with media, like some people here, local, national, international, print, radio, TV, even Conan O'Brien, you can see that. That's a real hoot uh, when they stuck me on that. So let's talk about the media. Why are they inaccurate, okay? Sometimes it's just plain old ignorance. They don't know. They don't understand what you're saying. Sometimes it's sloppiness. They have time constraints. Have you ever been interviewed? They just throw the thing together. They don't want to know. They don't really care as long as you get their article out. Then there's the bias. They think they know. The Weltanschauung, worldview, they're colored glasses. So that's where it gets to be deliberate. And then there's deliberate lies. And sadly, it happens enough where they don't want you to know the tr truth. And the facts only matter uh, if they serves their agenda. And other facts they just toss out. Censorship, lots of censorship. And many people here, we've experienced and seen that censorship in the media. Uh, recent example, Don Lemon, bless his heart, CNN is interviewing the acting director of the Hurricane Center when Eon is about to clobber the southwest Florida coast. What does he care about? What effect does climate change have on intensification? Jamie says, you know, we can talk about climate change later. I want to focus on the here and now. Don later. Yeah, but what effect does climate change have? He had an agenda. You know, it seems these storms are intensifying. That's the question. Jamie, I don't think you can leak time. At the very end, Don is so frustrated. He just says, well, I grew up in Florida. I know hurricanes are getting stronger. So I emailed Jamie and I said, he's so smart. We should hire him. I mean, and then I had three interviews in Time Magazine. Two of them were centerfolds. I was in the centerfold of Time Magazine. Uh, and, and Madeline Nash, an excellent science reporter, uh, who we got her even on a hurricane flight, balanced article. She interviewed me and others and basically accepted the multi-decadal scale view that we talk about. Had some opposing views, very good article. 2004, she came back again, did another article. Then came 2005, someone else interviewed me. I still remember I was flying nights and I was like, oh, it's Time Magazine, I'll do this. And it was like I and two other real experts were stuck at the end as the skeptics uh, that were making hurricanes worse. And by the way, that cover was repeated in every version of Time Magazine. And usually they have different ones for different countries. They were gonna hammer this home. Uh, again, it was very biased. Then manipulated mindset. Okay, these are such good quotes. And I didn't put who they're from because there's disagreements who they're from. I gotta read it. If you tell a lie big enough, keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield people from the political, economic, or military consequences of the lie. It just becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Boy, we see that in so many areas. And what I learned, the quote I learned, thank you. Oh, yeah. The quote I learned last time at the uh, last Heartland, it's much easier to deceive people than convince them they've been deceived. And we see that once they've heard something a hundred times, a hundred times, kids are in school have been have the mask thing drilled in their, in their head so far that parents can't even talk them out of it. It's just incredible. So let me go to the next M, the models. So what are the expected changes in hurricane activity from global climate models? Where they double the CO2 and you have all these kind of things. Current consensus, the overall number will decrease, but a slight 
And that is slight. That increase is so slight that our current measurement devices might not even notice it. But there's going to be a slight increase of the stronger storms. So it has to be something bad, and they emphasize that. Uh, the key is it's not just the sea surface temperatures. You can have warmer sea surface temperatures, but a different atmospheric circulation, you don't get the same storms. And they usually say, we expect this. I always correct it if I'm reviewing an article. You're suggesting it. The model suggests it. You can't expect it. It's a non-verifiable hypothesis. Due to the observations, you have to wait for decades for it to happen. And of course, this conference shares all sorts of problems with the climate models themselves. Uh, let me go to modes. EOFs, multidecadal. OK, so I love this uh, particular talk, this slide uh, from this paper. And what it is it's three modes of empirical orthogonal function analysis, which is a great way of pulling out these different types of variability in data. So this is sea surface temperatures, global sea surface temperatures. And on the top, you basically have the global warming mode. In other words, there's a trend, a long-term trend uh, going up. Whatever it's from, there is a trend there in the sea surface temperature data. But it increases the vertical shear. It's associated with increased vertical shear, which rips apart hurricanes in the Atlantic. Therefore, you have a downward trend in US landfalls. Then you go to the El Nino mode, which is the middle one, three to seven years. That's when that's positive, that also increases the vertical shear in the Atlantic lower hurricane. The only one associated with increase is the Atlantic multidecadal mode. So you have a few decades favorable, unfavorable, favorable, unfavorable. It's decreased vertical shear, higher activity. So let me just show this. Uh, well, first of all, here's the uh, ACE index, which is an overall measure of hurricane activity in the Atlantic. So a lot of the studies I see, scientific studies, they start in the 70s and 80s. Some of them have a good reason for doing that. And they go into the present, and gee, you get a trend. Someone else, I think this was in the movie we saw uh, th Thursday night. But, oh, gee, what happened before that? And by the way, people look at, if you're an honest scientist, they say, you know, it looks more active in the current, ac the current high activity era than the previous one. And I say, that's before they had satellite. I mean, there was so much we didn't measure back there. I'm sure it was a lot more active, and that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, and by the way, this multidecadal mode is associated with these fluctuations, oceanic temperatures, particularly in the Atlantic, uh, a few decades up, down, up, down. And it's interesting that the um, proxies show the multidecadal signal for hundreds of years. Uh, and I got to wrap this up. And this is just shows it's a very robust signal, tremendous increases. And I. I just had to have this in there, just the Webster, just because it's published doesn't make it right. And he was saying that the number of cat fours and fives doubled. You can look at one of my older talks to see more about this. Doubled in the last 30 years. The trouble is that the, this was all before the Dvorak technique came out. As soon as it came out, it flatlined. Uh, and I'm, I'll skip that. So finally, more people in harm's way, I got one and a half minutes for this, is that the U.S. hurricane damage, so here's from the uh, early 1900s of the present, is it anthropogenic global warming, climate change? Oh, if you adjust it for population and value for all the property that's put in the way, it flatlines. Because it's not how intense a storm is when it hits, it's uh, where, how, when, you have Cat 4s and a Cat 3. Cat 4 Brett hit the least populated area of the Texas coast, 15 million, one death. And then you had Katrina, Eon, uh, and I'll skip the rest here so I can wrap it up. Andrew, if it had just been 15, 20 miles north, triple the damage. The yellow is where the devastation was. And you can see the population, the, the uh, value of land so much more to the north. And just to sum it up, um, is that perception, what seems versus reality, if you carefully use the historical record, uh, you will see just cycles, no real trend. Uh, you have some in the media that just emphasize the anything bad has to be global warming. And uh, uh, they're not new. They're a naturally occurring weather system. Man doesn't cause them, and man can't stop them. And we need to continue to focus on improvements in tracking intensity models, understanding the threat, because hurricanes have Happen. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Thank you very much. I went six seconds over. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley, and for that enlightening amount of data that you've presented. That's one of the fastest slideshows in the West. <laughs> All right. Our next speaker is the well-known Joe Bastardi, formerly of AccuWeather, now with Weather Bell, and he 
does some of the most serious and insightful forecasting in the United States. He did a fantastic job last year of forecasting Hurricane Ian, one of his best forecasts ever. So he, today, he's going to talk about, is the weather getting worse? And I want to just add a quick prelude to this. When I started doing television weather in 1978, I had a TV dinner tray full of magnetic symbols that I'd put up on a metal board, and I had a teletype machine. Today, we have people running amok with cell phones trying to get video on CNN. We have all kinds of computer models. We have the internet. We have all these fantastic tools. And there's a bias associated with this. It makes everybody think the weather's getting worse because there's more information being gathered and presented thanks to the electronics revolution. So Joe's going to talk about that plus some other things. Thank you, Joe. Have at it. Stanley, I want you to bow your head and thank God that I'm not your next door neighbor because I don't have my dad anymore to talk hurricanes, but I could see right now I'd, I'd be over at the house 24-7. Uh, well, you know, when, uh, when James talked to me about this, I said, you know what? I mean, there's so much stuff that can refute this. And it's absolutely not a benefit to me it's telling people that the weather, oh, don't worry about the weather, nothing's going on. I'm in the private sector, for goodness sakes. What the heck do you need me unless there's a disaster going on, right? You don't see me on TV say, hey, look at that big high pressure system over the central United States. Everybody's dancing around and happy. The fact of the matter is that if there's anybody in this place, in, in this, high, this whole place or whole world that wants the weather to get worse, it's me, all right? <laughs> In fact, that was the big knock at AccuWeather that I would always look for trouble and try to supply the forecast for it. And you know, because when I grew up, I didn't get put to bed with the stories of the three little bears. I got put to bed with the story of the three big hurricanes in 54. That's what my dad, that's what we talked about. So I, I, my, I, I came to the conclusion in the 70s and the 80s that my dad did not know what he was talking about. He used to tell me how bad the weather was in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I'm like, yeah, sure, you're walking uphill both ways in the snow, even in the summer, just to get to school, right? You know, the old thing where the kids just don't believe their parents. But then I started looking at it, and I started looking because I was so darn bored with the weather in the 70s and 80s. I've always been a hurricane freak and a heat wave freak and a snowstorm freak. And basically the 70s and 80s, nothing that wasn't happening. So I went back and looked at the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and the, most, the more I looked at it, the more I said, boy, wow. Why can't we have that today? In fact, you know that, you know that Kimberly Clark, uh, is she a senator or something? Uh, she's a senator and she says that, um, oh, my child is having nightmares, uh, you know, about climate change. And I said, well, first of all, you must be an abusive parent to be doing that to your kid. That's, <laughs> secondly, I had the same nightmares except the opposite way. I was always worried the weather wasn't going to turn out as bad as I wanted it to. So I understand that. So is the weather getting worse? Well, if it is, we've adapted. So that's it. I'm done. Enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. I mean, seriously. And, you know, Alex Epstein talked about this. All right, so we have four times as many people on the planet now and 128 the climate weather deaths. Um, I don't know, do they want to go back to the 1930s? I guess they might, they may, they may want to. So, uh, you know, what I did was I said, you know what, instead of, you know, going over all these examples, because you can't compete with Pilkey and, and uh, all these other guys, I said, uh, I'm just going to go back to the 1930s, the decade of my dad's youth and all the stuff he was saying, let's just look at it. So almost 100 years later, let's compare the 1930s with the last decade. Now, these are the daily high temperatures in the summer, and there's a lot of argument that we should be looking at max temperatures because the mins are coming up because of all sorts of different things that are going on, including, I think, increase in water vapor is, uh, you know, making the mins higher, or you could get the pen, you know, and Anthony's the expert at this. I mean, Penn State, when they put the, in 78, when we built the Walker building, the, uh, the, um, the instrument shelter was outside the Walker building, but there were no buildings from the, from the building to the golf course. So it got very cold at night on the golf course and, you know, sun comes up, the air mixes, bang, the temperature goes down. Now they have buildings all around it. So, oh, nighttime temperatures are going up. It's like Las Vegas, right? So I like, I like to look at max temperatures, but this is, this is hard to believe. That's a whole decade. Now, this past decade, the summertime maxes have been warmer in the West 
and a little bit warmer in Texas. And that's why, well, Texas last year, oh, this is the hottest ever. It's like one-tenth of one degree hotter than the hottest before because uh, it, so it's the hottest ever. So these relatively smaller changes, and they're happening more in the west than the east, and I think that may have to do with increase incoming solar radiation because we clean the air in the west. That's another, we, right? We get all the sulfur dioxide out of the air in the western part of the United States and the, um, the amount of smog days are down in Los Angeles. Point is, I mean, which, do you want to argue over this is worse than the 1930s? Okay, winter in the 1930s were colder, which means that the difference between summer and winter was more extreme than it is now. In fact, that's what I think is going on, that we are narrowing the range, right? Now, I always thought that, well, you want more extreme, you need a bigger range, right? So, you know, we're talking about the West. I hope everybody's at home with the range. Oh. Thank you. So with a deer and the antelope play, it is, it is getting colder. This past de decade, winter maxes, which is consistent with distorted, war I call it distorted warming. It's warming more relative to averages in the north than it is further in the south. And it would also, gee, aren't we in a, a warm cycle of the, uh, the oceans also? And, uh, you know, you see that in the, especially the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. And uh, also, listen, this is not just what's going on around the United States. There are very interesting things going on in the Indo-Pacific, which I talk about constantly on Weather Bell, that make it harder and harder and harder to get a consistently cold winter in the eastern part of the United States. If they start warm, you'll get cold in the middle like we did last year and the year before, and then it comes out. If they start cold like this year, you get the January thaw. Right? I mean, it's amazing how this is linked back and forth, but I'm going to go get into it. Nights in the 1930s were colder, too. Probably a lot of it had to do with the fact that um, there may have been less people around also. The, but it, it, you can see the 1930s, if you're looking for more extremes, it's worse than this decade. So why are people telling us that it's so bad now? Um, the past decade, again, where water vapor has not affected temperatures the most, you can see in the central part of the uh, states, there's not much change. So what about precipitation? Remember, the drought index takes into account demand. Al Gore? See, he doesn't, and, 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 and uh, Stan showed that with the, uh, you know, if you normalize the uh, amount of damage in a hurricane and actually adjust for what's going on. For instance, I would suspect that the demand in the 1930s was not as great as the demand now in the western part of the United States, right? There's all, the Washington Post, they just had the article on Lake Powell. It's at the lowest level ever. 22, well, it was built in 1960 for one, and it was serving 10 million people, that now it's serving 42 million people. Secondly, I suspect it won't be at the lowest level ever when the record-breaking snowpack that's surrounding it actually melts off. And then we'll hear that the snow is melting faster than we've ever seen it melt before. And that's because there's so much snow, and it stayed cold so long that when it finally got warm, what do you think the snow is going to do, okay? All right, so the, here's the growing season precipitation anomalies in the 1930s. All right, now, let me ask you a question. We know about the drought in California, all right? Which do you think the United States as a whole, we're a big country, which looks worse to you, that or this? The most recent decade. It's like God has blessed America to grow food with that kind of situation right there. So... So what, what, by the way, I'm sitting there going, wait, wait, look at that. In the Colorado River Basin, there's actually a small area of above normal over the last decade. So the fact of the matter is the West is a dry climate. You think, you fly into Las Vegas, I'm sitting there flying in Las Vegas, I'm going, look at all these golf courses. Like, how the heck do they keep these things green? Well, I, you know, you build, it's like the same thing with the wildfires. You go build your house out in the middle of the woods, well, guess what's going to happen? We got this town in Texas called the Woodlands. I don't know, and it's a beautiful place. But let's keep all the tall, skinny Texas pine trees up so we can have nature. Not only can you not see a house that you're supposed to be looking for, but what do you think is going to happen when a Texas hurricane comes along? It's just going to chop that wood up on top of all these houses. Oh, look at that. Climate change is increasing damage, right? So 
In what world are we not better off now? Look at the drought severity index, 2011 to 2020, all right? And remember, it takes into account demand. A lot more people living in Texas, a lot more people living in California, right? There are more people living in the Midwest, too. Look at it in the 1930s and consider how, how small the demand was in the 30s compared to what it is today. So how is, how is it possibly worse than today? Oh, you're cherry picking. You're telling me it's worse than ever, and I could go back to a decade? I mean, if, you know what, I could play the game with the 40s too. Now, all right, Stan did all the hurricane stuff, so you know, um, my, my dad used to always tell me when I was a little kid, hurricanes are nature's way of taking heat out of the tropics, redistributed into the temperate region, so the guy that can figure out what the tropics are doing will be able to understand what is going to happen to the global weather pattern. He used to always walk around saying that to me. And uh, he also used to always walk around talking about his shortcut storm into the mid-Atlantic states. He goes, oh, 1933. I was like, oh, really? Well, look at this. What if you had today two major hurricanes hitting the United States within 18 hours? What do you think the reaction of the media would be today, right? So do you think the media even knows about this? Or uh, 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 the, the 1933 hit today. Now, Sandy was a bad storm, had extensive winds. We all know about Sandy, right? It went right over my dad's house in Atlantic City. My dad's been through eight hurricanes. And uh, he, uh, 27, 2796 pressure in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And when the wind came from the south, that's when it really got bad, he told me. He said the north wind, when the eye was approaching from the east, was not bad. He goes to the south, he goes for four hours. He said it was roaring like I thought I was in 38. That's the benchmark with him, 38. But if 30, 33, 33 hit at Virginia Beach, there were 86 mile an hour wind gusts all the way up to Long Island. You know, I wrote this thing called the Philadelphia Story. When I, I looked at the, when Isabel was coming along in 2003, I said, what's the prevent a category two hurricane from hitting at the mouth of the Delaware Bay, shoving water up Delaware Bay like it did Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, right, in 54 and 38. And then meanwhile, the heavy rains occurring with the hurricane naturally in the Delaware River Basin are coming down, converge right over Philadelphia, Wilmington. The question is, why hasn't that happened, right, as opposed to, well, how can that possibly happen? All right, and then there was 38, uh, not to mention Labor Day 35. So the hurricanes were worse back then, too. And I've got this whole idea that what we should do, uh, just if I were the director of NOAA, I'd dump tons of money into the hurricane research, and here's what I would do. I would create a power and impact scale that takes into account the size of the wind field also, because Harvey and Carla are not the same storm as far as the overall strength. Carla gave hurricane force winds to everybody on the Texas coast, and Harvey was relatively small. I realized it got stuck there, got captured by a cold trough. Or Donna versus Ian. I mean, Donna was just, um, well, as my dad did his uh, thesis at A&M on it, so I'm well acquainted with Donna. And, uh, so Stan talked about hurricanes, but I'll get to the cold in the, the 1933-34 was unbelievable. There's a movie out called Cinderella Man, one of my favorite movies because it is mostly true. And when I see a movie, the weather darn well better be what was going on. And it was brutally cold the year, uh, you know, James Braddock's kids were trying to, uh, you know, break up a fence because they had no... No way to heat their house in December of 33. That's when the movie was set. And um, so I went back and looked. And sure enough, December of 33 was very cold. But look at the difference there. I mean, are you kidding me? Can you, it's 25 degrees above normal, 20 to 25 degrees above normal in one part of the country and 15 degrees below normal. That's over a period of a month. And February 34 was close to 20 below normal in New England after the December that was 15 to 20 above normal in New Orleans or whatever it is. I mean, when do we, when do we even see that anymore, right? Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I think of extremes, I think, well, Cold is cold, warmest warm, right? So it seems to me that if I can just off the top of my head go, <laughs> you know, James asked me to talk about extremes, I'll go back to the 1930s. I like to go to the 50s because that was, uh, you know, oh, this Texas drought is so bad. Well, let me tell you something. In 52, 53, 54, all right, 
The drought, the drought that hit Texas in those three years and gave birth to the Junction Boys and the Texas Aggies story in 1954. Uh, and that's when I started learning about because Bear Bryant was at A&M and this whole big, uh, whole big thing, and my, I grew up down there, about how they took the team out to Junction, Texas. And 118 guys went out there and only 20 came back, but that became the nucleus of a team won the Southwest Conference. But it was the hottest, driest summer in Texas, on Texas record, 54. So what does all this mean? Well, if I could just go back to the 1930s and find worse weather and more deaths, how is it this missive about it getting uh, more extreme exists? And what is at the root of this? So just consider the five aspects of evil. Evil creates confusion and contention. Evil is expert at fooling others with smooth speech and flattering words. Evil craves and demands control. And the highest authority is their own self-reference. Evil plays on the sympathies of goodwill people, often Trump in the grace card. Evil has no conscience, no remorse. All right, so, you know, I, 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 at my age of 67, you know, I figured out, well, this, God must have made me to do this. So if I stay focused on him, his wind's at my back. So to me, that part of this whole aspect is spiritual. People say, oh, there he is. He's talking about God and the weather. And God gives, hey, let me tell you something. If you're a meteorologist focused on the good Lord above, God never gives you an answer. He gives you questions and tells you, get up off your butt, use your talent, and answer those questions, right? And there's nothing like the weather. To, to teach humility. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, well, it's absolutely true. You know, when I was working at AccuWeather, it was every awful the glory of AccuWeather, AccuWeather, this AccuWeather, the Hurricane Center says this, we gotta say that, blah, 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 right? And so I, I and, you know, Neil Frank, and I've always been spiritual. Well, Neil Frank would come on and, you know, he's a very spiritual man. And, you know, Neil would, Neil was a very humble guy. And I was like, we're AccuWeather, blah, 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 blah. And the one guy, one of these times, I go to Houston quite often, I'm going to show up at his house and tell him, man, you had it down from the get-go, right? And so what it has taught me is, and I think if you're a good scientist, all right, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm, I call people, I say, well, I'm more like a bare-knuckle guy in a bar or something rather than the rules of Queensberry science, you know, right? I used to think peer review was a guy walking up and down the beach looking at the docks and trying to figure which one was going to fall in. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. But I think what, what, what I have found out is the more I know or the more I learn, I realize the less I knew and the less I actually know compared to the entire system, which would, if you believe in the creator and the infinite majesty and power of God, the weather is the greatest example of that. And so these kind of things where people, I think a lot of it has to do with if people trying to convince other people that if I control you and your actions, I can control the atmosphere and make everything safe. Well, hey, you know, we have a saying in Italian, solo rischi ando tu vivere, which means there is no life without risk, all right? So I think that the natural order of things is chaos to order. In, in our lives, we have chaos, all right? And by restoring order, we strengthen ourselves, right? There's a challenge. Well, the atmosphere does the same thing. And this is uh, uh, Bob Enlicks here from A&M, and I don't know, my dad taught me, uh, and my dad's an ag and meteorologist, he said, the thing they taught at A&M, that weather and climate was nature's way of always trying to, uh, to correct an imbalance that it cannot correct because of the design of the system. So there's constant back and forth, constant swinging, all right? Now you have people that have turned the weather and dragged it into the sewer, which is really what it is. I mean, I was a weather geek from when I was a kid. I can't even believe I see the stuff I see going on now with what was the subject. So, oh, my nickname was Blizzard Belly when I was a kid. I mean, that's what a geek I am. Now, all of a sudden, it's a big political thing where, you know, you got all these people doing stuff. So, for me, after watching all this, it brings a lot of attention to our side, mostly bad. I think there's something bigger at work here. I just went over this. And uh, th this is an interesting talk here that I've just given because it's the first time I've ever ended up under time, which is good 
because we have a guy who can really talk over here, Doc, uh, uh, Chris Bonington. <laughs> so anyway, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you all. Alrighty, you know, Joe is a walking encyclopedia of hurricane information. I mean, you, you think of any hurricane, he can tell you about it. In fact, I've, I've heard that he even mumbles the names of hurricanes in his sleep. Katrina, Camille, Betsy, and his wife thought he was thinking about old girlfriends until she realized it was oh, hurricanes. my pinups. <laughs> let, let, let me just say real quick, those were my pinups. I had pinups of Alma, Betsy, all the eyes, and uh, you know, and it wasn't a Sports Illustrated a model uh, <laughs> issue. I waited. I waited for the April edition of Weatherwise with the hurricane reviews in it, <laughs> and the, the Journal of the American Meteorological Society because they had the write-ups. Yeah. Joe's got a lot of passion. In fact, you, a lot of you probably don't know, he spent a lot of his life in the sport of wrestling. He is a very avid wrestler. And I would say I would pay a huge amount of money to see him in a cage match with Don Lemon. <laughs> All right, enough fun. Uh, speaking of fun... Sir Christopher Monckton is going to be presenting on why extreme weather was wrongly expected. And he'll have some interesting facts for you. Take it away, Christopher. You see me on the program as James Taylor. No greater honor could be conferred upon James Taylor. In fact, uh, the truth is that no greater honor could be conferred upon me than to stand in James's name. Having had a horrific accident only a few months ago, James has bravely proceeded with this conference, has come here, has chaired it with his usual steady hand and kindly wit. Can we give him our appreciation for that? <laughs> now, I'm here to talk about wildfires and tornadoes, and very kindly, because I was called in at rather the last moment, um, Anthony sent me some slides, and I had unfortunately mistakenly thought that those were the subject that he was going to talk about and that I should therefore avoid, so I haven't included those slides. So I must apologize most abjectly to him for my stupidity, but I can tell you all about wildfires and tornadoes. They're not a problem. And that's the end of my talk. Um, <laughs> what I thought I would do is to say why it was that the climatologists thought that there might be more extreme weather. Now, I actually asked Sir John Horton this question. He was the chairman of the IPCC for its 1990 report. And in 2007, I got in touch with him and I said, I can understand that if you have a doubling of the CO2 in the atmosphere or the warming from all greenhouse gases made by man over the 21st century, you would expect one degree roughly, 1.2 maybe, of direct warming. But how do you parlay that up to three or four or five? And he said, well, this is feedback response, you see, because of extra water vapor in the atmosphere as it warms. So I said, fine. but..." Why do you think that it's that big? I mean, this is a, an essentially thermostatic system. So why so big a feedback response? That doesn't seem a priori to be very likely. And he said, well, we have to go back to 1850 before we started messing around with things. And he said, then the total natural greenhouse effect was 28 Kelvin. And the direct warming from all the non-water vapor greenhouse gases at that time was 8 Kelvin. 28 over 8 is 3.5. So if you have about 1 to 1.2 Kelvin of direct warming, you multiply by 3.5 and you get 3 or 4 Kelvin and that's why we think that's how much warming there's going to be. But you see, they screwed up. They got it wrong. And if we look at this slide, this shows the IPCC's current projection of, of 3 to 5 
Kelvin, two to five Kelvin, I should say, of warming after including feedbacks from a doubling of CO2 or from all the anthropogenic warming we might cause this century. And the direct or reference climate sensitivity is 1.2 Kelvin before you allow for feedback. And so everything else to the right of that dark green box is feedback response. And they think, therefore, that feedback has a very big response. And here is why they thought that. This is the classic feedback amplifier block diagram. You start on the left with a base signal. That goes into the summative input node, P1. It goes up to the gain block, G, then round following the arrows to the output node, P2, with the output signal, then down to the feedback block with the feedback fraction in it, then back to the input node, and round and round and round infinitely. And nobody in climatology understands this diagram. It's too complicated. <laughs> so my team have recently been working on simplifying this diagram, which goes back to Harold S. Black in 1926. And we came up with this, which gives you exactly the same output for the same inputs and the same feedback strength. And it's much simpler to understand. You simply add the base and gain signals before they even go into the feedback loop. On the left, you see the feedback response. On the right, the output signal. And at the bottom there, the feedback block as before. That gives you exactly the same result. And when I first showed this to our professor of uh, control theory, the theory of feedback from engineering physics, he said that must be some kind of a coincidence. He could not believe that the classic feedback loop could be represented as simply as this. But he has since confirmed that he agrees with this. So we can now put some figures on it for 1850. And this is exactly what uh, I was told by Sir John Horton all those years ago. And that would give you, as you see at the bottom right there, about 4 Kelvin of equilibrium double CO2 sensitivity. And that is quite a lot. But here is how it should, uh, here's how, what would happen if you carried on and actually went from 1850 to a doubling of CO2 after 1850. And you see that would still be 4 Kelvin of equilibrium double CO2 sensitivity because they put in 1 Kelvin of direct or reference sensitivity. Uh, that means you get about 2 Kelvin of feedback response. 3 Kelvin is the final output, or maybe 4. That's the sort of thing that they expect. And you see that the uh, feedback block is 0.7 either way, and that really doesn't change between 1850 and uh, now. What they left out was the fact that the sun is shining. What they should have done is to put in, for 1850, the 260 Kelvin emission temperature that would prevail at the surface of the Earth if there were no greenhouse gases in the air at all. Then you add the direct warming by the pre-industrial non-condensing greenhouse gases, and then you send that round the loop, and you find that, therefore, your sensitivity goes down from 3 or 4 Celsius or Kelvin to just 1.3. And that makes quite a big difference to the numbers. We can now, again, double the CO2 compared with 1850, and you see it makes virtually no difference because the sunshine is so dominant in the calculation. So that means that if you then work backwards from the predictions they make of how much global warming we might cause, you then work out what the corrected feedback strength would be once you take account of the fact that the sun, like it or not, is shining. Then you see that it's between 0.14 and 0.27 watts per square meter per Kelvin of the direct temperature. And that is so small a number and so small an interval that we do not in any way have enough precision to measure and work out how much warming we will cause by using any kind of feedback analysis. And yet, the IPCC goes on and on talking about feedback analysis. Now, why did they not understand that they couldn't do what 
uh, control theory normally does and leave out the base signal, which in this case is the sunshine, it's because in a traditional feedback circuit and for an electronic system or for a factory process controller, the feedback response is one or two orders of magnitude greater than the base signal. But in the climate, it's exactly the other way round. The base signal is one or two orders of magnitude greater than the feedback response. They didn't realize this. They thought you could use differential feedback analysis in the climate, and you can't. And IPCC, in 2013, actually mentions the word feedback 1,100 times, but you can't use feedback analysis in uh, doing climate prediction. So how can we predict global warming? Well, you can use the energy budget method. The equation there, which I won't go into in detail, you can do what's called a Monte Carlo simulation, which we've done here. This was a billion separate trials. And then you integrate the results, and you get a fairly typical Gaussian distribution. And you'll see that, once again, just as if we assumed that the, we were calculating on the basis of the 1850 feedback regime, you still get about 1.3 Kelvin as the mid-range estimate of doubled CO2 warming. We can also get the same result by an observational method, because in the IPCC's uh, first assessment report in 1990, they predicted 0.3 Celsius per decade. Actually, only 0.14 Celsius has been seen. They predicted 3 Celsius per doubling of CO2, so we would predict 1.4 Celsius on the base of the actual temperature change, about the same as the 1.3 we got before. And here you can see that it is indeed scenario A of the four emission scenarios in uh, IPCC 1990 that is the one that is correct, because if we use the scenario B thing, you can see that the actual annual emissions have gone up by 50% compared with what the scenario B direction would have predicted. And also, just for fun, there's been no global warming for eight years and five months. And you won't see that reported anywhere except, of course, at Anthony Watts' wonderful blog. And so this is our third method, then. If we assume that the feedback regime stays the same today as it was in 1850, and that is the assumption that climatology itself makes, then, again, you would expect 1.3 Kelvin of equilibrium double CO2 sensitivity. So we've done that calculation by three separate methods and got the same answer, which is not much more than a third of the central estimate that they make. Now, there are one or two other interesting results that I would like to give you on behalf of others who couldn't be fitted into the program today. First, from Professor Art Vitorito, who has been a distinguished speaker here many times before. And he has been doing some research on whether subsea volcanism is making some contribution to global warming. And he says that the evidence for an intensification in the El Nino uh, warming uh, of the tropical eastern Pacific after 1995 is to be found in the fact that the Western Pacific thermocline has deepened by 10 meters, as you can see from the data here. Deeper is actually higher in this slightly confusing graph, but that's how it goes. And here he says that um, if the thermohaline circulation um, warms from below, then you get exactly the pattern of warming around the Earth that we are actually getting. So again, there appears to be a, an interesting correlation there. And he says that polar amplification warms the Arctic faster, but El Nino amplification, that's the increase in El Nino activity in the tropical eastern Pacific, uh, then you can see that the, uh, there's a significant correlation again there. And then he takes the global picture from 1979 to 2021, and he, he sets them aside by two years, and you get quite an interesting correlation. Again, now correlation is not necessarily causative, but these are several correlations, all of which seem to point to the same result. And what I would say to this is uh, what you often see at the end of a paper when the author is looking for another grant. More research is called for. <laughs> now then, also, why can't wind and solar give us net zero? They all say we must go to net zero globally by 2050. But actually, we can't do that by relying chiefly upon wind and solar. 
And this is Douglas Pollock, who has also spoken here many times before, and he kindly got in touch and said, could I please convey very briefly his result to you? And this really is the end of the climate debate, as you can see, because the excess generation, if you put too many wind and solar systems on the grid, is equal to the nameplate capacity that you install of these weather-dependent sources minus the mean demand on the grid every hour. And that's a very... This is, this is the equivalent in climatology of E equals mc squared. It's E equals N minus D. Nameplate capacity is the capacity to generate electricity by a weather-dependent source in ideal weather for that source. And so that equation means that if you put more wind and solar nameplate capacity on a grid than you should, then you will be throwing away the extra electricity, wasting the capital cost of the extra uh, capacity that you've put on, and destabilizing the grid and very, very greatly increasing the cost. And he then had a look at various countries, and all those with red at the graph, those are the ones that have already overbuilt and are wasting their electricity and therefore paying enormous prices per, watt or per um, gigawatt hour of electricity that they generate. Uh, this causes immense pain. Britain is losing all of its major um, heavily energy dependent industries. Even little industries are going too because we now have the most expensive electricity in the world. And we've only gone over that limit by one sixth, but that is enough completely to screw up the economics of the grid. And here you can see for the American grid in particular that if you were to back up the wind and solar with all the fuels that mix that you have now, a bit of coal, a bit of gas and so forth, then you make barely any change in the grid CO2 emissions. If you were to have gas back up only, then you would save sort of 10% of grid emissions, which is still only a very, very tiny fraction of the total US emissions. So you can see that even if you actually do install up to the uh, limit in the United States, and you're only about halfway there yet, you still make virtually no difference either to the American or global CO2 emissions. Now that limit is actually a very important one because it means that since typically you can't put uh, you can't generate more than about 20 or 30 percent in most grids of your electricity from wind and solar without going over that limit and just throwing a lot of money away. Therefore, that is the biggest capacity you can install without um, continuing to increase your CO2 reductions. So if you get to that limit, anything more you put on after that will not reduce CO2, so it won't get you. To net zero. So that result by Douglas Pollock is profound and even though it looks naive, we've checked around the industry, nobody knew that that limit existed. So here is something which Professor Simon Michaud of the Geologian Tutkibus Cescus, that wonderful word Tutkibus Cescus, which I'm going to say again because I like it, Tutkibus Cescus, <laughs> is the Finnish for geological survey. And I do love the Fennoscandic languages. They have these wonderful words. But now, what he's done, he spent several years looking at what techno metals, the specialist metals, would you need if you actually wanted to get to net zero globally by the methods that have been outlined by those pushing this agenda by 2050. And if you take the total global 2019 production of each of just these seven metals, which I've taken as a sample, then you'll see for copper, you'd need 180 years' worth of the entire 2019 production of copper. Go down the list a bit further, germanium, greater than 29,000 years' worth, vanadium, greater than 67,000 years' worth. So that's kind of not going to work. In other words, there aren't enough metals, even for the first 15-year generation, of net-zero energy infrastructure. 
And then, because all these things wear out after 15 years, you've got to throw away your electric buggy's battery and get another one. You've got to do the same with the windmills and replace them, and there's no way of recycling any of it. You've got to start again and find the same lot of minerals every 15 years. It's not like a coal-fired power station that lasts 70 or 80 years, and it's made of steel and concrete, which are, of which there are massive supplies, and runs on coal, of which there's about 4,000 years of remaining supplies. So the next question then is, can we, are we actually making any difference at all? Now this is the NOAA uh, graph of the absolutely straight line increase in anthropogenic forcing throughout the last 30 years. And you can see that all those trillions spent has made no difference whatsoever. So let's pretend they might make a difference. How much global warming could we forestall? Well, there's been 0.4 Celsius of warming in the last 30 years, so we would be able to abate, if we all went in a straight line to net zero, 0.2 Celsius, and that is all, over the next 30 years. And so the infinitesimal effect of net zero emissions can be seen on this rather small print table. But if anybody wants copies of the slides, of course, I can let you have them. But what it means is that even if the whole world went to net zero, it's not going to make any discernible influence to the climate, whatever. And if only the West does it, because the rest are exempt and they're not doing it, and China and, and Pakistan and India and Russia are all increasing their coal capacity, then you can see none of this is actually going to happen. And of course, if you target the West as, you, as they are, and you exempt 70% of the planet, you're not going to get very far with your net zero ambitions. And why not? Because here is that increase in coal consumption already evident in China, India, and Pakistan, and that's before they've recently announced still further massive expansion. Now we're going to briefly count the cost of net zero. That is the IPCC's data uh, that gives us the Celsius per units of forcing. And there's McKinsey's cost of going to global net zero. Just the capital cost is 275 trillion. You have to multiply that by three to take account of the OPEX cost as well. You're looking at 800 trillion. Here on the back of an envelope is how much money, how much global warming you could stop for one billion dollars that you spend on making it go away. And the answer is one four millionth of a Celsius degree, the worst value for money in the entire shoddy history of governmental economics. So why does all this matter? The answer is, first of all, that banks have banned lending for coal projects in third world countries, in Africa in particular. And that is racialism. There's no other word for it. It's racialism. Westerners live 80 years, Africans live 65 years. One large factor in that is they've hardly got any lights on at night, as our satellite shows here. And here's what's happening in Britain. Our steel companies are all pushing off and going somewhere else because they can't afford to put the furnaces on. Here's another one, the steel. Corporate bankruptcies are at a record level because they can't afford the electricity. The interest rate on people's mortgages has tripled. The annual energy bill of a little post office and sweetie shop has gone from £7,000 last year to £56,000 this year, and they're all going bust. So here, at the end of it, I say this to you. You can see what complete nonsense this entire global warming rubbish is. And if those of you who are fortunate enough to see these presentations will lend your ear just for a moment, I will say this. We will not be silenced. We will continue to search for the truth. We will not fail or falter. We will get the message through to you, whether the mainstream or legacy media and their beastly controllers like it or not. The truth will be heard. God bless you all. So, thank you, Christopher, for that presentation. Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about severe weather in this forum, and uh, I want to ask, uh, how many of you folks have seen the media 
try to equate severe weather to climate change in the last year? That's virtually everyone, right? Okay. How many of you believe severe weather is driven by climate change? Nobody. All right, my final question. My final question is, how many of you have written a letter to the editor or done some pushback to the media on these claims? All right, that's about half. What about the other half of you? I say to you, like Christopher Mocken was saying, we will prevail. The truth must prevail. I ask you to be activist in pushing the truth. Push back when you see this stuff in the media. Write letters, ask for guest columns, demand an interview. Don't let them get away with it. Okay, now we're gonna have questions. And I'd like to ask you to keep your question to one question with no follow-up, please. All right, uh, first question, this gentleman down here in the front in the black and the blue shirt. Um, so, I'm Roy Eapen, I'm from Montreal in, in, in Canada, and uh, I keep hearing from people that we were going to have no snow now, and which would be more convenient for me because I don't like shoveling. Um, and this year we've had multiple snowstorms giving me as much snow as I've ever had. Um, when they're always wrong, why do they not, why do they persist in this? I don't have an answer for that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do. I have an answer for that. The background to why this global warming thing is being pushed so very hard and in such an organized way is that it's being pushed by the countries who are not themselves doing anything to shove up their electricity prices and destroy their grids. This comes from those countries who do not wish the West well. And they have been very active through their intelligence services and through the long periods through which they've recruited people from your universities and ours. One or two of yours have actually been arrested for their links with Russia and China. But there is a very clear connection that goes back many decades, which our intelligence services have been following with mounting horror now that they see that this is no longer a cost-free exercise. Now that they see our businesses going bust at a record rate, foreign inward investment into Britain, which used to exceed that of the whole of Europe, has stopped because we have gone further than almost any other country towards wrecking our electricity grid and therefore putting up the prices, which are the major cost for every business at the moment. So this is not accidental without going into too much detail. It is deliberate. It is coming from a particular totalitarian political faction. And it is only because that totalitarian political faction will trash the, the public reputation of any politician or journalist who dares to speak out and raise any questions on this that they have managed to silence almost everybody. We are the last men standing here in this room. And because they have silenced almost everybody else, the vast majority of the population simply don't know there is another side to the story. I recently was talking to a, a member of the British establishment, a former president of the MCC, Maryland Cricket Club, and his wife. When I mentioned that there was a problem with the official science on global warming, they were astonished and they said, but don't you realize all those people at Sharm el-Sheikh are talking about this real problem? Do you say that you know better than all of them? Yes, I said, we do. <laughs> All righty, thank you. Next question. Uh, uh, Noel Lindquist, California. Um, Chris, I'm a real neophyte when it comes to feedback loops, other than uh, feedback from my wife that's gone on for 58 years. <laughs> uh, I think I heard you say that the feedback loop, or one of them anyway, goes around and around forever. Yes. Why then, in layman's terms, why doesn't the temperature go up and up and up and up? Ah, because the feedback fraction has an absolute value less than one, and as it goes round and round the loop, uh, you get successive powers of the feedback fraction that sum 
to 1 divided by 1 minus the feedback fraction. And that closed form sum of the infinite geometric series of powers of numbers subject to the convergence criterion that they, they shall, their absolute value shall be less than 1 uh, was discovered. It was the first closed sum form of an infinite series ever to be discovered. And it was discovered almost 200 <laughs> years ago. And I don't think any climatologist actually knows that background, but I, one of my hobbies is number theory, so I can tell you that that is the case. So if you sum that series of any, um, if, if you take any value whose absolute value is less than one, and then you add, you can do it on a pocket calculator, though it takes time, and you add them all up, you'll find it always comes to 1 divided by 1 minus the, uh, that particular value. So that's why it doesn't sort of blow up infinitely. Next uh, question. Yeah, Cynthia Hampton, a retired NOAA scientist. Um, one of the things that um, you always get from the news media that really drive me cra drives me crazy, especially with hurricanes, is... Um, the, num the way they've named storms recently, probably the last 20 or something years, they've gone from just naming hurricanes to naming tropical storms and hurricanes. And it seems that's what the media and the population has now thinking that there's not more, a lot more storms than there used to be. And um, I was wondering if you think that that's also a reason why there's a perception of more uh, tropical storms and hurricanes that are hitting the United States and that there's more storms out there because that's what their media is trying to put out there and the naming of the storms and changing that process. Yeah, uh, Absolutely not. Uh, the naming, uh, they used to always put numbers, something, the uh, uh, phonetic alphabet, uh, and they started naming. It's for, uh, they've always named, once they started naming, they name it from tropical storm. We call that name storm and above. So they didn't suddenly start naming the tropical storms too. What has changed the perception is they are observing a lot more of them because we have satellite. Uh, there's a lot of studies, I didn't show the slide, that there's all these short-lived storms that would never have been observed before. They were too quick out there. But now we're able to see, yeah, this reached tropical storm strength uh, out in the middle of the Atlantic. So let's mark that, even knowing something's a tropical storm when it's approaching land, the measurements are better. So that's really the reason. It's definitely not the naming uh, system. And of course, NOAA is not naming the, the low pressure systems. That's something the Weather Channel is doing. But as far as uh, the hurricanes themselves, the naming is very helpful. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I want to add something to that, a question. There's been discussion in the media that we should label uh, or rate hurricanes now as cat six once they get beyond a certain level. You know, there's been a discussion about that. Now, what do our, what do our hurricane experts think about that? Well, first, first of all, cat five was quite strong enough for me. Uh, and, uh, and that's just that people just are exposed. They're bombarded by these devastation images. Uh, and it's hard for people to comprehend. But nobody... Uh, who really knows these things is is shocked uh, because we know that's what a cat five does. If you look at the definition of cat one through cat five, you hit cat five and it's devastation. It's this, it's this, it's this, all these things. What they are thinking of doing is somehow modifying it to include things like storm surge and other stuff because certain storms have different impact because of the different amount of rainfall, uh, the, the speed, how long it sticks on an area. I mean, Dorian, I cannot imagine what the Bahamas went through when it just sat there for days uh, as a Cat 5. Uh, but also, the, uh, like I said, the rainfall, the spread of the wind. I just mentioned a side thing. It was very interesting with Katrina, which was Cat 3 when it hit. I was on the plane. I was the one reporting those measurements from the surface. And uh, Category 3 went ahead. Uh, but the storm surge, blew, that shocked us. Because in Mississippi, the storm surge was, I think it was about 30 feet. And even a Cat 5, like Camille, was 25 feet. And we were saying, why did this Cat 3 do 30 feet? And what it is, it's something else where the spread of the energy. The yeah. fact it was Cat 5 before, and it pushed, there's all sorts of things that go into it. But for the public's sake, you have to keep things simple. If you yep. make it too complicated, 
you know, then then it just goes out the window. The All message right. goes out the window. You got to have those short, pithy statements. Joe, what do you think about it? First of all, it sounds like the move your microphone over. Sounds like the uh, this is spinal tap idea where the guy goes, well, my guitar goes up to 11. Everybody else's only goes to 10. Uh, no, but. Uh, I've, I've been putting out for 20 years now uh, an idea of a power and impact scale that takes into account the radius of strong winds, 34 knots, 50 knots, 64 knots, because then the total power of the hurricane can be estimated. Harvey and Carla were not the same as far as power goes. Now, Harvey stalled, so there was a lot of rain. If Harvey just kept moving, it was compared to Carla, it was nothing. E I'm not going to say nothing, but Ian for instance, versus Donna, all right? Ian was a, a very powerful hurricane, but it was much, much smaller in the amount of area affected. Sandy, the reason Sandy had such a great surge, I shouldn't, my dad always said, don't use those terms like good and great, you know, we're talking disasters, but the, it, the, hur the hurricane force winds were extending out 90 to 150 miles to the northeast, Okay, we had a storm back in, um, what was it, Danny or something. They had hurricane force winds extending out 10 miles. It was a Category 3 hurricane in the Atlantic, and it was by the Saffir Simpson scale. But 60 miles to the north, the uh, data boy didn't even have a wind blowing more than 10 miles an hour. Now, how does that compare? So we've, we've got to quantify better and, you know, explain it, that this is a bigger storm, and people don't get the idea. The power of Katrina... I mean, and also it was coming into a funnel-shaped area. See, that's a real problem, the way the coast gets shaped, right? Because where's the water going to go? It keeps piling up, piling up, piling up. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, some kind of um, different scale has to be uh, developed, and uh, I certainly uh, would hope that they, they look at that thing. I think it will be over the years. But Category 6, why well, we go in Category 7? What the heck, you know, we might as well. <laughs> All right. Let, let me Thanks, quickly Joe. Let me appreciate quickly, both of you filling in on that. Go ahead. Yeah, let me quickly add one one quick comment to that. It's just the Andrew, which was Cat 5 hitting Miami. You didn't even have sustained hurricane force winds in Fort Lauderdale. And then we've had another hurricane hit Miami, and you had sustained hurricane force winds all the way in Melbourne. So, yeah, they vary tremendously with these. Rick Wormov from the free state of New Hampshire. have a 1930s question for Joe. However, it's more recent than that. Hurricane Fiona came up the east coast, a couple hundred miles off the coast. A high pressure system kept it from recurving to the east and accelerated it further north until it got into the Canadian Maritimes and trashed it very well. I'm interested in referring to weather from the 1930s for examples of comparison of similar extreme weather. Can I equate Hurricane Fiona with a hurricane of 1938, so shifted east a couple hundred miles? Well, when you, when you look at tracks, like we have, we have a different set of things going on. Now I've put, I believe the global wind oscillation um, is changing, so it's distorting hurricanes. The, the aforementioned Category 6 was brought up by the Washington Post with Florence, because Florence was coming toward the coast, it was a cat. It was re-intensifying again. This could be a Category Six, and it just fell apart coming to the coast. And part of the reason these storms are falling apart, what was it? Uh, was it Henri? Uh, Henri, a couple of years ago, they fell apart coming into New England. I thought we were finally going to get a hurricane hit in New England. We haven't had one since '91, and it fell apart. The barometric pressure, because of the warming, is distorted. So a lot of these big storms, unless they are hustling and moving fast, they're not, going to, they're not going to increase. They're going to actually spread apart and decrease because that's what nature does. And when they come to the coast, the bigger the storm is, the more as it comes to the coast, it starts drawing in drier air. Baraclinic effects start getting involved. So you need these things to hustle and move along. And when they move along, what, what, by the way, what happens with these storms when they move fast is it's not you don't add the wind on to one side or the other. I was, look at the 44 hurricane, had 156 mile an hour north wind gust to Cape Henry. I go, what the heck was that wind? 250 miles an hour on the east side? No, what happens is with these storms, if you line, it, what, and this is what happened in 38. It's why you saw the wind pattern you did. The, on the eastern side of the storm, 
the wind is still lined up with the trough, okay? So the hurricane is still maintaining itself enough so that the strong bands of wind can get down to the surface. Western side of the storm is raining like crazy. Why is it raining so much? Because the storm is cooling and it's spreading out the gradient of the storm because of the cooling. So what, it, it, it's fascinating watching these things. Like for instance, Irene. I, Irene, my aunt, had more damage at her house in Rhode Island from Irene than Bob, which was a category two slash three, came right over her house because of the wind distribution with these things. So it's very, very interesting the way that works out, all right? But you need the storm to be moving fast and not wasting its time to, uh, to come in. That's why the, uh, you saw, I don't know if any of you guys saw the article, hurricanes are going to get worse hitting the Northeast. And, uh, you know, unless you have them moving in quick, moving very, very quickly, it's going to be very tough to do that. Although, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for it. 31 years, no hurricane hits in New England. After one, listen to this one, from 38 to 91, there was one every 6.7 years making landfall on Long Island or New England, and since 1991, nothing. Man, that's a, that's a pretty amazing statistic for non-extremes. Ernie LaFleur uh, from Texas, uh, CO2 Coalition member. I have a question for Stanley. I appreciated the discussion about the change in observational data uh, over the years. And uh, my question to you is, what date would you say you can make reasonable uh, correlations forward? There's enough satellite data or modern instrumentation that comparing weather data uh, after X date is reasonably comparable. I know it's cha they're changing all the time, so how do you pick a spot where you say, hey, that's pretty reasonable data and I can compare it? It's changing a lot beyond what you can comprehend. Uh, and I would probably, not necessarily Saturday, I'd probably say starting in around 1997, uh, because that's when we started using the GPS drop one sons. Uh, but now we're using, because that was the first time we were taking actual measurements at the surface out at sea. Uh, and, the, and then we can compare and better analyze the satellite data. But honestly, let me mention one comment. When you hear them talk about how strong a hurricane is out at sea, far enough that our planes aren't flying it, and they said this hurricane is 932 millibars, you know, 140 miles an hour. I love if they would put in parentheses, estimated via satellite. There's, it, out there, there's still nothing flying them out there. So you still have to be careful even with how good the data, the data is today. Because once our plane gets in it, that's what the Hurricane Center really trusts. And so we can, you can change a category because you've flown in it and taken what we call in situ data rather than remote data. So it's hard to say, it's just getting better and better. Certainly with satellite, continual satellite, infrared satellite, I would say at least the mid 80s, late 80s, because even the satellite coverage kept improving. It's, it, it drives you nuts when you've watched this stuff uh, evolve. All right, thank you. We got time for one more question, maybe two if it's short. I'm Dan Becker from Chicago. I'm president of uh, Heteros for Humanity. And my, 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 my question relates to temperatures and uh, Michael Mann's uh, hockey stick. And I've always wondered, and I haven't been able to uh, find anything on the internet, if you took hockey, uh, Michael Mann's hockey stick and you took off the data at the end of the hockey stick based on the uh, thermometer readings, the modern thermometer readings, and you went to the data source for the first thousand or so years on the chart, the uh, the tree rings and the uh, pine forest in northern Canada or Europe or wherever, wherever it is, what would that graph look like if you, if you continued with the same apples comparison? Well, well, well I, I wanted to say something about that. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I've had dinner a couple times with Dr. Mann, and we don't argue about stuff where you just talk about what we have a common denominator on. But uh, I, I've, I've often, when he, when he says something, I often can tell he never forecasted the weather. For instance, he tries to get rid of the medieval warm period, and part of the reason is he can't find the same kind of warmth with his cones in the polar Urals or the western United States. But here's what's fascinating about that. If you forecast the weather, you know if it's warm in western Europe, it's usually very cold in the polar Urals, and, uh, polar Urals, and it's cold in the west. 
western part of the United States much of the time. Why? Because of trough rig, ridge configurations. Now, when I look at, we used to have a, a saying at Penn State, ridge in Spain, warm up in rain, right? Because if you had the ridge over Spain, we knew the ridge would be in the eastern part of the United States, would show up, right? So my contention with him is, you know, just because you didn't see it someplace else, doesn't mean you just say, well, I'm just going to erase it. It was localized. How the heck does something stay regionalized for 100 years on a planet that is constantly going back and forth from chaos to order? I, it, it makes no sense. So that with this whole hockey stick thing, I'm like, I'm gonna talk. I, I don't believe it. Yeah, I'm going to add something quick to that, and that is most people are not aware of something called Liebig's Law. Liebig's Law of the minimum has to do with plant growth, and it's something that was completely ignored on the hockey stick. The law says that whatever is the least available resource will limit the growth of a plant. And so it could be water, it could be sunshine, it could be temperature, it could be nutrients. You can't look at tree rings over the last thousand years and say absolutely that was only temperature. You can't. Science can't determine that. They, they can maybe find some proxies for drought or whatever, but they can't absolutely say that this tree ring didn't widen up because of temperature only. So tree rings are not a good proxy for temperature. Okay, we have one, one last question over back here. back on this too, very briefly before we get the next question. Uh, I did, a, uh, first of all, to answer the question directly, if you take off the temperature record, the uh, hockey stick becomes a lot less exaggerated at the right-hand end. The, it, it's clearly very, very different. But also, you can use a different proxy, which is much more direct in the shape of sea level rise, which we can quantify much more reliably going back over the last thousand years. And if you do that, you get the same graph as Hubert Lamb's original graph, which you'll find in uh, figure 7C of the IPCC's first assessment report in 1990. That was the record then, and it showed the medieval warm period loud and clear on the left, then down to the Little Ice Age, and then up to where we are now, which is somewhere in between the two. And the sea level graph from Grinstead et al. 2007 matches Hubert Lamb's temperature graph Exactly. It's quite extraordinary how well it fits. If you try and put the hokey stick graph against the sea level graph, it doesn't fit at all. All right. One quick question, please. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be brief, I promise. Uh, my name is Patrick Besher. I am the uh, chief executive for a drinking water utility in upstate New York. I can tell you the drinking water industry has been drinking a lot of Kool-Aid. It's <laughs> definitely accelerating. It's a freight train out of control. And it makes me wonder, it takes me back to comments made by Lord Monklin last year when you joined us virtually, essentially you said that the United States was sort of the last great firewall to stop all this globalism. And I'm curious now, in the year that's gone by since then, in your opinion, has the needle moved in either direction? Are we just holding our own? Is it neutral? Are we gaining ground? I'm just curious your thoughts. The great thing about this country is that it is in love with democracy. And it is in your hands to chuck out any administration, you may know which one I'm thinking of, <laughs> which has drunk the Kool-Aid, as you say, and to bring in an administration that is willing to stand up for the West against those outside the West who have foisted this climate nonsense on us and by an organized campaign of reputational assassination have terrified most of those who are skeptical about the official party line from speaking out. So it's in your hands. And the great thing about this country is that you have a constitution that puts the power in your hands. So use it. All right. Well, my name is Craig Rucker. I serve as the president of the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, a Washington, D.C.-based organization that works on energy and environmental issues. Uh, our panel discussion today is going to be, or it's titled, I guess, Climate, Energy, and Animals, Including Humans. I think this is a very important panel discussion here, and it's one near and dear to my heart at CFAC because 
Uh, so often at these conferences, and I've been going to them pretty much since they began, uh, we focus on the science, and that is important. Uh, and I think where the left, or the green left, is particularly vulnerable is the impacts of what they're trying to put forward. Now, CFAC, along with Heartland, along with ACOP, uh, have been very involved in something kind of novel, and that is attacking it based on these renewable programs on humanitarian, but also environmental grounds. Uh, for so many of our years, we've been fighting against, you know, things like excesses of the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, and some of these other things, because they've been abused by the left. But, in truth, uh, and that's true, they have been abused. But, as it turns out, it's not that necessarily we shouldn't protect endangered species or have clean water protection laws, but if there ever has been policies that actually showcase why we need at least some measure of these, it's green energy. Why do I say that? Because when we have solar panels out there that are being put in desert tortoise habitat that cover acres and miles of land, that's troublesome. I think it was Michael Moore in Planet of the Humans who really documented this best. While he was a little off base on his environmental uh, claims about climate change, if you watch that movie, he basically gave the message that our organizations have been saying for a long time, the clear cutting of the forest to provide timber for biomass plants in Europe, putting uh, turbines off the coast, the east coast of the United States that impact whales, and some of them quite endangered, like the right whale, of which there's 350 species or less, or turbines out in Montana and Wyoming, where studies show that 28% of the bald, or golden eagle population would be wiped out. This despite these eagles are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty and the Bald Eagle Protection Act. What do the le was left do on other policies? Well, here's how they abuse them. One fracking site in North Dakota not long ago uh, killed three Canadian geese and about six Phoebes and was shut down for months at a time. That they, you know, are, uh, use their act for, which is ridiculous. I mean, do these birds fly into the fracking sites? I doubt it. You know, this is just, first off, they're not that endangered either. So. The proportion is crazy, and this discussion for this panel right now is one that I think we as conservatives slash libertarians need to start embracing because it's a vulnerable, vulnerable point on the other side. We have three excellent speakers, Sterling Burnett, David Stevenson, and Francis Menton, who are going to discuss these issues. Our first speaker will be Sterling. Uh, like he needs an introduction. Everybody knows Sterling. Uh, he, is a, a, he got an associate's degree in arts and sciences at Eastfield Community College, a BA, a, a, or BBA, and a BA in cultural anthropology. Anthropology? Anthropology. anthropology. Duh, I can't see. Need glass. From Southern Methodist University and a PhD in applied philosophy at Bowling Green State. He is a Heartland Senior Fellow on Environmental Policy. He manages and edits Environment and Climate News. Prior to joining the Heartland Institute, he worked at the National Center for Policy Analysis for 18 years, ending his tenure there as Senior Fellow in charge of Environmental Policy. So without any further ado, I bring to the stage Sterling Burnett. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for all showing up. I know I've got stiff competition across the hall. Uh, we all do. I think that we have the better panel, but uh, that's another story. Uh, so, my talk is, as you can see, the misuse and abuse of animals in the climate debate. Now, I should tell you, as background, I did not get into environmental ethics and environmental policy because I cared a whit about the climate. When I started doing this, no one had ever said the word global warming or climate change. I was worried about wildlife. And in particular, I was worried about how laws 
the United States had put in place to, pro to protect wildlife was not only not saving them, but was providing disincentives to protect them and to preserve them. And I wanted to change that. So I, I've, I've long been interested in wildlife, long before I even got into public policy. Um, so the first section is the abuse of animals. And by abuse, I mean misuse, is the misuse of animals as representatives of the damages from climate change. We'll get to the abuse later. Right now, it's how they've been misused to portray the dangers of climate change. And I title this, Bears, Butterflies, and Bees, Oh My. Now, uh, because of time constraints, I'm afraid I'm going to skip the butterflies, but we'll get to the, we'll, we'll at least see something. There's a bear. That's a pretty pitiful looking bear. I mean, anyone who looks at that bear and thinks that's not pretty sad, uh, doesn't know much about bears. Polar bears became the poster child of climate change when pictures of starving or drowned bears cir were circulated by Al Gore and others linking their deaths to climate change, right? Sea ice loss. Now, the data tells a different story. Sea ice is bouncing back, net primary production is booming, and uh, from lows of 5,000 to 10,000 in the late 50s, early 60s, there's as many as 30,000 bears today, despite the warming. You wouldn't know that if you saw uh, Al Gore's film or almost, you know, anytime you see a bear, I, I hear this a lot, oh, the bear, a bear attacks somebody. No, bears never attack anyone. They, they, they ate a woman and child in, in, in Alaska. And it's like, well, their population has tripled and the human population in the same area has more than doubled. You might have more conflicts when that occurs. Now, so what's the truth about bears? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's, uh, uh, I, I haven't yet seen a bear drink a soda, but uh, I'm told that that happens around Christmas every time. Um, the truth about bears is this. Now that's a healthy looking bear. And she's got two cubs. And three cubs now aren't rare because nutrition is up, because net primary production is up, despite the fact that sea ice shrunk some in around 2012. Another danger, bear in danger. He doesn't look skinny to me. Maybe it's just me, but that's a pretty healthy looking bear. If, if I looked that healthy, people would say, you need to lose some weight, Burnett. Um, so bears are up. And now the, the main reason for this, why did bears first start uh, increasing? Well, unregulated hunting was ended. Uh, you can't bring a trophy to the United States now, but even while there was regulated hunting, populations were going up because they were managing the bears. The natives were managing the bears. Uh, but also because net primary production is up phytoplankton and uh, algae and things that seals and things live on are doing better. So seal populations are going up. Uh, so are uh, other populations. Everyone thinks, oh, well, bears, they only eat seals, and if they can't get them on the ice, they just won't get them. That's a lie. Every bear is an omnivore. Bears will take walruses. Bears will take uh, uh, muskox if they can. They'll get caribous going through if they can. Uh, bears will eat uh, arctic foxes if they can get a hold of them. Uh, bears will eat just about anything. So it, it is true that they have become specialists with seals, but seals are doing fine too. Now, while it's difficult to know for sure, like I said, it's not clear uh, what, what the best evidence is of why bears attacked a lady just last month, right? Um, First off, we know more about bear attacks because there's more people up there with cameras capturing these things, All right? If, if a bear eats a person in, in, on the ice flow and there's no one around to record it, did, any, did it really happen? Uh, my suspicion is that for, for decades it didn't, but um, now there are people with cameras everywhere and there are news crews that fly out with cameras everywhere, especially if there's a bear attack, because they want to claim that they're being forced to, uh, they're being forced into cities. No, their numbers are increasing, there's increasing competition, and so 
just the sheer mass of numbers and the human population growing, there's conflicts arising. Let's go to, uh, so there's no evidence climate change has harmed bears at all. You can't say climate change has harmed bears when bear numbers are going up as the climate changes. Um, I'll just say a little bit about butterflies. There's been some concern. What's this here? Oh, that's the polar bear population growth. This is a, a, a statistic that uh, Susan Crockford put out, shows how the different population of polar bears have gone up over time, right? It's, it's, it's not Sterling saying this, it's what the data says. Never, never, you know, I, 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 I'll tell you honestly, if I say something, you can believe me. But like Reagan, you should trust but verify. I'm not gonna lie to you because anything I tell you is too easy to check. I'll look bad if I do. So go out, check Crockford's numbers. Uh, there's some more stuff from Susan Crockford showing where the populations have grown, uh, where, uh, where the, there's a couple of locations where sub, subpopulations have declined. It, it's interesting that those, that those areas where the populations have declined happen to be areas in the Arctic that have cooled in recent decades. So rather than the increase in ice making it uh, better for bears, it's making it harder for them to hunt because the, uh, the sea ice there is thickening. Uh, you know, take away from that what you will. Here we are, butterflies. Uh, I love butterflies. I go to butterfly uh, exhibits, uh, museums, whatever you want to call them. Uh, what are they? Avariums? Avarian? I forget what they're called. But the places where they have butterflies from all over the world, they keep, they keep it. I, I love them. Beautiful animals. There was claimed a few years ago that world's butterflies are disappearing. Uh, and they said, uh, Western butterfly population are declining at an estimated rate of 1.6 a year. The study, the, well, the way the study was reported is they looked at 450 butterfly species. Turns out, no, that's not what the study said. There are 450 they'd like to have looked at, but they only looked at 289 of those species. And... Um, 23% of those populations had growing populations, 40% had declining populations. So it was not the case that all the butterfly species were declining. Some were increasing. Well, okay, but the 40% that were declining that they looked at, what does that mean? Is it climate change? Well, uh, it turns out it's not climate change. Well, it is regional climate change to some extent. You have forest that have now taken over meadows because the forests aren't managed. And the meadows is where the grasses were that butterflies did well in. Uh, not getting as much moisture, it's changed the structure in some of these areas. In other areas, it's farming practices, right? You went from, um, I won't say primitive farming practices, but you used to change crops, you had edge, with milkweed and things like that, that butterflies did well on. Now you spray everything with heavy pesticides, you clear it from fence row to fence row. Uh, well, butterflies don't have it as much habitat. So what they haven't done is identified a single species of butterfly that is, uh, has been endangered by climate change rather than habitat changes from various other things. Uh, what uh, this is Jim Steele. He's the author of Landscapes and Cycles. He was director of the San Francisco State University um, uh, field campus from 1984 to 2010. He studied them. And he concluded landscape changes and natural ocean cycles could account for most of the observed ecological disruptions. I began intensively investigating the evidence for other claims that disruptions in ecology of butterflies and pica, a small mammal in the West, uh, in our local region, every disruption was more parsimoniously attributed to events other than climate change. So some species are increasing, some of those species are decreasing, but none of the decreasing ones can be tied to climate change. So they, they, they don't make a good poster child, they're being misused. Then there's honeybees. Uh, many media outlets have blamed the loss of honeybees on climate change. We, the honeybees 
have gone in decline in the U.S., not worldwide. If it was climate change and it's global, why not worldwide? Uh, it turns out that even the EPA doesn't say it's, uh, it's climate change. So here's your, here's your beautiful honeybee. Uh, I've been stung by my fair share. Fortunately, I'm not allergic. Uh, I, don't, I don't advocate it as a practice. Um, so um, there have been many theories about why honeybees have declined, but um, this is what the, uh, the EPA said. Increased losses due to invasive variola mite, a pest for honeybees. That's almost entirely responsible for colony collapse disorder is this variola mite, varroa mite. Not climate change, the varroa mite. Who's saying that? Sterling Burnett? No. Environmental Protection Agency is saying that. Honeybee operators, who are the ones suffering from colony collapse disorder, are finding them on their bees. Uh, new and emerging diseases, like the Israeli acute uh, paralysis virus and the gut parasite. Well, is that being caused by climate change? That's not what the scientists say. They don't attribute that to climate change. Pesticide poisoning. Well, you know, say what you will about climate change. No one's blamed it for the increased use of pesticides and spraying on honeybees, on or around honeybees. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that the EPA, and I'm not going to go through the whole list, uh, says honeybees are declining, but what doesn't show up on their list is climate change. So when you see someone say, oh, climate change is a threat to the bees, could it possibly be sometime in the future? I guess. But is there any evidence that it is or has been up to this point? Not at all. So I, uh, I, could, see, I could do the same kind of analysis on corals, bats, uh, looking at long-term climate change and their impact on, on a variety of other species that are talked about as if they're harbingers of climate change. They're proof that climate change is occurring and it's destroying wildlife. The, the problem is when you look at data, when you look at evidence, when you look at research, none of them directly attributes the decline in these to climate change. There are other factors that are, uh, you know, with corals, sadly enough, sunscreen, right? Pollution from development. Um, now, the misuse, the abuse of animals uh, in what I think of as the feckless pursuit of green energy. So green energy technologies, most prominent among them wind and solar power, are often touted as being technologies that can save the earth from cat catastrophic climate change uh, and mandating is subsidized accordingly. There are not you know, I, I'm not going to describe a lot of green energy technologies here, uh, but I don't believe there's evidence of a looming climate crisis despite the fact that there is climate change. I'm not going to talk about birds and bats. They've been prominent for years. Um, uh, uh, James Taylor, who was originally supposed to speak on this panel, was going to do that, so I didn't plan on doing that. I'll say this. Um, uh, raptors and bats are threatened by wind. And I'm often told, oh, well, the cats, feral cats kill far more people than uh, wind turbines. Well, how many feral cats are there compared to how many wind turbines are there? If we had as many wind turbines, I have a feeling the numbers would be greater. In addition, I don't know any feral cats that attack golden or bald eagles. That, that, that would be a feral cat that became a meal. Uh, so they can't be attributed. See, which one is this? Uh, those are U.S. temperature records. Um, so there's a, a beautiful picture of a bird. There's a reason why a Sierra Club or a, an Audubon Club s scientist in San Francisco once called wind turbines the Cuisinarts of the air. <laughs> Think about that. They, 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 they slaughter birds, right? And, and, and in part, it's, uh, it's natural. Because you got to think about where wind turbines make the most sense. I'm going to go. I'd like to go back, but evidently I'm not. There you go. Um, wind turbines work 
where winds blow fairly constantly uh, for extended periods of time. Those also happen to be migratory bird corridors. So you've got a lot of birds flying through where they want to erect the first, at least the best wind turbine sites. Now they're putting wind turbines in less effective sites because they filled up the best wind turbine sites. Um, but uh, you're gonna have more bird nests. If, if we'd been building wind turbines in the 60s, my suspicion is Silent Spring would have not been written about pesticides, it would have been written about green energy. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about birds and bats. The desert tortoise. Oops, sorry. Um, solar farms and the desert tortoise. Well, desert tortoise is, is endangered. Um, industrial solar projects threaten the endangered desert tortoise. Who says so? Well, the federal government. That's why they said, we're going to put restrictions on how you have to cite them and where you cite them. Uh, they also threaten the sage grouse, which have been, uh, restrictions in sage grouse habitat have been put on off-road vehicle use, on energy production, on all sorts of things, but we're going to build large arrays of solar farms in the same habitat. So evidently, the rules don't apply when uh, Biden gets it in his craw that we've got to have more and more green energy. Uh, so they, they share much of the same habitat, but not solely. Um, now, they're both protected by federal law, protected by federal law, the scare quotes are for a reason, they don't seem to be doing much protection of the desert tortoise when it comes to green energy. So, um, what they did is uh, they started putting solar farms in that tortoise habitat and they said, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put uh, areas where solar, where desert tortoises can go under the fence and uh, still enter. Well, what's he gonna eat when the solar panels have blocked his food source? You know, they blocked the sun from, uh, from uh, the plants that he normally eats. Okay, well, what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna transport them, we're gonna relocate them to other habitats. Well, ask yourself this, why weren't the tortoises in those habitats already? Um, is it because they were just slow and didn't get there over thousands of years? You know, they were going there, they wanted to be there, but uh, they just know it's because there are other factors. Why was this prime tortoise habitat? It worked best for them. There weren't some of the predators that are in other locations. So they've got to come up with all these excuses and plans for how we're going to still protect the tortoise, but we're going to have this. So, uh, and that's the sage grouse. Uh, uh, I'm told three to four minutes less. I'm going to skip whales. I'm going to go right through this real quick. So um, the uh, desert tortoise, sage grouse, these are the solar farms. How do you think a, sol a, a, a tortoise is going to do there? Do you think the sage grouse is going to get up on his leck and attract other female sage grouse uh, in this sort of area? Uh, it turns out we know they won't, that, 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 that they do badly. The government admits they do badly, so we're going to do something about it. Uh, here's headlines saying, desert tortoise deaths raise concerns about solar farms and energy needs. I'm not saying this. Even the press knows this. For desert tortoises, road to extinction, paved with solar panels. Headline, local uh, radio station. Um... I, I hope this will play. This is one of those instances where you're just stunned that they can get away with this on a, uh, um, a modern television show in this modern age. This is... Um. There's been a precipitous drop in sage grouse numbers, and there's empirical evidence that gas exploration and extraction have a negative impact on the sage grouse environment. What effect do you think 7,000 acres of solar panels are going to have on their environment? There's 
no evidence that solar panels would have any impact on the sagebrush. What they do with the sagebrush when they put in the solar panels? They, 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 they would clear it before putting in the solar panels. They remove the sagebrush. Yes, sir. Sagegrass live in the sagebrush. They do. And you don't think removing the sagebrush is going to have an effect on the population? <laughs> I just said there's no you know evidence. What scares me about you, Stanley? You're serious. You're looking at me and you're not joking. I think Thompson, my ginger today is going to be budget discipline. You're all fired. I got to wrap this up. I'm not going to talk about whales. Dave Stevenson is going to talk about whales. But we could have talked about offshore wind in Wales because another huge thing. 350 right whales, folks. How many can we allow to die and, and still expect it to survive? Well, the uh, Department of Interior says not a single excess, one, single one a year. And yet we've had uh, two North Atlantic right whales washed up in the last month. And nothing's changed there but what? Sonar testing for wind farms. Shipping is down due to the, due to the um, uh, supply chain issues. It still hasn't recovered from, from the pandemic. There's no more fishing there than there was before. The only thing that's changed is offshore wind being tested with sonar. But that has nothing whatsoever to do with whale deaths. Thank you, Sterling. Yes, and to uh, uh, several organizations have banded together, including Heartland, David Stevenson's ACOP, and RCFAC, to try and bring litigation against uh, Dominion Energy, in particular, in Virginia, which is one of the culprits in trying to build those large wind farms off the shore. So, appreciated your comments, Sterling, especially on the polar bear. It was very good comments. So. I know, corny. All right, our next speaker is David Stevenson. He is the director for the Center, uh, Center for Energy Environmental Policy at the Caesar Rodney Institute, a nonprofit organization based in Delaware. Dave has published over 150 analytic studies, including major studies on the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, the EPA Clean Power Plan, electric grid reliability, the public policy drivers of energy costs, offshore wind, and many more. Dave has been a leader on energy and environmental policy in the State Policy Network and has served on President Trump's Environmental Protection Agency transition team and has become a source for national energy and environmental issues. All right, welcome to the stage, David Stevenson. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Heartland, for inviting me to speak. And thank you all for being here. It's getting late in the day. I try to make this as short as possible, painless as possible. Uh, my slides have been lost. Now, I have a working theory as to why they are lost. Uh, I sent them over the internet to Jim Lakely. And I think the federal government is so concerned about the work I'm doing opposing offshore wind that they got sucked out of the internet and they've disappeared. So that's my working theory. I want to tell you uh, a little bit about offshore wind and then we'll get into the, uh, the, the effects on the whales. Uh, during the Bush administration, a, a bill was passed uh, to create the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to create lease areas for offshore oil and gas and for offshore wind. Uh, that agency has the, uh, the, the, they have to decide on where the leases will go. They have to approve the environmental impact statements uh, to, to uh, build the projects. Now, when they talk about an environmental impact statement, just so you know, there's 25 different things that include things like that you might not think about, like lost economy, lost tourism, and the effects on the economy, uh, radar effects, and navigation effects. So th this is a very broad vision of what environmental impact statements are. Now, what the first thing that Boehm had to do was establish lease areas. And in, in doing that, they, they went through a process with public 
input, although not very many people were paying attention. Uh, they were supposed to do an environmental impact statement uh, when leases were proposed and skipped that step. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the effects of that. There's actually a lawsuit over that issue out of New Jersey. Um, after that, they had leases, public leases, competitive leases, so that uh, developers could, could buy the leases. The first ones went pretty cheaply. They got more expensive with time. After that, uh, the developers submitted construction and operations plans. Those plans had to be approved by BOEM as complete. Then they start with a, what's called a draft environmental impact statement. It's the first look. They get public comments again. Uh, and once again, the public comments are ignored, of course. Uh, then they do a final impact statement, more public comments to be ignored. And then they come up with a record of decision and, and approve the projects. So it's a long process. It's been going on. Uh, Bowen was created in about 2007. Uh, we just got the first project approved off of Nantucket. It's called Vineyard Wind. Uh, it was approved uh, at, I think, the end of 2021. So <clears throat> we, we go through these projects and we look for uh, what did they miss. And they missed a lot of stuff. But we're going we're gonna to mainly talk about the North Atlantic right whale. Now, this is uh, a large whale. Like, like when you see the photographs uh, of whales and everybody loves them, uh, these are 50,000 pound animals. Uh, often it'll be a female with uh, a calf and the cutest pictures you can imagine. The right whale, the North Atlantic right whale, eats zooplankton, which are small marine animals near the surface. They will form clusters and the whales use sonar to find those clusters of potential food. They also use uh, noise, they, they communicate with, with uh, sounds. They navigate with sound. They um, uh, uh, can find, the, their, uh, they can look for uh, prey, but they can also look for predators. So everything they do involves sound. Their vision is not that great. And, and sound travels for a very long distance. So they also, they migrate seasonally. So right now, they're gathering um, in a, which the, the, the federal government has established as a critical habitat area off of North and South Carolina, where the calves are born. Uh, later, most of the summer, they are up in uh, off Nantucket and uh, Martha's Vineyard, where they're feeding and uh, just getting healthy and, and uh, having sex so that they can then go south again uh, to, to, to calve. The, the females um, have calves about every uh, third year if they're healthy. So uh, while that is the pattern, there is also, uh, they're moving around all during the year. And when the, 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 the developers of the offshore wind projects will submit their comments to, to BOEM, it is, it is stated right in the, uh, the statements that the whales are common in the lease areas year round. They're more common at certain times, but they're there all year. So I'm gonna, since I don't have charts, I'm gonna skip through the pages here, make sure I don't miss anything. So, so right now, the North Atlantic right whale is considered critically endangered. They were almost hunted to death. The reason they're called right whales is because they feed on the surface. They're on the surface a lot. They're easy to find for the hunters. Uh, when they die, they've got so much blubber and oil, they float. They don't sink. So they were the right whales to, to catch. Right now, we're down to 340 uh, animals left. Uh, there were 400 in 2019, 2016 there were about 500, which had actually been uh, a little bit of a growth in, in the population. There's only 79 breeding females at this point. So uh, the responsibility for the whale's safety is rests with the National Marine Fisheries uh, Service, which is part of NOAA. Within that group, uh, there is a, man, a mammal uh, uh, protection service that, that puts together the science on, that, on the whales. 
And they have determined that if man kills 0.7 whales, a little bit less than one whale a year, this mammal will go extinct. It's as simple as that. Uh, the leading cause of death is vessel strikes. Now, there's occasionally a, an entanglement in fishing gear or ropes, uh, but there hasn't been, my understanding is there's not been a death of one of these whales since uh, for the last 17 years for that reason. So when they die, it's because of uh, uh, vessel strikes. So uh, the, the federal government has actually created uh, a large part of the year for large, larger vessels a 10 knot speed limit uh, because they, they calculated that uh, the whale might survive a, a slower hit or get out of the way. So they've created this 10 knot, uh, 10 knot uh, limit. So as we talked about, no, you know, the, the whales survive with noise. They, they make the noises to, let, to survive. Well, you're gonna get very loud noises at three different stages. One is when you're doing seismic testing to look at what's under the mud out in the ocean, where you're gonna put these uh, turbines. Uh, they're loud noises, they can be a problem. Uh, second time is during construction, you're putting monopoles 100 feet down in the mud, so you wanna know what's under, and you're pile driving, and that can affect the whales. More recently, there's been a discussion about the, the noise, the operating noise. And, and this is one that uh, Boehm tried to ignore. Uh, I, I, I've been keeping, I've done about five different uh, envir draft environmental impact statements, and you can see the progress of, of things going on. First of all, Boehm is mainly cutting and pasting at this point to make them, to get them out faster. But uh, they initially tried to ignore a study by acoustical engineers that was published in the acoustical journal that was estimating the size of these huge turbines, and I'm telling you, we're talking about 850 to 1,050 feet tall. These things are immense, size of the Eiffel Tower, size of the tallest buildings in New York City. And of course, the breadth is similar because you've got a, a, a circumference being swept. So the biggest turbines that are built right now and out in the ocean are about 600 feet tall. Uh, they're six megawatt uh, turbines. The ones they're planning are 12, 15, and 20 megawatt. They're up to this, almost twice as tall. And it turns out the noise goes up as they get larger. Well, NOAA has set uh, standards for how much noise the, the animals can take. So at 120 decibels, uh, uh, it, it becomes a harassment for the whales. They will try to leave an area that has that much sound. At 160 decibels, it'll damage the, the, the whale's hearing and it will probably lead to mortality. If they can't hear, they can't function. So to put this, this is a logarithmic scale so if you go from 120 decibels to 130 decibels, it's 10 times louder. So imagine what happens at, by the time you're at 160. Well, these acoustical engineers figured out that they're estimating that these turbines, large turbines, will be up to over 170 decibels. And sound goes down with distance. So at 9 tenths of a mile, it's down to the 120 number but then the, the spacing of the turbines is a mile apart, so you've got these overlapping sound patterns. So the entire lease area will probably be a, a threatening, um, threatening to the whales. So the big problem with this is you have, is we have 25 different leases that are being considered right now they make up a huge area. This is the one slide I wish I could show you where all the leases are. It's bigger than the state of Connecticut if you put them all together. It's a huge area we're talking about. And uh, if, if you look at them, a lot of them are they're shaped like an arrow. And the reason is because they are sandwiched in between major, major shipping channels. So if you get harassed whales in the lease area, they're going to move out into the shipping channel. 
well, where are they going to get hit by vessels in the shipping channel? Uh, the other problem that you wind up with is uh, uh, a German study that was just completed, I mean, a little over a month ago, uh, is showing that there's a wake effect when you have, you know, you'll, you'll have a, a lease area that might have up to 200 turbines in it, step one mile by one mile by one mile. It creates an effect called the wake effect. That wake effect uh, mixes the water, stratifies the water, and what that does is reduces, uh, according to this German study, oxygen co content by 10%. And what that does is it lowers the number of zooplankton and the stratification spreads the zooplankton out. The whales only feed when there's a concentrated zooplankton source. So what happens is the whales have to go further away to find food and when they do that, they tend to get thinner. A thinner whale is, mo is less likely to calve. They're not gonna have a baby. So you've got all of these factors working in here to impact the whales. And, and Bohm is basically, they, with, with all of this knowledge, they still approve the project off of Nantucket. And it's not just the whale problem. We've got other problems as well. How am I doing on time, Greg? You've got about five minutes. Okay. Um, so there's other problems. So Bohm uses a scale they have no impact, negligible impact, moderate impact, major impact. Major impact means it's going to have a major impact. So for example, uh, commercial fishing in these lease areas. Uh, Bohm literally says, commercial fishermen will abandon these lease areas, that there's too much threat of t uh, lost uh, equi fishing equipment, uh, vessel strikes, and uh, insurance rates going up if they fish in these leases. So they're, they're gonna abandon this. So this is a major impact, and there's no mitigation, but yet Bohm ignores it. Well, one of the reasons they ignore it is if you look at the first page of the environmental impact statement, it says, the climate crisis is so bad, and President Biden has given us an executive order, we're gonna make this happen and they, they ignore all the major impacts. So besides losing the commercial fishing, uh, the ma next major impact is there's gonna be more vessel collisions. And the Coast Guard is not going to be able to do the normal search and rescue. And, they, and Baum literally says, this is gonna result in more human deaths. You're gonna do this anyway? This is ridiculous. I, it, it just blows your mind. Um, some of the radar studies are saying it could affect uh, military uh, uh, actions. And for small vessels, it's gonna be extremely difficult. You know, they don't realize what these fishermen are going through. You're coming back at night in a storm or in a fog. There are, uh, the turbines create a shadow effect where, uh, for example, off of Block Island, there's five turbines I've seen radar, pictures of the radar screens, it looks like there's 15, or that there's a circle of them uh, because of this uh, shadow effect. And you know, how are you supposed to navigate in a, on a really crappy night? So you're gonna have, you know, that's one of the reasons you have more, more vessels getting, getting hit. So all these major impacts, and, and Boehm just keeps going on. So what we're doing, I, I created a national coalition from North Carolina to Maine and out to uh, Jason Hayes's uh, Mackinac Center for the Great Lakes. And what we're doing is we're making sure that public comments are made uh, on every project because you need, to have, you need to have made public comments to have standing in a lawsuit. Uh, and we've got groups that live in each of these areas, off, off the coast of each of these areas, so you'll have standing. And the Endangered Species Act has a, has a very much lower standard uh, for, for establishing standings. So this, this issue of the whales is probably the, one of the major issues that's going to wind up winding up in court. January 21st, 4th, uh, the first lawsuit was heard in the uh, Boston District Court. The judge really focused on the endangered species issue and wasn't, didn't seem as interested in the other issues. So uh, we were thinking it's gonna go in that direction. 
Um, so uh, one of the things we've done, we, we created the American Coalition for Ocean Protection. That's the kind of the parent group of, of this uh, coalition. We created the Ocean Defense, uh, Ocean Environment Legal Defense Fund. So uh, oceanlegaldefense.org, if you want to donate, we're raising money to prepare for, these, these lawsuits are going to be very expensive, so send some donations in, we can use them. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. I can't emphasize enough how important the work that uh, David is doing, kudos, and also Sterling, and uh, on our staff, a guy named David Wojcik, who's really been calling attention to this. Um, good news on this. We, there are some 30, uh, maybe you mentioned, I didn't hear it, 30 uh, communities in New Jersey that are calling for an offshore moratorium. This is a nonpartisan issue, folks. We got people on both sides. Three, three congressmen want to start holding hearings on this particular issue, uh, it's making headway. Uh, it sounds kind of dramatic, but unless this, these lawsuits succeed, it probably will lead to the extinction of the right whale and uh, cause mass and, uh, destruction and all that. So, and, and also kind of infuriatingly, in this Boehm comments that we just put in, they were rushing through these wind turbines and deducting critical information for people to comment about the right whale. That should not hold up in court. They don't want to know, uh, the public to know, what these wind projects might impact, how they might impact the right whale, and they've hidden it from the public. Picture if an oil company did the same thing for offshore drilling. Never happen. Okay, our last speaker, Francis Menton. Okay. Uh, I did not have a, a, he scribbled down some stuff here, so hopefully I get it all right. I, I see you have a suspect education. Uh, we'll just blow over that. Uh, he has three, he's, he's a Yale undergraduate and, from Har and also a graduate of Harvard Law School. Well, okay, that aside, uh, <laughs> you also are a, um, uh, you put that to good use, being a lawyer for the petitioners in Czech versus EPA. For those of you who don't know it, that is a lawsuit designed to take on the endangerment finding, I believe, is that correct, on CO2. Uh, oh, is it? I didn't even see it. Yeah, I can read. No, I actually didn't see it. Um, you're the president uh, for the American Friends of the Global Warming Poli uh, Policy Foundation, and he runs a contrarian blog called the Manhattan Contrarian Blog. So without any further ado, Francis. And I also, I keep, I keep hearing people, uh, when they ask questions, say where they're from. And I haven't heard anyone say they're from Manhattan yet, so I think I'm the only person at this conference who actually lives <clears throat> on the island of Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> oh, we got another one? I, I thought you said you lived in Amityville, but maybe I... <laughs> um, well, other people who have, who have asked questions have asked, why, why aren't there more lawsuits? Why isn't anybody... Uh, doing anything about this, can't it be stopped in the courts? Well, there's, there are limits to what you can do in the courts, but some things can be stopped in the courts and some things can't, and uh, I am a, a lawyer for a group that is challenging the EPA's so-called endangerment finding in the courts. This endangerment finding is not a small thing. I, I don't know how many people here know that much about it, but um, I'm gonna start off by educating you on that. Uh, <clears throat> frankly, I can't think of anything more absurd and ridiculous than the idea that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at concentrations in the hundreds of parts per million is a danger to human health and welfare. It's completely ridiculous. Okay, here's the situation we're in. The federal government via the EPA has issued a determination that carbon dioxide is a danger to human health and welfare and that is called the endangerment finding, and the endangerment finding underlies 
the entire government regulatory program relating to climate change and President Biden and his all of government regulations from shutting down pipelines, from the, the 10 different regulatory initi initiatives in the EPA, there's the Department of Energy, there's FERC, the Federal Reserve, the SEC has gotten into the action with climate disclosures and more and more. There are many dozens. I, I think we've tried to make a count. It could be more than 100 different regulatory initiatives to suppress fossil fuels, all stemming out of this thing called the endangerment fine. How in hell did we ever get in this position? Um, so I'm going to give you some history. EPA and I guess other regulatory agencies have a process, a petition process, where if you think they're either regulating too much or too little, you can submit a petition to the agency and cr try to get them to either add or subtract the regulation by pointing out that what they're doing is not in accordance with the law. Uh, going back to the early 2000s, a group of blue states led by Massachusetts and New York petitioned the EPA to find, to, to regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant. And that uh, petition was initially denied by the EPA and the Bush administration, but it then worked its way through the courts and got to the Supreme Court in 2007. And the Supreme Court in 2007 uh, ruled that EPA must consider whether carbon dioxide is a pollutant and if it finds that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a danger to human health and welfare, then it may and indeed must regulate. So that decision called Massachusetts v. EPA came out in 2007. The Bush administration should have got right on it and found it wasn't a danger, but they didn't do it. And so they left office and when Biden came in, not Biden, Obama came in in 2009, they got right on it. Within a few months had proposed this endangerment finding and unlike the regulations that Sterling Burnett was talking about that didn't attract many comments, the proposed endangerment finding got multiple hundred thousand comments, including uh, multiple hundred thousand comments, including I'm sure many people at this conference put in comments, but of course those were overwhelmed by uh, 10 times as many comments from the other side. And on December 7th, 2009, a day which shall live in infamy, the, the Obama administration, EPA, adopted the endangerment finding and found that uh, carbon dioxide was a danger to human health and welfare. Um, how could they possibly have found that? Now, but my, my presentation is, I call slide light, but I have a couple of slides. And so the document is, with all its support and so forth, there's hundreds of pages, but it all boils down to basically one thing where they say, we find it, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are a danger to human welfare based on three lines of evidence. And this is the quote from the document. I hope it can be read from where you are. I tried to put it in big type. Uh, so there are three lines of evidence, says the EPA in 2009. The first line of evidence arises from the basic physical understanding of how greenhouse effect works. The second line of evidence arises from changes in global surface temperature. I've, I've uh, bolded the more important words. And the third line of evidence arises from the computer-based climate models. Three lines of evidence. That's how they know that carbon dioxide is a danger to human health and welfare. I think anybody here can see that two of the three lines of evidence are not actually evidence, right? Two of the three are the hypothesis rather than the evidence. The, the basic physical understanding and the computer-based models, those are the hypothesis. The only actual evidence that they rely upon is the surface temperature record. To, to show you how completely thin this whole thing is. Okay. Um, 
That is adopted in 2009, and during the eight years of Obama administration, the, the, uh, the case, the scientific case for carbon dioxide as a danger for human health and welfare, which started out as essentially nothing, only got worse and worse as more evidence came out, but nobody came forward to uh, attack this. There, there actually was an appeal from this that some friends of mine, including one of my co-counsel now, did it went to the DC circuit in 2011 and they slapped that down but uh, other from that nobody uh, tried to undo the endangerment finding until when Trump got elected uh, people including people I work with thought here's a, here's a chance Trump will take a look at this so uh, after Trump got elected we put together this group the concerned household electricity consumers council known as check otherwise known as six friends of mine. <laughs> we, we put together council, which is Harry McDougald and myself. Some of you may know Harry McDougald. And we have a scientific team led by a guy named Jim Wallace, who has a long career in uh, uh, basically major corporations doing forecasting, modeling, and, and research and development projects and statistical analysis. So he leads the science team, but some other people who are here are on the science team, including Tom Sheehan and um, Joe DeLeo, I think is not here. John Christie co-authored some of the papers that we rely on. So you may know some of those names. So when Trump came in, we put together this team. It's all entirely pro bono, and we put in a petition on the first day of the Trump administration, January 20, 2017. And uh, there it sat. <laughs> we thought the Trump EPA would get right on this, but they uh, didn't want to do it. They had, uh, they had other ideas of how they might approach the problem, which I don't, I don't want to say were necessarily stupid, but this uh, endangerment finding is a cancer in the government, and it's a cancer on the country. And, uh, and the Trump EPA was never really uh, willing to tackle it. During, during the Trump administration, we put in seven supplemental petitions. We kept putting out papers. We kept relying on new evidence. Nothing happened. And on the last day, the last day of the Trump administration, with a two-page perfunctory order, they denied our petition. And they probably had some theory. I, some grand strategy they were thinking of of what we might do, but uh, the Biden people came in and realized that two-page denial would never stand up. So the first thing they did was rescind that, and then they sat around for a year and a half, and in April of 2022, they denied our petition with a long 50 or so page word salad, a smoke screen <laughs> of gobbledygook, uh, so, and, and, and there we were. Now we're in the Biden administration where we're petitioning for reconsideration of the endangerment finding. Now are you really, so if you win this in court, what, what you're gonna get is an order to go back to uh, the, the EPA to have them reconsider it. Um, so that's an issue. On the other hand, this may take a while to get through the courts. So, it, it may be that this ultimately comes down when there's a Republican administration in office. So we decided to file a lawsuit uh, challenging the EPA's denial, which we did in uh, May of 2022. And that is in the DC circuit because these, this kind of case goes to the DC circuit. Uh, it doesn't have to go through a district court. And uh, and so that is proceeding. In fact, the briefing on that, on that, uh, on the case, it's all done by briefing. So there's no trial involved. The briefing was concluded just last week, and they set the oral argument for uh, April 14. So that's where it is. It's very much uh, active now. On what basis are we challenging this? You know, the science here is so flimsy, <laughs> and you get a, you get a very uh, limited amount of uh, words and amount of arguments that you can make. You don't, you don't get to say a lot of things. So we had to pick a few of the very best 
zingers, and there's all kinds of things that we could have said that we left out for lack of space, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, uh, the highlights of some of our most uh, important arguments. They're, they're, you would think they're almost irrefutable, but uh, we're in the DC circuit, so we don't necessarily know what's gonna happen. Um, the first one, you lo look at that, I still have it up. Uh, the second line of evidence, which is the only one which is evidence, actually, of the three, so you'd think that would be the key, the surface temperature record, the global surface temperature record. Well, if you've been to panels at this thing for the last day and a half, you know that that global surface temperature record is incomplete and corrupted and fabricated and faked and altered in a hundred different ways. Now, we don't have nearly the, the words to, um, to deal with that in these briefs, so we had to pick out one thing, and the thing that we particularly picked out is that the global surface temperature record, which exists from a little before 1900 up to the present, has essentially no data in it, no unfabricated data, for the southern hemisphere oceans all the way up to 2000. So that the southern hemisphere oceans are 80% uh, of the southern hemisphere, so 40% of the Earth's surface. Um, and it's for 80 plus percent of the time period in question. And the data, such as it is, in this record that is used to so-called prove anthropogenic global warming is infilled by algorithms into, uh, into the global surface temperature record. They have essentially no raw data. Well, that's a pretty good point. We could have made a lot of other points about the fake and fabricated and altered surface temperature record, but that's the main one we picked. The, ne the next thing, the, the, um, the basic physical understanding, I'm gonna see if I could advance this a slide. When they came out with this finding back in 2009, uh, when they talked about the basic physical understanding and then they wrote up what they mean, well, they talked about the greenhouse effect and how do we know there's a greenhouse effect? The famous thing is the tropical hotspot. And in fact, the endangerment finding came out in 2009. 2007 was when the IPCC's fourth assessment report came out. And the slide that I put up is, is the slide from the fourth assessment report of the IPCC that came out in 2007, and specifically the thing they relied upon when they talked about their basic physical understanding of the climate. Uh, the slide in the middle on the left is, is the slide that shows the greenhouse effect forcing. This is the IPC slide that the EPA specifically relied on, and they even said if this doesn't show up in the data, it is a major inconsistency. Well, we all know it did not show up in the data. So this entire line of evidence, the basic physical understanding, which is based on how the greenhouse effect works, which is illustrated by the hotspot, and this is their illustration, can't be found in the data. Okay, so that's, that's uh, a second thing uh, that we point out. Uh, I'll give you a couple more. A third thing we point out Three to four minutes. A, thir a third thing we, we point out, uh, one of the papers that was put together with Jim Wallace, who I mentioned as the lead office, uh, author, is a uh, structural econo econometric analysis of uh, causation and the question being addressed is uh, from, from the existing data, can you exclude the possibility that the, that the warming that has been observed might have been caused by factors other than human CO2 emissions, including oceanic, volcanic, and ocean current El Nino causes? And the conclusion of the paper 
is these research results clearly demonstrate that once the solar, volcanic, and ocean activity impacts on temperature data are accounted for, there is no record-setting warming to be concerned about. In fact, there is no natural factor adjusted warming at all. So that um, is a third point we make. And a fourth point we make, which you've also heard quite a bit about at this conference, is that is that all the extreme events which they rely on, it's not listed in their line of, lines of evidence, but they do talk about extreme events, and we cite considerable data for the proposition that uh, there, there, there is no unusual amount of extreme events. That's the right way to put it. We also, one final thing, in, the, in our last supplemental petition, which actually was submitted after the Biden administration began. We cited and got into the record the Happer von Weingarten paper uh, on, on the physics of absorption of uh, energy by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and why that means there's, it's unlikely that carbon dioxide would have a large effect on temperature. So we cited that, and the CO2 Coalition also submitted an amicus brief on our behalf, which was authored in part by Happer and also by uh, Professor Lindsay. Well, there we are. The, the uh, case is now submitted to the court. The briefing is complete. The, the, uh, the argument is April 14th. I'm happy to report that the EPA's response to our contentions is a as flimsy as the endangerment finding was to begin with. I would call it a smokescreen of verbi verbiage. <laughs> it's uh, really designed to cover over the fact that they have no answers on the actual science. Uh, they put a lot of their effort into trying to knock us out on technical issues like standing which it's actually the part of the brief that I wrote, but I won't, I won't uh, bore this audience with the technicalities of that unless somebody is interested in it. Uh, and they make arguments like we should have, these are arguments you, sh you had to make years ago, or maybe they're arguments you can't make yet because the evidence isn't complete. Um, so there's a lot of argument on their side on technicalities rather than science because they don't have much science. So with that, I will, I will stop. I, I just, I, I just re-emphasize this endangerment finding is, is the biggest cancer in our government. It is the basis for the whole idea that the government uh, can, without further legislation, wildly regulate all over the place to suppress fossil fuels. Thank you, Francis. That was excellent. Wish you Godspeed on that. Um, I was going to say that the uh, one failing, I think, uh, when Trump came in, he did so much right. I mean, he took on the WOTUS law and everything else, but he never tackled, you know, uh, this whole endangerment finding. Um, you know, I was hoping that Andy Wheeler would do it or Scott Pruitt would do it, but uh, it seemed to be something that, uh, unfortunately, now has kind of ingrained itself and will be Anything short of a court case, I don't know, as it will be overturned, so good luck on that. A request from Sterling Burnett to put up a picture. We're going to get questions in a second. Whoever's running the slide machine, he wants to put up a picture of some of these, I think, what, a dead right whale? Well, the last, yeah, the last two slides in my slideshow, real quick. Yeah. And at this point, we are turning it over to you all and for questioning. Uh, the microphone's here, and uh, go ahead and just hit this gentleman in the green. If, well, all right. Ladies first. Good afternoon, Ramey Johnson from Colorado. Your, your, um, what you've said is excellent. I'm sorry I came in late. I have just a couple of questions for the two last speakers. The gentleman that was speaking on whales. Um, this sounds kind of silly. But how do you count how many, how do you know for sure what the count is? Uh, there, 
the, the federal government and, and various nonprofits will check out, how, they'll do a count of how many whales there are. There's, <clears throat> the whales have identifying markers, and there's so few of them. If you look at their tails, you can usually see a picture pattern that uh, is unique to each whale. So right now, for example, the, the, the estimates are anywhere from there's 330 to 350 left, so it's not an exact number. But you can certainly tell that instead of 500 that were there in 2016, there's now a lot less. There's less. And in fact, a lot of them have names. You can actually go online and they, they've named a number of these whales. They have it that, that specific. Uh, j j just to add, I mean, just on our side of the argument, there are 10 organizations that revolve around the whale that have formed their own coalition and are on our side on this argument. Then there's other whale groups who are uh, now on the payroll of the developers and uh, are, are not getting involved. But all these groups go out and, and, and watch and report on the whales. Also, I do not like the wind turbines. However, is there any kind of middle ground where they could move them someplace else? Do they have to try and locate them right where they are? Can I, can I respond to that real quickly? Go ahead. You don't mind? Go ahead. So there are a variety of options. First off, I don't think we have to have wind turbines. Uh, if we had natural gas pipelines through there and they used natural gas. But even if you thought we needed wind or we need solar. We have something called the continental United States. They could put these things on land. They don't have to put them in endangered well habitat. Um, you know, there's, there's no good reason. They say, well, the wind speeds are more, winds are more regular out there. Well, yeah, and they used something like three to five times more materials and uh, they not just harm whales, but as, uh, Dave said they stir up uh, silt, they make it less productive for other sea life, they, less oxygen. It's not clear to me, and the cost is so much more. So it's not clear to me anything recommends putting offshore wind turbines out there. Thank you. Did you yes, have so a second just, question? We just to add to that, uh, U.S. Energy Information Agency does an estimate on the cost of various sources. Uh, Offshore wind is about four times as expensive as natural gas, solar, or onshore, onshore wind. In fact, the, the Maryland Public Service Commission had hired a uh, consultant who said, uh, all you're doing here is replacing onshore wind that would be you know, one quarter the price, but they ignored it. Okay, just one last uh, question, the last gentleman that spoke um, on the endangerment um, finding a number two, it was using the words indirect, suggest, and unusual. You can't measure those and those aren't quantifiable to begin with. I, that seems like a very odd thing for such a powerful statement. And, 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 and that's the only one of the three that actually is evidence. I mean, when you look at that, at that second one relating to the surface temperature record, it says that the surface temperature record compared to prior warmings suggests this one is unusual. Well, how about the exit from the last ice age? It, well, you can't it, it's, measure. It, it's bizarre. You can't measure unusual. Okay, also, we're going to have to let somebody one, else ask a patterns. question. I'm sorry. Uh, we got to, if you could try to limit it to one question moving forward. Okay. <laughs> he said just a question, but I do have to say I, I have a picture of Michael Schellenberger at the Manhattan Institute about a year and a half ago, so I'm a, I'm a bona fide part time Manhattan. <laughs> Be that as it may. Um, as my class president at Princeton, class 74, who is also the president of the Nantucket Princeton Club, there are a few honest, well-intentioned uh, liberals and Yaleys. Uh, tell me, are there any well-intentioned, honest environmental groups which have joined the ocean legal defense which needs contributions? Are there any environmental uh, organizations that have joined you? Uh, the, the, the 10, the 10, co uh, ten group coalition that I just met uh, a month ago 
are preparing their own lawsuits and they're raising their own funds. So that's a very positive thing. I, I, don't, I don't know if I mentioned, but our group, the, the members of it, the Concerned Household Electricity Consumers Council, the lawyers and the scientists, everybody is working for free, 100% for free. Nobody has gotten a dime and we have to pay the DC circuit filing fees on top of that. left of center? No. Uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll throw into that. In the petition process, there were 24 groups that joined the petition process back in 2017 when that started out. One of them was CEI. Uh, but however, nobody, nobody joined us in the, in the lawsuit, which, which was brought in 2022, except for one thing called the Fair Energy Foundation, and they said, oh, we can't pay for lawyers, so they're, they're using the same lawyers, namely I, me. I would, say, I would say from the left there are crickets, but actually they're not crickets because uh, I believe the Natural Resources Defense Council and a couple other oh. major environmental groups came out and said, there's no evidence that wind is harming whales. Well, you know, you've got to do a necropsy to find evidence, and they're not doing the necropsies. Uh, all we can say is 10 whales in two months... We don't know if it's ever happened before, and the only thing that's changed. Uh, so do the necropsies and then say there's no evidence. Um, but the 10 whale groups, they're specifically focused on whales. They're joining. I, I, yeah. I should mention in our lawsuit, there, I said there was an amicus brief for our side from the CO2 coalition. For the government, there's an amicus there's an amicus for the government, and there is are interveners for the government, and the environmental groups have intervened. So it's a group of environmentalists that include the EDF, the Appalachian Mountain Club, my favorite, the American Lung Association, as if carbon dioxide has something to do with the lungs. Yeah, and I will say... It's unbelievable. Are we gonna, oh, I'm sorry, did we... No, put, no. Okay, I was going to say there are a lot of leftist blogs that are attacking the groups that are saving the whales. I think it's a knee-jerk reaction that how dare they save the whales, they deny climate change. So you got a lot of that going on. All right, next question. Uh, Jason Hayes with the Mackinac Center. Question for Sterling related to the bees. Did pollination occur in North America prior to the 17th century? And you'll know why I'm asking this question, I'm almost sure. Uh, well, you, uh, I, 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 honestly, you'd be wrong. I, I don't know why you're asking that question. My suspicion is that wild bees were here long before uh, we ever had beehives and that they were doing the pollinating just fine during the colder, uh, during the, the, the little ice age that was going on. But historically, bees have been around for, uh, well, I don't know when a bee has evolved. I don't know how many uh millions of years they've been around, but my suspicion is many millions through many climate changes. Ah, the honeybees, the particular bees. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> and that's like, yeah, and Bill Balvord from Middleton, Wisconsin. My question is, we going to spell right whales beginning with an R or a W? It's an R. It's an R. Yeah. Let's hit some from the other side of the room, too, when you get a chance. Uh, just a comment about how the uh, whales communicate, which is involved very low frequencies. And uh, I want to explain a little bit how that happens. Imagine you got this big, tall wind tower, and you have a force on it equivalent to the weight of one or two or three school buses. There are variations in that simply because this, this turbine is turning, and it gets near the stand, and there's an interruption in it. So that introduces very low frequencies that travel forever uh, in, the, in the water. And I think that is a much better, much bigger consideration than the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh that you hear when you are uh, somewhere near a wind turbine. So. All right. <clears throat> I actually 
actually was going to ask a whale of a question, but after uh, <laughs> listening to you speak, I, I'm very interested in this. I'm, I'm a lawyer myself, and so my, uh, uh, I'm very interested in the evidence supporting the arguments. And I try to keep up with the litigation cases involving climate change. And I keep hoping and praying to see one where the actual science is going to go to trial in, in, in front of a jury where we have our scientists, they have their scientists, and posit the question, is global warming a, a catastrophic crisis that we have to be concerned about? After hearing you speak and the, and the fact that you're attacking the endangerment finding of the, uh, of the EPA, it, it, it sounds to me, and, and as far as you know, is this uh, as close of a case that we have to actually present the science in front of a judge? Unfortunately, it's in front of a judge based on the briefs in front of the jury. But it sounds like this is as close of a case that at least I'm aware of, we're actually raising the science and, and attacking the evidence and, and saying correlation, you know, is not causation or, or whatever. And then the second part is, what is the specific question that the judge is going to decide? Because if it is standing, obviously that's not science, but what is the scientific question that you want the judge to ask or, or to answer in this case? <clears throat> so, um, there's only certain things you can sue for in this world. You can't just uh, sue anybody to say, okay, I want a judge to have a climate change trial. Right? You, have to, you have to have a cause of action and a remedy that you're looking for. So, so I said at the beginning of my talk, what our, what, so we have a, a basis for getting into court, which we have is we have a petition that we made to the EPA which says that they are violating the law by, by going beyond the, their authority to regulate. And, and um, they denied the petition, which is a final agency action, and you're allowed to challenge a final agency action in the DC circuit. So it's, it's purely a matter of law. We don't get to prove facts, but we have created a scientific record. So the science is very much at issue. And the issue is whether the EPA violated the law. Well, the law, it, it, so, and if they violated the law, the D.C. Circuit can send it back to them for reconsideration. It's not, the D.C. Circuit is not going to rule for us that the science is, is fake. The D.C. Circuit, at best, will only send it back to the EPA for reconsideration. Uh, but at, yes, the science is an issue, and yes, it goes to the D.C. Circuit. The incredible thing is these are very, very, very smart people there on the D.C. Circuit. Um, I believe that four of 13 are conservatives and nine of 13 are uh, liberals. And you can, it's a very simple mathematical calculation to figure out our chance of getting two out of three conservatives, which is not high. The chance of actually convincing one of the liberals based on scientific arguments, no matter how fake, I wouldn't say is very great because for, for, I think I've seen this quote multiple times here at the conference. You, you can't convince somebody that they're wrong. Now, we'll convince them that they're wrong when the blackouts start happening, then they'll be convinced. All right, uh, we are allowed to go late. This will have to be the last question because we started a little late. Oh, what did you say, Marl? Yeah, uh, Toby Mack with the EIA. On the, procedurally on this, uh, on this uh, proceeding, if you are ruled against at the uh, circuit court, will you go to the Supreme Court where you apply for cert. And I, I'm assuming that the cutoff for amicus briefs is passed, but uh, will you be looking for allies when you take it to the next level if you should lose at the DC circuit level? Yes, so the cutoff for uh, amicus briefs in the DC circuit has passed. And in addition to that, the DC circuit is extremely restrictive about accepting amicus briefs and they basically required everybody who wanted to join an amicus to combine into one. So we have very, but, but we're very grateful for the support of the CO2 coalition. Uh, it, and yes, absolutely the plan is if we, I mean, I'll talk about the real plan. The real plan is if we lose in the DC circuit, uh, we will go to the Supreme Court uh, and get a decision in time for a Republican administration to be in office. Now. We'll see if all that can work out. That's kind of you know, drawing an inside straight, but that is, 
that is uh, kind of the plan, and the, the, the Supreme Court in general has unlimited amicus, so you, so you could see 50 for each side. All right, well, thank you. That can, no, we, I'm. I'm the only reporter in the room. <laughs> All right, we will let the reporter give one question. The shipping fell along both the east and the west coast during the pandemic. I didn't. Say, I said it hasn't recovered fully from uh, well shipping agencies that say we don't have as much uh, ships coming into our ports. Well, we will have to uh, take this <laughs> afterward and have you have both compare that. statistics as to which it is. We know there has been a shipping crisis in, uh, in uh, recent times, but uh, we will let you two take, take that, uh, you know, discuss that afterward. In the meantime, let's give it up for our panelists. Good afternoon, late afternoon, everybody. So uh, here we are at the last session of a fantastic conference. I'm happy for everybody that stayed here. We got some people here. So welcome to our session. Um, we're shifting our focus from climate to man the man-made energy crisis. And as you can see from the gentleman on the screen, it's Jim Peacock. He's the chairman of our group, the Right Climate Stuff. He's not able to be here, so I'm Marty Cornell. I'm vice chairman, and I'm kind of filling in for him this afternoon. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with our group, we started as by engineers and scientists of the Apollo era NASA group. Um, we began a decade ago curious about what science says about the impact of industrial CO2 and in warming the earth. What we learned is that mother nature is controlling the climate CO2 emissions or not. And we also learned that more CO2 is definitely beneficial to Mother Nature's work. It became apparent that the attack on fossil fuels had little to do with climate science. The transition to low energy dense wind and solar reflects a different agenda. So our focus has shifted to the impact of this transition the well-being of humanity. What we learned, for one, is that wind and solar are not free, nor are they green. When the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you got to have backup energy ready. There are many claims that wind and solar energy generation now yields a lower cost than even combined cycle natural gas energy generation. These claims are frequently based on deeply flawed apples to orange, levelized cost of energy calculations. When system costs are included, as exemplified by this comparison, done by for the Center of American Experiment, for the mandated Virginia Clean Economy Act, those claims are shown to be highly flawed. And this, of course, translates into an exorbitant increase in the cost of energy for Virginia industry and, as shown here, for Virginia households. Our talks today will aim at to shine light on such penalties. This afternoon, our team will be focused on four aspects of this transition. Our first span, uh, speaker is Tom Mosier, a retired NASA executive, Texas rancher, and county commissioner who will address climate change truth and the path forward. But wait, there's more. Oh, there's more. <laughs> I will follow with a dose of realism of just one aspect of this rush to net zero. That is the challenge to supply enough critical materials for this task. When I retired in 2003, I became a student of climate curious about what the fuss was all about. 
So I joined the Right Climate Stuff group in 2012. Greg Goodnight. Hello. There we go. Greg Goodnight will inject another dose of realism using real-world experience of Texas' move toward a grid instability by sacrificing dispatchable coal and natural gas generation for weather-dependent wind and solar. Greg is a native Texan, a retired engineer residing in Pearland, Texas. Since retirement in 2017, his focus has been on the public policy implications of the transition to the green energy. And we will end with <laughs> Bob Bauman uh, with a vision of next generation nuclear power, which will be the ultimate way to recover from the impending disaster of wealth destroying wind, solar, and biofuel initiatives. Bob is a mechanical engineer, entrepreneur, inventor, and founder and owner of Trusted Systems Incorporated. He is a congressional su subject matter expert on nuclear energy and has been an early member of the TRS since 2012. These presentations, along with our position papers and climate science essays, can be accessed on our website, therightclimatestuff.com. And a final comment, we'll be pleased to answer your questions after Bob's talk. Thank you very much. Turn it over to you now, Tom. Thank you, Marty. Uh, this has been a, a great forum, a great conference for an exchange of scientific, scientific information amongst a lot of us. Um, however, we have a problem, okay? We're not effectively communicating the truth about climate change. That's a problem. The general public does not understand the detrimental Im impact of artificially reducing CO2, and the political conservatives do not realize that this is a hoax, and they will not touch that third rail. So let's solve this problem beginning today. So why is an engineer, a mechanical engineer, talking about this? Uh, we trust in the laws of physics, and we verify all assumptions. Let me use this slide to, to demonstrate where I've been in my career, okay? All the way from Project Mercury, all the way to the space station, and Apollo and space shuttle in between. The one thing we learned in all these programs is that we believe in the laws of physics, we use the laws of physics, and we verify our analysis with tests and, and demonstrations. We've, we've done this religiously, and as Marty said, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. So with, with this kind of background and this kind of rigor, then some years ago, we started the, uh, uh, the, the climate change and issues and formed the right climate stuff. Global warming is something I became very interested in in the 1980s because it was an issue that was everyone was talking about. The NASA chief scientist, I asked in Washington, D.C., Dr. Lynn Fisk, what was this thing about global warming and it, what was causing it? He said, it's a hoax, and he said, let me show you, Tom. So he showed me ice core data from the Arctic, which showed back hundreds of thousands of years, okay, of why that was a hoax. Then later on, a few years later, I met Leighton Stewart, okay? Leighton Stewart is the author of Fire, Ice, and Paradise. It showed it's a hoax. So with that, we formed the right climate stuff in 2011. So over the, the years that that organization's been in existence, it consists of chemists, engineers, astrophysics, and a lot of other geologists and meteorologists and PhDs. The thing that is, we are all former NASA people. We're not uh, uh, beholding to the NASA administrator. As a matter of fact, many of you have met or did meet uh, the recently deceased Walt Cunningham, 
Apollo 7 engineer. He and I wrote a letter to the NASA administrator in 2012, signed by 49 former NASA people, saying they are discrediting NASA with the, all the stuff that they had on climate change. We didn't believe it. None of us work for the big oil companies. We've got reputations we're protecting, and we're non-political. So this is a tribute to some of the early members of the right climate stuff. Leighton Stewart on the left, Walt Cunningham, as I mentioned, Tom Weismeller, and, and Dr. Harold Warren. These were all discussed last night and, and shown their, their contributed, what they did to contribute to the, um, the right climate stuff and to ICC. So here I am, I've in, after I've been, uh, we established the right climate stuff, I've taken it upon myself to talk to the public as much as I can. So I've talked to various organizations in Texas and New Mexico. I've talked to about a thousand people at these things. The most, most people are skeptical uh, of the alarm message that's been delivered. And during these talks, they've understood and reinforced their position. Once they have understood the truth and understood it, then they can see why that they, uh, their, their basic gut feel was correct. There have been very few people that have challenged the facts that I've presented. As a matter of fact, no one in the audience of a thousand plus people have ever challenged it. Um, I've also written editorials for the paper and I've had one person challenge that, okay? So there's, there's many new messengers of the truth now and they're armed with copies of the presentation. I'm gonna go through that presentation real quickly, not to, to, to convince you, but to show you the type of message that I've delivered and it's gone over very well. This was a typical response that I had from one of the uh, people in the audience. He's a mechanical chemical engineer. He said he'd already been, always been suspicious, but the, showing the facts let him know that it was not being caused by humans. So today, I'm preaching to the choir. The problem is the choir is not singing loud enough with a simple verse. So Christopher Monkton, I don't believe is in the audience, but he was gonna try and be here. Uh, this is something that he said, I'm gonna quote it. How then are those uh, of us with a scientific interest in the objective truth going to make ourselves heard given the relentless propaganda? One answer is it will be necessary for us to refine and simplify our scientific and economic arguments to the point where ordinary people as possible, as, as possible can both hear and behold and understand our arguments. I totally subscribe to what he said, and that's what I'm saying in different words. The most important bodies in our universe are the sun and the earth. The most important things on the earth are humans, animals, and plants, as we've seen over the last couple of days. Humans flourishing requires reliable, cost-effective energy. So that means we need to have fossil fuels. Demonizing carbon dioxide impoverishes humanity, has no impact on the climate, negatively impacts the economy, threatens our national defense, reduces plant production, and there is not a climate crisis. So here's the message I've delivered. Again, I'm not preaching to you. I'm just going to use this as an example, which I hope a lot of you can help spread. And at the end of this thing, I'll, I'll propose a plan by with which to get it to 100 million people in the United States. So the truth about climate change is there are seven things, and I'm going to go through each one of these seven separately. Okay. Global temperatures and carbon dioxide levels are in cycles, okay? And, oops, this is not going right. There it is. That's what I show the people when I do this, okay? Over 600 million years, you can see the carbon dioxide and the temperature changes. I'm gonna go through these very quick because you've all seen them in other presentations. This is another thing just looking at 800,000 years, okay? Antarctic correlation of CO2, or Antarctic, Antarctic, I should say, core data looking at 
CO2, and temperatures. They correlate. There's 400,000 years. Temperature peaks, it's cyclical, okay? Again, demonstrating that. This is looking at the last 2,000 years. The important thing here is we're coming out of the Little Ice Age. That's good. Um, so now that we'll look at the thing, that the next, as again, I make seven points to all these audiences. The next one is temperature changes are caused primarily by the sun. There's, there are the elements that do it. The sun's heat, and it's captured somewhat by water vapor and carbon dioxide. There's a lot of other things that contribute, as you can see on this chart, causing global temperature to increase. This is the thing that I think explains most of it. The energy from the sun comes in, it gets absorbed, and it gets reflected on the left side. On the right side, that's what's radiating out from the Earth, and some of it is captured by the cloud formation and, and greenhouse gases. So the energy from the sun is because of activities on the sun, proximity to the Earth, and this is best shown by this. The Earth is rotating about the sun. It's an elliptical orbit that's oblique, that ellipse. The Earth is rotating about its axis and precessing. All those mean the radiant energy from the sun normal to the Earth is changing all the time. So, Mother Nature is in control, not humans. So here's a correlation of what it looks like with the sun activity on the left, the temperature of the sun, I mean the temperature of the earth is well correlated. If you look at the temperature of the earth, on the earth, global temperature and carbon dioxide, it's not correlated. The amount of human produced carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is extremely slow, low. That's my fourth message. So here it is, here's the big thing. Here's looking at water vapor, which is 95% carbon, carbon dioxide, which is 3.5%, but look at that percentage by man. It's, it's a tenth of a percent of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, okay? Here's a pictorial showing 10,000 dots represent the atmosphere around the Earth. In the lower right-hand corner is that produced by humans. That's 12 dots, not very much. Mount Pinatubo spewed, spewed out more greenhouse gases than all human race presented, produced in all years. Now, in all due respect to, to Will Hepper, okay, greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide does have an effect more so than some of the other greenhouse gases. 97% of the scientists' consensus says that humans are causing it. Let's look at that data. Okay, there's the IPCC model that's showing, uh, going to the upper right, solar activity is going down to the left, and look what's happening in measured data. That doesn't correlate. IPCC is wrong. Al Gore said the ocean, ocean is boiling because equivalent 600,000 uh, atomic bombs per day, equivalent size of Hiroshima, and the ocean's boiling. I don't think so, Al. Look at the correlation with what climate models say and what's really happening. So the other thing is, the scientists said, global cooling, we're going to go into an ice age, and we would be in that by the year 2000. They're wrong. 97% of the scientists, by one estimation in 2013, showed that if they inferred anything about humans causing it, that's what they said is 97%, with another group looked at that, only three-tenths of 1% said that they actually said it. So scientists were wrong again. So weather extremes are not increasing. Let's look at the data there. Okay, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, wildfires. There are the major hurricanes at the bottom of that. It's staying flat essentially. And all hurricanes over the earth is at the top graph showing that they're staying about flat. Look at tornadoes. They're decreasing. Look at the frequency of floods, upper left-hand corner. It's, it peaked again about the early 2000s, and it's coming down. Look at the, the drought index and what's happening there. It's staying flat. Carbon dioxide is not doing that. Uh, the acres burned. It's coming down. So with that, 
CO2 is safe and is, is not a pollutant. There's a demonstration how trees can grow by 70%, doubling the amount of carbon dioxide. Looking at some of the other effects of doubling carbon dioxide, of all the things of grains, vegetables, trees, and fruits, they're up by 40% by just doubling the carbon dioxide. So here's what's happening with people, okay? Uh, naval, uh, sailors on submarines can live up to, with 8,000 parts per million. Don't forget, we're living, we're breathing about a little over 400,000 parts per million here. Uh, they can stay that long for 90 days. NASA lets uh, astronauts stay in the space station, 5,000 parts per million for three years. So all that is, I just repeated, I'm going to skip through that. So there's not a climate crisis. Carbon dioxide is good. The word, world needs reliable, cost-effective energy. Our message is not being delivered effectively. So who, who is objecting to that? Progressives, because they want one world society. Foreign countries, they want financial aid. Wall Street wants billions of dollars in commission. Greenhouse industries, thousand dollars in profit, billions in profit, et cetera, et cetera. So the alarmists have the money and large microphones. We have the truth. So let's begin today by looking at what we can do with that premise, okay? Let's establish a strategic plan. All strategic plans have mission, goals, and actions. Our mission ought to be, this is my suggestion, the U.S. should be the world leader in independent hydrocarbon production by 2026. That's after 2024. Educate, the goal is to accomplish that mission, educate the public. Educate those with letting them know there's not a climate crisis, carbon dioxide is good and not a pollutant, cost-effective, reliable hydrocarbons are necessary for humans, animals, and plants to flourish. And we need to elect advocates for this, believe in this, by 2024. So what are the actions, okay? We need to create a national campaign, this big. We need to communicate this to 100,000 people. I've communicated it to 1,000 individually. I don't know how many of you have spoken to end of groups, but we need to do that. But that's not gonna be enough. We need to have a nationally recognized credible spokesman or something that can deliver the message. And here's the biggie. We need to secure financial resources to do that. I think we probably need $50 million to do this over a short period of time. We need to flood the airways. We need to flood Fox News and CNN and some of the others with about five messages every single day, six days a week between now and 2024. That's going to cost a lot of millions of dollars. We need to support the national and state candidates who believe as we do, okay? So we're not going to have the people, since this is the end of this conference, do this and establish and brainstorm a, a, a campaign strategy here. But I'm going to suggest that CFAX, CO2 correlation, the, the Heartland Institute, and others put together a small group of people that lay out a plan to do that. That's been discussed by a lot of people. You heard the senator talk about it today. You heard the lady congressman congressperson, excuse me, uh, say the same thing. So the one thing that I will leave you with, let's roll before it's too late. So thank you. I look forward to your questions at the end of this. And our next speaker is Marty Carnell. Okay, there we go. By now, um, I'm sure you've heard several different speakers at this conference take umbrage with the Net Zero Initiative, and I will continue that objection with a look at the disconnect between the demand for materials to build Net Zero infrastructure and the uncertainty of supply of those materials. Now, in truth, I seriously thought about titling a talk for the hunt for the unobtainium. 
Net zero is simply a determined initiative to restrict emissions of industrial CO2 and methane to the amount removed from the atmosphere. Quite simply, it's a ban on fossil fuels. The reason is also simple, the unfounded belief that this will prevent a catastrophic impact of warming from the end of the Little Ice Age to the year 2100. The original target was a limit to plus 2 degrees C, but the goalposts were moved to 1.5 degrees C to satisfy the political demands of island nations. But since the Earth has already warmed 1.1 degrees C during this defined period, with highly beneficial effects to the biosphere and human flourishing, one must believe that the catastrophic part will come after the next four-tenths of a degree C warming, which, with business as usual, will occur within about the next 25 years. And yet, it ain't warming like it's supposed to. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this figure, or variations of it from John Christie of the University of Alabama, Huntsville, which shows the average of these models projects a warming of two and a half times reality. Quite simply, the climate crisis exists only in models, not in the real world. Yet the political class throws money at the non-existent climate crisis to pay for windmills and solar farms that modeling shows will have no impact on global temperatures from the baseline without the act. Full implementation of net zero fares a little better. Brent Bennett of the Texas Public Policy Foundation ran the numbers through the magic model used by the US government and others uh, and shows that a 100% renewable grid would lower the world's temperature by an astounding less than one-tenth of a degree centigrade and that converting all cars and electric propulsion as part of the banning of all fossil fuels would further lower global temperature by about the same amount, saving the world from a rise of two-tenths of a degree centigrade over the 50 years from 2050 to 2100. So if it's not about climate change, what is it about? Brian Deasy, director of the White House National Economic Council, who came via BlackRock, does not pull punches and tells us straight out. This is the future about the, this is about the future of the liberal world order. Of course, the liberal world order requires ignoring consequences, intentional or unintentional, especially as to its devastating effect on lower income households and underdeveloped economies. Abundant, low cost, reliable energy from fossil fuels has been a required condition that has dramatically reduced impoverished people around the globe. Uh, yet, we are on the verge of reversing this downward trend by the imposition of decarbonization. Gore, Kerry, and others of the elites of the New World Order dismiss the havoc they are imposing on the poor. So how is the world to be saved from this additional four-tenths of a degree centigrade catastrophic impact? The path to net zero is clearly defined by this 2021 publication by the IEA. Associated documents provide further detail. The path is, uh, is the de decarbonation of all facets of society, the generation of electricity, industry, transportation, and building. And the basis of this decarbonization is the transformation of the electrical grid away from coal and natural gas to weather dependent wind and solar farms with supporting roles from biofuels and hydropower generation. The 221 Princeton Net Zero Emissions Report further details the road to net zero in the United States. Here is their depiction of the current contiguous 48 states with two-tenths of a terawatt of wind and solar generation capacity. Wind farms are the blue dots, scattered mostly in the central slice of the United States. The orange dots of solar farms are hard to discern. The gray areas are population centers. 
By 2050, the landscape dramatically changes. With over 7.2% of the land in the lower 48 covered with wind farms, solar farms, and new transmission lines to provide an additional two terawatts of capacity to the electrical grid. And all of this for $5 trillion. And since the combined output of these farms will be about 30% of nameplate capacity, that's $5 trillion for only six-tenths of a terawatt of actual generation. Such a deal. Lower power density wind and solar uh, farms require from about seven to 15 times of more of critical minerals than that needed for the same nate plate capacity of a natural gas power plant. This demand on materials shown here does not include steel, concrete, or aluminum. Very little of these critical materials are now or likely to be in the next 27 years sourced from the United States. Here I rearrange that same chart to a vertical orientation so that I can better illustrate the fact that weather-dependent wind and solar farms deliver only a fraction of their nameplate capacity. Such the situation looks even worse when the 34% capacity factor of wind farms and the 24.4% capacity factor for solar farms are considered. But there's even more to this that I don't show. A natural gas plant will li last about three times that of a typical solar farm or wind farm. So you can multiply those numbers for wind and solar by about three. Let's translate, translate this using the 2.2 terawatts of installed capacity of wind and solar farms required to meet the Biden administration's 2050 net zero target. The Princeton study considers the wind and solar capacities in 2050 to be 1.5 terawatts of solar, 1.5 terawatts of onshore wind, and 0.2 terawatts of offshore wind. This translates into over 28 million tons of critical materials just for the United States, very little of which is mined or processed domestically. But it's not just mineral materials, but also the fossil fuel consumed by the equipment needed to mine, move, and process the ores to build net zero wind, solar, and transmission infrastructures. This part of the green energy is mostly conveniently ignored by the media. It is the hope of true believers that all fossil fuels must be eliminated from the grid. But it is also recognized that the all-important reliability requirement must be retained during and after the transition. Several studies have concluded that around 250 million megawatt hours of stored power will be required to bridge severe wind drought and low solar production events across the United States. That's between two and three weeks. Battery electron storage farms are proposed as the most viable non-hydrocarbon option for providing on-demand dispatchable power when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't sufficiently shine. It is also concluded that the cost of Gridsdale backup would be several multiples of the 23 trillion US GDP. For the globe, that number is even more astounding. Alex Epstein calculates that powering the world with solar panels using Tesla megapacks as backup would require an investment of $590 trillion. Let's shift from electricity generation to electric vehicles, each containing a battery pack of about 1,000 pounds. The material needed for one single EV battery is about 10 tons of lithium brine uh, to get 30 pounds of, of lithium, 30 tons of ore to get 60 pounds of cobalt, five tons for the 130 pounds of nickel, about one ton for, of ore uh, for about 190 pounds of graphite, and six ton, tons for 60 pounds of copper. Add to this about 175 tons of overburden that must be removed using 
fossil fuel vehicles, of course. For an all EV fleet circa 2030, you can multiply this by 100 million per year. So what could possibly go wrong? Most obvious is that the, over, the developing world led by China and India is not cooperating with decarbonization. Over 277 gigawatts of new coal power capacity has recently been added or is under construction around the world. This added power capacity creates added global demand for coal for at least the multi-decade life of the new coal-fired power plants. The war in Ukraine has injected a dose of energy reality into Western Europe. Others at this conference have discussed this situation, so I won't go into it here, but it is a wrench in the net zero machinery. And yet, there's the geopolitical issue of the supply chain for key materials. The IEA has a whole list of vulnerabilities of critical materials for net zero, beginning with the high geographical concentration of production. It's noteworthy that the United States plays a minor role in the beginning part of the supply chain for these critical materials. It's also evident that China dominates the processing flow for these same materials critical for a transition to net zero. Next on the IEA list addresses the long time from a mineral's discovery to its first shovelful of production. In high regulatory environments such as the United States, 16 years is quite optimistic. The rest of the IE list includes designing re resource uh, quality, growing scrutiny of environmental and social performance, higher exposure to, to climate risks, security of mineral su supply, and recycling, for example, of spent batteries. The list is surprisingly does not include not in my backyard. We'll look at a couple examples of this public pushback. Minnesota is no stranger to mining with its vast open pit mining of iron ore. It's also rich in critical minerals needed for net zero, per the USGS having 88% of US and cobalt reserves. In 2019, Twin Metals began the permitting process for underground extraction of copper and nickel ores, which also contain precious metals and cobalt. Their plan would minimize environmental impact. But the Biden administration just nixed the plan a couple of weeks ago to, in their words, protect the nearby Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. So there we have just another example of conflicting interest within our federal bureaucracy. The cracks in blatant censoring are beginning to widen, thanks in a large part to Elon Musk. The opportunity to dramatically increase the public's IQ on things climate and energy is before us. The next slide highlights an example of this opportunity. To quote Mark Mills, Volkswagen calculates that a diesel car emits less CO2 than an EV for the first 70,000 miles it is driven. Fabricating one EV battery entails the mining of 250 tons of rock to secure the minerals needed. The energy used in the mining nickel system, oil, coal, and natural gas, means that one EV has a carbon equivalent to emitting between 8 and 20 tons of CO2 before its first mile driven. VW's calculation is based on the lower end of this range. The actual depth size depends on where the minerals come from. Moreover, battery carbon debt will be greater in the future because mineral ore grades are decreasing, requiring mining of more rock, which means using more energy. Realistic scenarios could lead to an EV emitting more total CO2 than conventional cars during their lifetime. The bottom line is that green energy isn't carbon free, and there's no such thing as a zero emission vehicle. The public is becoming more aware of environmental conflicts, such as the green versus green phenomena, as exemplified by the Twin Metals Mine. 
Here's another such conflict. That 7.2% of the lower 48 land area that is slated to be covered with wind and solar farms just happens to predominantly overlay the central flyway of North America for migrating birds and bats. Among birders, the kill from wind blenders is well known. Any individual responsible for killing a raptor would be heavily fined, but a wind farm owner is essentially given a pass. And the proposed wind farms offshore of the U.S. East Coast would be in the path of the highly endangered North Atlantic right whale, with an estimated population of less than 350 individuals. At least 15 large whales have been washed up on the East Coast beaches since the 1st of December, adding to a trend including a die-off of 174 humpback whales that began seven years ago, coincidentally when the offshore surveying of wind farm locations began. This humpback apparently died from a boat strike, and to be sure, correlation is not causation. But many find the wind industry guilty until proven innocent. Robert Bryce shows the rural bashlack against wind farms. This initiative is causing some politicians, at least, to begin to factor in the wishes of their voter constituents when making policy decisions. Bryce has similarly summed up the pushback on solar farms in the United States. This objection is increasing. One would think that the sheer cost of net zero would cause a pause in Congress. But then, to paraphrase Everett Dirksen, a trillion here, a trillion there, and soon we're talking about real money. Recall that the $28 trillion from completely decarbing the U.S. grid comes from weather-dependent wind and solar farms that would require battery backup. Per McKinsey, the goal bill for net zero emissions just for the physical assets would be north of $270 trillion over the next 27 years. And perhaps most importantly, the Supreme Court has thrown a large wrench into the executive branch usurpation of congressional prerogative. We must hope that forthcoming unambiguous instruction reflects both climate and energy reality, and that Congress wakes up to the fact that $28 trillion for saving a couple tenths of a degree of warming is not a good return on investment for the American people. For reality is required for continued human flourishing, and it is hoped that the benefit of fossil fuels, which provide abundant, reliable, and affordable energy that raises people out of abject poverty, will someday soon be widely acknowledged. I will end with a quote from Edward Ring of the California Policy Center. What could work, however, would be to challenge the, the premise of the climate alarmist movement, learn facts, evaluate arguments of contrarian experts, and make up your own mind. If you no longer believe we actually face a climate emergency, say so, without reservations, in every venue, and every person and institution you can possibly influence." Unquote. This is the reason why I'm here today. Thank you very much. And I'm going to now turn this over to Greg Goodman. I hope they have, I hope they bring this up. Do I have okay. Yeah, bring it up. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, my topic today is uh, about the uh, ERCOT winter storms, which have been uh, widely uh, publicize what happened, and they're actually sort of a test case for uh, America. I'm going to uh, roar through this pretty quickly, so if, if I don't make a point very clearly, please uh, stop me. The other thing I will say, there have been many reports about the first storm, URI. Uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation put an excellent report in August of last year, so I would refer you to that. Uh, the winter storms provide lessons for Texas, and uh, specifically these uh, entail integration of renewables into the grid, which we'll talk about. The Uri storm, if you recall, was uh, before the last uh, conference, and I would refer you to our talk uh, during the last conference, in which we went in detail. But uh, we're going to have to skip over a lot of the detail for now for consideration of time. Since that time, we've had 
uh, winter storm Elliot, and we've learned, uh, compare and contrast these storms, we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned a lot on the intermittency of green energy, which uh, I don't think people really appreciate. Everybody assumes you can have a one-for-one -one replacement. That cannot happen. Uh, in Texas, we've gone through a, uh, we're in the middle actually of a market redesign effort where we're pricing, uh, trying to re uh, revise our pricing policy to encourage dispatchable energy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. My first talk was dispatchable power when you really need it, you really need it. This talk is uh, apples and oranges are not additive. Uh, key talk takeaways, the recent winter storms demonstrate weather dependent vulnerability of the ERCOT grid and will, as uh, all grids uh, add renewables, uh, they'll have more vulnerability. Wind droughts, which uh, people don't talk about, are very common uh, globally and we'll, we'll uh, look at uh, what happened during URI and look at what happened around the, the world. Power crossed actually increased renewables. This goes contrary to what's uh, been publicly said by the renewable folks. I'll show you some data that uh, says that's not quite true. This is a fact. Since 2007, the pricing policy for the ERCOT system in Texas has, has provided no new dispatchable power, no gas, no coal, no new nuclear, all wind and solar, and that has implications. Uh, this is the ERCOT uh, system. It's about 90% of the geographic area of Texas, 26 million customers, 1,100 generating units, quite big. But what people don't realize is Texas also leads the nation in wind energy with over 13,700 uh, turbines, uh, 35 gigawatts of capacity, so very big on wind energy. It's a large independent power system and represents a national test case for integration of renewable power into a grid. Lessons on stability, pricing, policy, weather dependency, power costs, they're all obtained through studying uh, the ERCOT system, and I would particularly urge the people from Colorado to uh, take a look at uh, ERCOT. Uh, there, what happened during URI, uh, there was a frequency control uh, issue. Electrical grid frequency is a critical factor in, in grid stability. Loss of frequency control will result in power uh, damage to equipment for power providers, customers, transmission system and a, and a uh, parameter called spinning reserve, which is provided by coal and gas, is a critical element for frequency control. Renewable power, uh, uh, unfortunately, is non-synchronous and does not contribute to the so-called spinning reserve and thus does not significantly contribute to frequency control. And this was the uh, essence of what happened during URI. If you look at the left side of the graph, it's 60 hertz is what you try to maintain, normally ERCOT. Uh, through balancing supply and demand, controls it within a few thousand. What happened during URI is uh, power was lost. There wasn't enough dispatchable power. Wind power went down and we got into a period where we had four minutes of below 59.4 hertz. Uh, if we had had another five minutes, uh, we would have had automatic uh, interlocks kick in and uh, automatic load shedding. Uh, and below 59.4 uh, hertz for an additional five minutes could have triggered these automatic load shedding and resulted in a total grid meltdown with a black start, which sometimes requires months. As it is, there was a lot of, a lot of issues, a lot of pain and suffering, 250 deaths, 200 billion in economic uh, impact, but it could have been a lot, lot worse. Okay, recently we had Elliot. We seem to have these storms in, uh, on uh, holidays. This one happened about Christmas. <laughs> Uh, if you look at uh, the, the conditions, uh, one thing to note is it was not, Elliot was not as severe as uh, URI. They were, uh, the actual load was 60.4 gigawatts. Uh, the predicted load was 70, which is significantly uh, less than uh, URI. Elliot was a dry storm, we note. There was no really precipitation in all the areas, although it did get, it, it did get very cold, but uh, it was dry. And that will come up here in a few minutes. Now, what happened, the ERCOT response uh, to URI, how did the grid uh, survive? Well, there was no frequency issue, and the load got high enough, and there was enough supply uh, where you had actually excess of capacity of 2 to 3,000 megawatts, 2 to 3 gigawatts, but I will note the, the important number is the one that's circled there. Coal contributed 10 gigawatts, 10,000 megawatts, and in the current plan by the Biden administration is to shut down all coal power in the U.S. by 2030. If we would not have had that 10 gigawatts of coal power 
even a storm as weak as Elliot would have had a significant impact on the uh, ERCOT area. So since URI, uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of hearings, and a lot of legislative action. Did we fix the problem? Well, we didn't see the near disaster. Uh, there were, uh, ERCOT had a two-phase implementation program to fix the grid. They partially implemented phase one, which was weatherization and the fuel facility. Was the problem fixed? The answer is no. Uh, the, the lower severity was the saving factor. Phase two is the one that's currently in progress. This is the important one. Phase two includes repricing power so that it incentivizes the, the uh, capital that's required for dispatchable power, namely gas and uh, potentially coal. Okay, let's talk about wind and solar. While the intercommunal fuel cost is zero, there are no operational greenhouse uh, emissions, but as Marty mentioned, there are a lot of uh, CO2 that's generated when you put in the physical facilities. Uh, they're, it's, they're highly subsidized and thus create a market distortion and their hidden socialized costs we'll talk about. And from a minute to minute standpoint, you have to balance the grid. You cannot supply the power, the demand and the supply have to be uh, synchronous and, and tightly controlled. Wind and solar are weather dependent, they're highly variable in output, and as Marty said, the, the capacity factors are relatively low, comparing design capacity to actual delivered power. Uh, they're non-dispatchable. They decide when the power is available. You don't decide. You don't turn up the dial. Uh, they have low energy density sources. The wind is a low energy uh, source, a low energy density source. So is uh, solar. And again, they have a high initial material requirements compared to other forms of electrical generation. I think Bob's going to talk a little bit about that. They both require significant backup. When the wind doesn't blow, you got to back up your power. And they have uh, impact on birds, bats, insects, and now even whales for unbelievable. Uh, two important observations. Uh, we keep hearing about uh, insulation, wind, and solar as a replacement for dispatchable power. This is not true. I hear they shut down a coal plant in New York and they put in wind. That's, it's not a one-for-one one, uh, situation. In Europe, they found this out ahead of us. Idled coal and natural uh, uh, nuclear facility have been idled, but they have been since returned to service when they, when they found out that they just can't rely on the renewables. Wind power variability. Uh, if you look at the daily variability, this, uh, these are three days in August of, I think, 2021, where uh, on one day you start out with 15 uh, gigawatts of ERCOT uh, wind power in the, in the evening, and then it goes down to five. One, uh, the next one is 10 going down to two, and the next one is five going down to zero. So this is a 24-hour variability. The power that can be generated with wind turbines is proportional to the cube of the velocity. So if wind velocity goes up and down, you multiply that by the cube power, and you can see the variability is uh, accentuated. You cannot assure that adequate wind power is there by adding more turbines. You can't go from 13,000 turbines to a million turbines. If the wind's not blowing, it does not matter. This is an example of the seasonal variability of wind. It blows pretty good in the, in the spring, but by the doldrums in the fall and the, in the winter, it goes down. And since it's, uh, if the wind velocity goes in a half, the power you get out, it goes down to 12%. So 50% reduction wind velocity, 12%. Uh, so this is an example of the daily wind power output. If I'm in ERCOT in Tyler, Texas, I got to control, I got to balance the grid with this sort of variability. Now, uh, there's something called wind droughts, and you can see two minor wind droughts in uh, 2021, one in the middle of the uh, year and then other in the summer. This is when you have days of low wind velocity. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Wind droughts are global in nature. They're seen in all geographic regions. They're associated with stable high-pressure systems that happen in both summer and winter where there's little wind. URI saw a five-day prolonged wind period. You heard in an uh, earlier thing where wind, Epstein said wind got down to 1%. Wind capacity got down to 1% of the, of the nominal capacity, and that's true. It, it did happen. Uh, Germany saw a wind drought. We'll talk about UK saw a wind drought. 
in uh, 2021. Uh, this is what happened during URI. The yellow, uh, it, this is a map of North America. This is a barometric pressure anomaly where the yellow is a high pressure uh, anomaly. Uh, so if you focus in here, uh, the, the, the high pressure anomaly and low wind velocity went all the way up to Canada. It was a very stable front. It idled turbines, even winterized turbines, all the way up to Canada. Elliott also, remember this was a dry storm. They had very little icing, but there was very little wind power in specific time. The only saving grace, it was only a two-day storm versus a five-day storm. Uh, this is what happened in Elliott on uh, Christmas. If you look at the green curve, that's the wind curve. The power went down. How do you compensate that? You run up the gas. You can see coal here pushing out power, so is nuclear. But what has to happen in our system is gas has to balance wind. You've got to have dispatchable power to balance wind. Uh, this is the German wind drought I talked about. It was a two-week uh, period in, in, uh, starting in April 2022. The yellow is solar. The dark blue is uh, all, uh, offshore wind. The light blue is onshore wind. If you look at the dotted line, that's your normal average. So what you had is a deficit for two weeks of wind power. And wind averaged during this period three gigawatts, which was 5% of the nominal capacity. And normally you get about 24 gigawatts. They have about 60 gigawatts uh, capacity. So that's one drought. The same thing happened in the UK. We had about a one week outage in 2021 where gas had to compensate. This happens in Australia. You can have examples all around the world. What happens during the wind droughts? Uh, this is in UK, that uh, same period I talked about. They rely on natural gas for backup. What happened to the natural gas? The price spiked. They shut down uh, uh, industry at Teesside up in north of uh, Britain. Uh, sort of a mess. Uh, so the balance is becoming increasingly hard. We're putting more solar in. We're going from four gigawatts of solar to over 20. And in the middle of the day, you back out gas power. This is a so-called duck curve. Uh, uh, the observations. We have energy-only pricing in which we back out uh, solar, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you have a little bit of an outage when the sun goes down, and so you've got to back this up. This is a, 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 a three to five gigawatt shortage, but remember, when you have wind droughts, you're looking at 20 gigawatts, and it really gets bad when you start shutting down coal. We've uh, looked at pricing. There's a PCM uh, pricing proposal that addresses this end of the day outage, but it does not address, in my view, the uh, wind drought issue. Okay, so we're talking about socialized costs. I'm gonna run through this very quickly. Uh, what are the socialized costs? Wind does not have to pay its full load. Uh, for instance, the capital costs of backup power, uh, and the higher cost of transmission because they're, they generate the stuff in uh, West Texas and it go all the way to east, uh, to the east where the population is. Uh, less flexibility of timing. There are a lot of backup and uh, socialized cost. So the question is, is wind and solar competitive? Normally, people quote the uh, levelized cost is a benchmark they use, but the levelized cost unfortunately does not include all these socialized costs. So if you put it on apples to apples basis, you get more like the graph that Marty was showing. Uh, this is a good example. Uh, what this does is look at the per capita wind, uh, wind and solar capacity in Europe uh, versus, uh, versus cost. And, and, and the, the bottom line here is when you add more wind and solar and you include the socialized cost, the real average cost of power goes up. I've seen this sort of presentation, this sort of analysis in a lot of different areas. This is Mark Mills, and he, uh, he did this for Europe. So if wind and solar are so cheap, why do countries with the highest renewable penetrations have the highest power cost? Okay, lastly, uh, grid inertia. We talked about, about spending reserve. Uh, frequency has to be maintained. There was no mention and, no, and very little understanding of grid inertia, but this is, this is a problem. If you don't have uh, the inertial backup, you don't have frequency control. And what's happening in uh, ERCOT, we're adding more and more wind and solar. In fact, by 2026, we'll have 40% weather dependent uh, uh, power and 60% dispatchable. That's <laughs> sort of down from 100% dispatchable in 2008. So this is a reliability issue. Uh, I mentioned the, pro the politicians are trying to redesign the process to get more dispatchable power. Uh, they passed an SB3 bill, the Fix the Grid bill, which they're looking at changing the power 
pricing policy in order to incentivize dispatchable power. It gives broad, uh, this uh, bill gives broad authority to the Public Utilities Commission. And uh, it, like I said, phase one is done, but phase two is the hard part. It's the pricing policy. Every state, every entity is going to resolve this. You're trying to price apples and oranges, and it's really tough. Uh, okay, so. Uh, this is a, a busy chart right now. They're looking at five options. They, they uh, have a, a consultant that's recommended five uh, different pricing options. PCM is one they're focusing on. Uh, and I'll say in, in, uh, to conclude, the PCM option is one that people are focusing on. But the, but the, uh, the problem is, I th my, my personal opinion, it does a very good job addressing the end of the day three to five gigawatt shortage problem, but it does not do a very good job with the wind outages and the wind droughts. So with that, uh, I will thank you. I know I ran through this very quickly. I'll be happy to, to uh, during the Q&A, I can answer some or stay afterwards. But uh, my next, uh, our next speaker is Bob Bauman, who has an outstanding uh, presentation in the nuclear area. And I hope I haven't taken any of his time because it's a really good presentation. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess I have the dubious honor of being here, the person keeping you all from the bar. So <laughs> here we are. Um, I want to talk about the future. I want to talk about the future of nuclear energy specifically, consolidating a lot of information that you've heard over the last couple of days. But I want to present what I think is an interesting opportunity going forward of something we can start doing now. We talk about futures, but we have to put a stake in the ground at some point. And so I wanna take it kind of one small step at a time, but I wanna be able to look at exactly where, where we're gonna go forward. Now, here's where we've been. You have starting with windmills a long time ago, and now we have nuclear power. We have power that is reliable, clean, base load power that we can rely on. But the green folks want to start playing Don Quixote all over again, tilting at windmills. And so they just go backward, but they don't get anything that can actually work and we're gonna show you why. The, um, the point being that I want to uh, talk about thinking small. This is the small modular reactor designs that are being looked at today, and it will give you an idea of where the future can go. This is a slide I had last year same old song, you have nuclear power, you want world peace, you don't want reactors, it's ticking time bombs. But ticking time bombs are exactly what you get when you don't have electricity. So what do you end up with? A different tune. Now my German isn't all that great, but I think it's stop the price explosion for peace, uh, freedom and prosperity. And this was done in Germany just recently, and we've gone over. Wolfgang gave you an excellent uh, uh, view of what that was. And it's something that we want to, um, uh, to deflect from, from the standpoint that uh, when Germany closed down, they did open their reactors up. But as I just heard, they're only opening up until April. So it's not a permanent solution. And now they're having to go back to coal and nat natural gas. So what we want to do <clears throat> is we want to take a fresh look at nuclear, where we can have a realistic e expectation of what we can have going forward. So let's think small. Let's think fast. And let's think better. 
Now, I want to make the case for nu nuclear specifically. <clears throat> First thing is, where is the nuclear industry today? What's going on around the world? Secondly, I want to go into nuclear itself as compared to the other so sources. Now, I'll be taking a lot of data from what Marty just told you about wind and solar, but I'm going to tailor it and specifically dovetail it into the argument for nu nuclear. And then where do we go from here? And I have a proposal that I want to present to you, get your thoughts on it and input, but see where we can positively go in, into the future. Now, first country, and these are the guys that uh, have been doing the most in the last few years, and that's China. There we go. They want to dominate the nuclear in, in industry. They have been going after uh, light water reactors, thorium fueled reactors, high temperature gas reactors. In fact, they have the first commercial fast breeder helium cooled pebble bed reactor that is, uh, is in actual commercial use and operation. They also want to be self-sufficient. They want to provide all the fuel and components themselves. Second big player in this is France. 70% of their power comes from electricity, from nuclear, and they're the largest exporter to the rest of Europe. They've been bailing them out over the last year or two since the Ukraine war. And an interesting thing is that 17% of their power comes from recycled fuel. I'll be talking about that later. And they're now planning 14 new reactors over and above the 56 reactors they currently have in operation. The next one is Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. They uh, have been manufacturing their own reactors for a long time, even since uh, Chernobyl. But they're also an exporter and have been very, uh, Rosatom has been very dynamic in terms of marketing their nuclear technology. They also supply, or a major supplier, of fuel and components to the rest of the world. And this has created a real bottleneck because they've been cut off because of the san sanctions. They also have interesting small modular reactors that they've developed into floating power st stations that they put into the Arctic cities to use for winter power. And they also have made two icebreakers. They're going to make three more. But they have no interest in wind and solar. The next one, we'll go through several of these that are going around the world. I'll do this as quickly as I can. South Korea, 27% of their power, 33% uh, by, by 2030, and they are a major exporter of nuclear components as well but they have 25 reactors and have three pending. The next is the UK, 15% of their power out output comes from the nine reactors they have currently running. They have uh, canceled 33 already, but they're now looking at going into the small modular reactor arena with Rolls-Royce building 10 by 2035. The next is India. India has 22 reactors, they're relatively small, but uh, they plan on adding eight more by 2032. And they're pushing thorium because they have not had access to uranium because they were not a signer of the non-proliferation treaty. Now, next one is Ger Germany that we've already talked about. They do have the three reactors left open, but that's very short-lived. The wind and solar died, as you know, and now it's back to coal and gas. The last is Japan which, of course, had Fukushima. They have 33 re reactors right now. They have two more pending to open, and they have shuttered uh, 27, but they're planning on bringing those back online because they want to get back into nuclear in a big way uh, because they need to get their energy sources more off of fossil and uh, without wind and solar that they can depend on. They're now at 6%, they're going to 30%. And the last but not least is the US. 
which is still the big dog in the room. They have 93 reactors. But they only have two pending down at the Vogel site in Georgia. And these two have been, uh, it's taken 14 years to build them and $25 billion. Those are the only two in the last 30 years. So what has happened in the US? There has been a focus more supporting the aging reactor fleet. And this is quite important because the reactor fleet that they have uh, is something that provides 20% of our power. And they, they are aging and they have to be able to take, take care of them. The other important point is that they've had the opportunity where we were energy in, independent and market do, dominant, but they don't seem, uh, they're dismissing that. And that's terribly un, unfortunate. The next is the Department of Energy has several demonstration programs for small modular reactors, so there is some activity, but it is limited. And it's limited because of the fact that DOE has been, uh, they've been just holding their cards to their chest and not wanting to move forward. The N NRC has had a problem and the, um, the real issue is they, uh, well, nuclear is still not favored. And so that's a problem going forward. There are four reactor programs that have been used. One is with new scale with a light water reactor similar to the military reactors. The second one is uh, from Terra Power, and that's owned by Bill Gates. And that's a fast reactor, a fast breeder reactor that is sodium cooled and has molten salt storage. The third is from X Energy. That's a high temperature gas reactor, helium cooled with pebble bed fuel, very similar to the one that's operating, <clears throat> excuse me, in China. And the fourth is from GE that has got uh, a couple of programs going with a 300 megawatt a uh, smaller version of a boiling water reactor. They have one going into Clinch River, the other going into North Carolina. The problem, though, is funding. That's always been the problem. We have six billion uh, from 2021 funding that's being used to prop up ailing reactors, uh, which Diablo Canyon in California is one of them. And Diablo Canyon is uh, now gonna be remaining open because California just went to wind and solar and it hasn't worked. So they're bailing them out. The second one is with the in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. That's 34 billion, but it's all in production tax credits and that's to keep the older reactors going and more economically viable, but that pales in significance to the 350 billion that's going to wind and solar. So you can see how upside down things are and what uh, the priorities of the administration are. This fragmented effort has no cohesion to it. It's not a forward thinking energy policy and they're just sitting on their hands, certainly not like other, other countries. Point is why the hesitancy? I wanna talk briefly about fear mongering. That's still the ne nemesis for nuclear. There are unwarranted fears over radiation and waste. There have been no radiation deaths or injuries in America, certainly for 70 years, uh, except Chernobyl. There hasn't been any around the world, including Fukushima. 18,000 plus years of safe operation in 32 countries Waste is very well secured in cooling ponds and dry casks, but the point we're dealing with here is psychological. It's fear is what you don't know and you can't see. I think Alex talked a little bit about this last night. Perception becomes reality. So they ignore the history, they ignore the data, they ignore the science. And so what you get is they pick on the invisible boogeymen, radiation, what you can't see, so you can amp the fear up on it. 
and it's the same as CO2 has been done for fossil fuels. So this gets amped up by the government, by the green advocates, and certainly by the media, and this becomes a problem going forward. But it's totally un unwarranted. Now, why nuclear? Big point here is one word, it's scale. Nuclear can scale up or scale down like no other form of energy that we have. I'm gonna talk about four or five aspects of it. The first being power den density, followed by footprint, which are tied together. The next is availability. Fourth one is lifespan. And the fifth one is waste. Let's get started. One uranium pellet is equivalent to 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, 120 gallons of oil or one ton of coal. Now, one fuel rod has 333 pellets in it. One reactor is 45,000 fuel rods. That's 15 million pellets. That's equivalent to 15 million tons of coal. Now, the big thing here is that the reason I bring this up is that it was an equivalent footprint issue where a coal plant or a natural gas plant is about the same size as a nuclear plant. But where this blows up is when we get to the footprint when you talk wind and solar. And here it goes off the charts. You have 430 acres on a facility in England called Hinkley Point, and that's equivalent to 130,000 acres of solar panels and 250,000 acres of wind farm. Now, uh, 130,000 acres is roughly 200 square miles. That's about 10 times the size of Manhattan. And 250,000 acres, although the wind farms vary considerably between about uh, 300 square miles going up to about 600 square miles. And one of the uh, e examples was Indian Point, which was a reactor they just closed down outside of New York City, where it's 240 acres and it would take 500 square miles of wind turbines to replace it. What they did do, they went to nat natural gas, they fed three other plants. From a number point of view, we're talking about over three million of solar panels to make up that one, one reactor and 431 wind, windmills. So it's out of sight. The next aspect I want to mention is availability. Now this chart is actually from 2016, but if you notice the yellow curve shows nuclear at 9% capacity and you have wind and solar in the green uh, at 17. But when you look at, that's the nameplate capacity, when you look at the delivered power of actually what's being used, 20% is nu nuclear. And that has to do with the capacity factor of being available and being baseline power that's there 24 seven. Wind and solar, as you heard uh, from Greg's talk about what happened in the Texas freezes, that dropped that usage to 9%. So this is something where nuclear has that staying power. The next thing I want to talk about is lifespan. Nuclear uh, reactors are designed for normally 60 years of operation and they've extended some up to 80 years. That's 24 seven deliverable power and they only refuel it once every 18 to 30 months. They pull out one third of the fuel rods to, to replace them and they recycle them uh, reg regularly. The base load power, of course, works in good weather and bad day and night. Wind and solar, however, they've had an expected life of 25 to 30 years but in reality, because of early replacements and because of other problems with failing windmill blades, they've been averaging about 10 to 15 years. Some have been able to get up to 20, but it's roughly half of what was expected. 
This is going to have consequences in a minute. So the intermittency based on weather patterns in day daylight is what makes the big difference. Intermittency versus reliability. Now let's talk waste. Nuclear waste problems have been way overblown because the spent fuel has been safely stored for over 60 years without any problems. The first five years they're secured in cooling ponds and then they're moved to dry cask storage for up to 50 years. And all the waste is stored at existing reactor sites so you have them secured. They're all, all protected. Right now, there are about 91,000 metric tons of total waste that's accumulated over 70 years in these ponds and the dry cask. And they're increasing about 2,000 metric tons a year. That would fit into a football field about 40 feet high, the total waste. Now, there is a problem because they don't have a long-term storage solution, but I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And it's nothing compared to the waste you're going to see with wind and solar because that's the thing they have not been talking about. The lifespans, because they're cut almost in half of what they expected, the waste problems are just starting to come online. Wind turbines themselves are not recy recyclable. You saw this before in other slides and other, other pre presentations just earlier. It would take because they are not recyclable, they have to cut them up and put them into landfills, as you can see here. They expect in the next 20 years, 720,000 metric tons, 43 million metric tons by 2050. It's just unconscionable the way they think they can sweep this under the carpet, so to speak. The looming solar waste, though, is the one that's a real problem because it's a hazmat material. You're using lead and cad cadmium, and that becomes a huge pr problem, particularly where they ship them off to Af Africa into landfills. It's 10 to 30 times the cost of, a, uh, uh, of recycling versus putting it into landfill. It's cheaper to actually build new panels than to recycle. So the Chinese price gouging and the fact they have low quality is a key factor in this. 315,000 metric tons in four years will be a problem, and they expect 78 million metric tons by 2050. Now, big thing, and it was commented earlier, but I want to repeat it, is that the toxic waste in these solar panels are, for an equivalent unit of energy is 300 times more than nuclear waste. The EU mandates recycling, the US doesn't. Nor does the levelized cost of energy actually uh, take into this waste disposal issue. One thing I wanted to put in here, uh, my wife wanted me to put the, put the picture in the middle in here because it wins the wimpiest windmill award of the year <laughs> for what it looks like. But the environmental waste is a real, real issue. Uh, they're waived from the, uh, uh, both the endangerment finding and of course they're waived from the Endangered S Species Act. And one thing I just want to point out, I feel I'm a conservationist got morphed into being an environmentalist. Then we got morphed into being a destructionist. And I think that's the problem. And so the problem we have is that uh, nuclear doesn't have any of this, and this is a problem that is ongoing that's being swept under the carpet. Bottom line is this, nuclear energy is the answer most concentrated power source with the least footprint, the most reliable, deliverable baseload power, up to six times the lifespan of wind and solar, least waste, controlled and protected with the best safety record, and it's environmentally friendly. SMRs can advance, the small modular reactors can advance the state of the art to make this even better and reduce size, resources, cost, waste, build time, and in infrastructure. 
the decentralization of the grid is a real important issue that the, S the SMRs can, uh, can bring to the table. And it's less vulnerable to attacks. You can put it under, underground and you can have increased high performance, high temperature uh, operation for process heat and desalinization. So where do we go from here? The U.S. is blindly tied to green renewable energy. Beyond fossil fuels, nuclear is the only baseload power. We need to kick start with a next generation reactor. So it's time for a new approach. And the new approach that I'm taking is this. I want to develop a small modular reactor that uses spent fuel because it can help solve both the fuel problem, the waste problem, and develop the next generation te technology. Turns out that spent fuel only uses 4% of the fissile energy that's stored in these fuel rods, all 91,000 metric tons. That can be repurposed to power an advanced reactor. Spent fuel could power the US for 200 years, has enough stored energy, latent, waiting to be used. You can co-locate the reactors to start with at existing sites where you already have the spent fuel. You don't have to transport it. And you also have the transmission assets and the security and the trained staff in order to, to operate it with a minimal need for additional uranium ore. So the proposed small modular reactor, or what I'll call the spent fuel reactor, would have the following characteristics. It'd be an advanced SMR tailored to waste incineration. Be a fast convert and burn high temperature reactor, non-water cooled because of the high temperature and high operating temperatures required. So it'd be helium, liquid sodium, or molten salt cooled with passive self-cooling built in and load following capability as well. Important thing, and I talked about this in detail la last year, is having ceramic fuel rods that would be required both to work with the spent fuel and to enable the high temperature op operation. And then the last piece of the puzzle is to develop the fuel recycling pro process to repurpose the spent fuel. Reason why the cladding material is critical here, and this was the first step that is now being, t being tested and moved into manufacturing and full testing, in fact, the Volga reactor next year, is that the, uh, what the, they use silicon carbide, that it has a operating temperature up to 2,000 degrees C. So you don't have any safety problems where the metal cladding that has been used uh, only goes up to about 700 degrees C. It can oxidize. Oxidize creates hydrogen if you have a, a superheated steam environment, and I give you Fukushima. So the last and most important piece is the funding. Here, it turns out there is from Yucca Mountain, a nuclear waste fund that was set up to basically uh, support Yucca Mountain. But when it was canceled, the money was just put into the treasury, gaining 1.5 billion interest a month. It's $44 billion. It's dormant, and the funds were actually sourced by rate, rate payers. So what we're looking at doing is trying to get Congress to get that money available, it's off budget, and it would allow you to uh, use it for incinerating waste along with using storage. But right now the law says only storage, and so that's the problem. We're getting some traction in Congress right now. In fact, I talked to Senator jo Johnson about it earlier, and we are making some progress. The GAO report had tackled this issue they wanted to have it put back into the general fund. Taxpayers already spend $9 billion a year supporting fuel storage. It'll be $30 billion by 2030. So they need congressional action to break the impasse on the waste. And they need to develop then a permanent solution. Why not using spent fuel to do that? 
like to finish by saying with my colleagues here, who are the guys who put the men on the moon, we need another moonshot. We did it with $4 billion in less than 10 years. Of course, that $4 billion 10 is, I think, worth about 120 now, and the way the Biden's going, it'd be through the roof. But we would build a full-scale spent fuel reactor prototype in a similar multi-year program with government and industry partnership funded with the waste fund to start with. You streamline the NRC uh, reg regulations. You could literally do it in seven to nine years for less than $5 billion. So there's no time to waste the waste. So as Neil Armstrong said, I'll paraphrase him, that would be one small step for nuclear power and one giant leap for energy security and as our German friend said in protest, and for peace, freedom, and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. Thank you. There's a limited time left, so we can only take just a, like one or two questions here, so keep them as fast as you possibly yeah. can. There's a gentleman here. This year. Oh, since I have to ask a question, um, for the for large nuclear reactors, a big issue is cooling the thermal waste energy, and we have problems heating rivers and whatnot. Why didn't you talk about the cooling problems for the small modular reactors? For which reactors? I'm sorry. Oh, because. The, they, because of the different type of material, with, uh, the biggest problem with the existing reactors is that they're water-cooled. Water can work as a moderator, but it can only operate up to about 300 or so degrees C. So you need to have higher performance uh, cooling media, helium, uh, liquid metal sodium, that can handle that. And the way that these high temperature reactors are designed that they have a higher e efficiency, so they have a better transfer of heat, so they have a less of a cooling problem. Does that answer the question? Dave Field from Pennsylvania. I have a friend who works for Allegheny County. He was saying that whenever you get a surge of wind power or something, or you know, and the solar is easier to predict because of daylight and night, <laughs> but that you don't, you know, coal plants don't have a throttle on them. You can't throttle them back. So, you know, you're still gen, you know, you're getting all this power from wind, and you're still generating power at coal. He said that uh, gas is better, but you're still looking like if you want to throttle that back and get it back to full power. You're still looking at six, eight to ten hours to get that going. Is it, it just means that there's a lot of inefficiency. Is that kind of inefficiency calculated? In, in, is that true, for one thing? And is, is that kind of inefficiency and loss of power and use of power calculated into the efficiency of solar and wind? The, the answer, in general, is no. Remember, we talked the levelized uh, cost of uh, energy, and uh, Lars uh, Schirkenau, who's one of our uh, colleagues, uh, calculates that, and I pointed out to him that the inefficiency of running from, say, 20 percent operating rates on gas to 90 percent over 24 hours, you, you cannot control that in optimum. And what you said about coal is, is, is pretty much true. There is a little bit of dispatchability or a little bit of variability you can do with coal. It's a lot less than gas, especially uh, peaking gas. But yes, you're absolutely right that that is an inefficiency and a cost that's socialized, just like the transportation, you know, the, the lines and transportation cost. Good point. Right, this will have to be the last question. Hi, Ken Peterson. Uh, the first presenter talked about uh, finding a really good super duper spokesperson. I just wondered if you had a couple of nominations. Not yet. Very quick. Gene Sklazacek, St. Petersburg, Florida. Quick question. You said that I've heard it more than once. You cannot recycle. Uh, 
the turbine blades. Why is that? Why can't they be recycled? I can take that. Oh, go ahead. Marty's our I don't know if I'm uh, on or not. Uh, they're thermal set plastics made of epoxy. They're epoxy composites with glass and uh, carbon fiber. And so they're, they, you can recycle them, you can burn them. It's not efficient, it's not economical. And they're not like a thermal plastic that you can melt and reuse. It's like a boat hull, polyester boat, for example. So the best, most economical way is just to bury them in landfill. They're not particularly toxic or hazardous, they just take up space. Uh, well, uh, that's gonna have to be it. We gotta, we gotta wrap this up. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.